three to a given star. One. Stick your left arm straight forward, Sam, said Folly. He stretched his arm out. I can sense it, cried Folly. Now wiggle your fingers. Sam wiggled them. Finsterness said nothing, but both of them caught from his mind, riding clear and wise beside them, a sense of the situation. His sense of the situation could be summed up in the one-word comment which he did not need to utter. Foolishness. It is not foolishness, Finsterness, cried Folly. Here are the three of us, riding empty space millions of kilometers from nowhere. We were people once, Earth people from old Earth itself. It is foolish to remember what we used to be. I was a woman once, a beautiful woman. Now I'm this, this thing bent on a mission of murder and destruction. I used to have hands myself, real hands. Is it wrong for me to enjoy looking at Sam's hands now and then? To think of the past which all three of us have left behind? Finsterness did not answer. His mind was blank to both of them. There was nothing but space around them. Not even much space dust, and the bluish light of Lin's Coton 15 straight ahead. From the third planet of that star they could occasionally hear the cackle and gabble of the man-eaters. Once again Folly cried to Finsterness, is that so wrong that I should enjoy looking at a hand? Sam has well-shaped hands. I was a person once, and so were you. Did I ever tell you that I was a beautiful woman once? She had been a beautiful woman once, and now she was the control of a small spaceship, which fled across emptiness with two grotesque companions. She was now a ship, only eleven meters long, and shaped roughly like an ancient dirigible. Finsterness was a perfect cube, fifty meters to the side, packed with machinery which could blank out a sun and contain its planets until they froze to icy perpetual death. Sam was a man, but he was a man of flexible steel, two hundred meters high. He was designed to walk on any kind of planet, with any kind of inhabitant, with any kind of chemistry or any kind of gravity. He was designed to bring antagonists, whomever they might be, the message of the power of man. The power of man, followed by terror, followed, if necessary, by death. If Sam failed, Finsterness had the further power of blocking out the sun, Lin's Coton 15. If either or both failed, Folly had the job of adjusting them so that they could win. If they had no chance of winning, she then had the task of destroying Finsterness and Sam, and then herself. Their instructions were clear. You will not, you will not under any circumstances return. You will not under any conditions turn back toward Earth. You are too dangerous to come anywhere near Earth ever again. You may live if you wish, if you can, but you must not, repeat, not, come back. You have your duty. You asked for it. Now you have it. Do not come back. Your forms fit your duty. You will do your duty. Folly had become a tiny ship, crammed with miniaturized equipment. Finsterness had become a cube, blacker than darkness itself. Sam had become a man, but a man different from any which had ever been seen on Earth. He had a metal body, copied from the human form down to the last detail. That way the enemies, whoever they might be, would be given a terrible glimpse of the human shape, the human voice. Two hundred meters high he stood, strong and solid enough to fly through space with nothing but the jets on his belt. The instrumentality had designed all three of them, designed them well. Designed them to meet the crazy menace out beyond the stars, a menace which gave no clue to its technology or origin, but which responded to the signal, man, with the counter-signal, gabble, cackle, eat, eat, man, man, good to eat, cackle, gabble, eat, eat. That was enough. The instrumentality took steps, and the three of them, the ship, the cube, and the metal giant, sped between the stars to conquer, to terrorize, or to destroy the menace which lived on the third planet of Linscoten 15, or if needful, to put out that particular sun. Folly, who had become a ship, was the most volatile of the three. She had been a beautiful woman once. 2. You were a beautiful woman once, Sam had said, some years before. How did you end up becoming a ship? 
I killed myself, said Folly. That's why I took this name, Folly. I had a long life ahead of me, but I killed myself and they brought me back at the last minute. When I found out I was still alive, I volunteered for something adventurous, dangerous. They gave me this. Well, I asked for it, didn't I? You asked for it, said Sam gravely. Out in the middle of nothing, surrounded by a tremendous lot of nowhere, courtesy was still the lubricant which governed human relationships. The two of them observed courtesy and kindness toward one another. Sometimes they threw in a bit of humor, too. Finsterness did not take part in their talk or their companionship. He did not even verbalize his answers. He merely let them know his sense of the situation, and this time, as in all other times, his response was, Negative. No operation needed. Communication non-functional. Not needed here. Silence, please. I kill sons. That is all I do. My part is my business. All mine. This was communicated in a single terrible thought, so that Folly and Sam stopped trying to bring Finsterness into the conversations which they started up every subjective century or so, and continued for years at a time. Finsterness merely moved along with them several kilometers away, but well within their range of awareness. But as far as company was concerned, Finsterness might as well not have been there at all. Sam went on with the conversation, the conversation which they had had so many hundreds of times since the planiform ship had discharged them near Linscoten 15 and left them to make the rest of their way alone. If the menace were really a menace, and if it were intelligent, the instrumentality had no intention of letting an actual planiform ship fall within the powers of a strange form of life, which might well be hypnotic in its combat capacities. Hence the ship, the cube, and the giant were launched into normal space at high velocity, equipped with jets to correct their courses, and left to make their own way to the danger. Sam said, as he always did, you were a beautiful woman, Folly, but you wanted to die. Why? Why do people ever want to die, Sam? It's the power in us, the vitality which makes us want so much. Life always trembles on the edge of disappointment. If we hadn't been vital and greedy and lustful and yearning, if we hadn't had big thoughts and wanted bigger ones, we would have stayed animals, like all the little things back on Earth. It's strong life that brings us so close to death. We can't stand the beauty of it, the nearness of the things we want, the remoteness of the things that we can have. You and me and Finsterness now, we're monsters riding out between the stars. And yet we're happier now than we were when we were back among people. I was a beautiful woman. But there were specific things which I wanted. I wanted them myself. I alone. For me. Only for me. When I couldn't have them, I wanted to die. If I had been stupider or happier, I might have lived on. But I didn't. I was me. Intensely me. So, here I am. I don't even know whether I have a body or not inside this ship. They've got me all hooked up to the sensors and the viewers and the computers. Sometimes I think that I may be a lovely woman still, with a real body hidden somewhere inside this ship, waiting to step out and to be a person again. And you, Sam, don't you want to tell me about yourself? Sam? Sam! That's no name for an actual person. Superordinated alien measuring and mastery device. What were you before they gave you that big body? At least you still look like a person. You're not a ship like me. My name doesn't matter, Folly, and if I told it to you, you wouldn't know it. You never knew it. How wouldn't I know? She cried. I've never told you my name either, so perhaps we did know each other back on old Earth when we were still people. I can tell something, said Sam, from the shape of words, from the ring of thoughts, even when we're not out here in nothing. You were a lady, perhaps highborn. You were truly beautiful. You were really important. And I, I was a technician. A good one. I did my work, and I loved my family, and my wife and I were happy with every child which the lords gave us for adoption. But my wife died first, and after a while my children, my wonderful boy and my two beautiful, intelligent girls, my own children, they couldn't stand me anymore. They didn't like me. Perhaps I talked too much. 
Perhaps I gave them too much advice. Perhaps I reminded them of their mother, who was dead. I don't know. I won't ever know. They didn't want to see me. Out of manners, they sent me cards on my birthday. Out of sheer formal courtesy, they called on me sometimes. Now and then one of them wanted something. Then they came to me. But it was always just to get something. It took me a long time to figure out, but I hadn't done anything. It wasn't what I had done or hadn't done. They just plain didn't like me. You know the songs and the operas and the stories. Folly, you know them all. Not all of them, thought Folly gently. Not all of them. Just a few thousand. Did you ever see one? cried Sam, his thoughts ringing fiercely against her mind. Did you ever see a single one about a rejected father? They're all about men and women, love and sex. But I can tell you that rejection hurts even when you don't ask anything of your loved ones but their company and their happiness and their simple, genuine smiles. When I knew that my children had no use for me, I had no use for me either. The instrumentality came along with this warning, and I volunteered. But you're all right now, Sam, said Folly gently. I'm a ship, and you are a metal giant. But we're off doing work which is important for all mankind. We'll have adventures together. Even black and grumbly here, she added, meaning finsterness, can't keep us from the excitement of companionship or the hope of danger. We're doing something wonderful and important and exciting. Do you know what I would do if I had my life again? My ordinary life with skin and toenails and hair and things like that? What? asked Sam, knowing the answer perfectly well from the hundreds of times they had touched on this point. I'd take baths, hundreds and hundreds of them over again, showers and dips in cold pools and soaks in hot bathtubs and rinses and more showers, and I would do my hair over and over again, thousands of different ways, and I would put on lipstick in the most outrageous colors, even if nobody saw me, except for my own self looking in the mirror. Now I can hardly remember what it used to be to be dry or wet. I'm in this ship, and I see the ship, and I do not really know if I am a person or not anymore. Sam stayed quiet, knowing what she would say next. Sam, what would you do? Folly asked. Swim, he said. Then swim, Sam, swim. Swim for me in the space between the stars. You still have a body and I don't, but I can watch you, and I can sense you swimming out here in the nothing at all. Sam began to swim a huge Australian crawl, dipping his face to the edge of the water, as if there were water there. The gestures made no difference in his real motion, since they were all of them in the fast trajectory computed for them from the point where they left the instrumentality ship and started out in normal space for the star listed as Linscoten 15. This time, something very sudden happened, and it happened strangely. From the dark, gloomy silence of the cube, Finsterness, there came an articulate cry, called forth in clear human speech. Stop it! Stop moving right now! I attack! Both Sam and Folly had instruments built into them, so they could read space around them. The instruments, quickly scanned, showed nothing. Yet Folly felt odd, as though something had gone very wrong in her ship self, which had seemed so metal, so reliable, so inalterable. She threw a thought of inquiry at Sam and instead got another command from Finsterness. Don't think. 3. Sam floated like a dead man in his gargantuan body. Folly drifted like a fruit beside his hand. At last there came words from Finsterness. You can think now if you want to. You can chatter at each other again. I'm through. Sam thought at him, and the thought pattern was troubled and confused. What happened? I felt as though the immaculate grid of space had been pinched together in a tight fold. I felt you do something, and then there was silence around us again. Talking, said Finsterness, is not operational, and it is not required of me. But there are only three of us here, so I might as well tell you what happened. Can you hear me, Folly? Yes, she said weakly. Are we on course? asked Finsterness, for the third planet of Linscoten 15. 
Folly paused while checking all her instruments, which were more complicated and refined than those carried by the other two, since she was the maintenance unit. Yes, said she at last, we are exactly on course. I don't know what happened if anything did happen. Something happened all right, said Finsterness, with the gratified savagery of a person whose quick and cruel nature is rewarded only by meeting and overcoming hostility in real life. Was it a space dragon like they used to meet on the old, old ships? No, nothing like that, said Finsterness, communicative for once, since this was something operational to talk about. It doesn't even seem to be in this space at all. Something just rises up among us, like a volcano coming out of solid space. Something violent and wild and alive. Do you two still have eyes? Seeing devices for the ordinary light band? asked Sam. Of course we do, said Finsterness. I will try to fix it so that you will have a visible input. There was a sharp pause from Finsterness. The voice came again with much strain. Do not do anything. Do not try to help me. Just watch. If it wins, destroy me quickly. It might try to capture us and get back to Earth. Folly felt like telling Finsterness that this was unnecessary, since the first motion toward return would trigger destruction devices, which had been built into each of the three of them, beyond reach, beyond detection, beyond awareness. When the instrumentality said, do not come back, the instrumentality meant it. She said nothing. She watched Finsterness instead. Something began to happen. It was very odd. Space itself seemed to rip and leak. In the visible band, the intruder looked like a fountain of water being thrown randomly to and fro. But the intruder was not water. In the visible light band, it glowed like wildfire rising from a shimmering column of blue ice. Here in space, there was nothing to burn, nothing to make light. She knew that Finsterness was translating unresolvable phenomena into light. She sensed Sam moving one of his giant fists uncontrollably in a helpless, childish gesture of protest. She herself did nothing but watch, as alertly and passively as she could. Nevertheless, she felt wrenched. This was no material phenomenon. It was wild, unformed life, intruding out of some other proportion of space, seeking material on which to impose its vitality, its frenzy, its identity. She could see Finsterness as a solid black cube, darker than mere darkness, drifting right into the column. She watched the sides of Finsterness. On the earlier part of the trip, since they had left the people and the planiform ship and had been discharged in a fast trajectory toward Linscoten 15, Finsterness's side had seemed like dull metal, slightly burnished, so that Folly had to brush him lightly with radar to get a clear image of him. Now, his sides had changed. They had become as soft and thick as velvet. The strange volcano fountain did not seem to have much in the way of sensing devices. It paid no attention to Sam or to herself. The dark cube attracted it, as a shaft of sunlight might attract a baby, or as the rustle of paper might draw the attention of a kitten. With a slight twist of its vitality and direction, the whole column of burning, living brightness plunged upon Finsterness, plunged and burned out, and went in and was seen no more. Finsterness's voice, clear and cheerful, sounded out to both of them. It's gone now. What happened to it? asked Sam. I ate it, said Finsterness. You what? cried Folly. I ate it, said Finsterness. He was talking more than he ever had before. At least that's the only way I can describe it. This machine they gave me, or made me into, or whatever they did, it's really rather good. It's powerful. I can feel it absorbing things, taking them in, taking them apart, putting them away. It's something like eating used to be when I was a person. That wild thing attacked me, wrapped me up, devoured me. All I did was to take it in, and now it's gone. I feel sort of full. I suppose my machines are sorting out samples of it to send away to rendezvous points in little rockets. I know that I have sixteen small rockets inside me, and I can feel two of them getting ready to move. Neither one of you could have done what I do. 
I was built to absorb whole suns if necessary, break them down, freeze them down, change their molecular structure, and shoot their vitality off in one big useless blast on the radio spectrum. You couldn't do anything like that, Sam, even if you do have arms and legs and a head and a voice, if we ever get into an atmosphere for you to use it in. You couldn't do what I have just done, Folly. You're good, said Folly, with emphasis. But she added, I can repair you. Obviously offended, Finsterness withdrew into his silence. Sam said to Folly, How much further to destination? Said Folly promptly, Seventy-nine earth years, four months and three days, six hours and two minutes, but you know how little that means out here. It could seem like a single afternoon, or it could feel to us like a thousand lifetimes. Time doesn't work very well for us. How did Earth ever find this place, anyhow? asked Sam. All I know is that it was two very strong telepaths working together on the planet Miser, an ex-dictator named Kasher O'Neill, and an ex-lady named Selalta. They were doing a bit of psionic astronomy, and suddenly this signal came in strong and clear. You know that telepaths can catch directions very accurately, even over immense distances, and they can get emotions, too. But they are not very good at actual images or things. Somebody else checked it out for them. Mmm, said Sam. He had heard all this before. Out of sheer boredom, he went back to swimming, vigorously. The body might not really be his, but it made him feel good to exercise it. Besides, he knew that Folly watched him with pleasure, great pleasure, and a little bit of envy. Kasher O'Neill and the Lady Selalta had finished with making love. They had lain with their bodies tired and their minds clear, relaxed. They had stretched out on a blanket just above the big gushing spring, which was the source of the Ninth Nile. Both telepaths, they could hear a bird couple quarreling inside a tree, the male bird commanding the female to get out and get to work, and the female answering by dropping deeper and deeper into a fretful and irritable sleep. The Lady Selalta had whispered a thought to her lover and master, Kasher O'Neill. To the stars? The stars? thought he with a grumble. They were both strong telepaths. He had been imprinted in some mysterious way with the greatest telepath hypnotist of all time, the Honorable Agatha Madigan. In the Lady Selalta he had a companion worthy of his final talents, a natural telepath who could herself reach not only all of Miser, but some of the nearer stars. When they teamed up together, as she now proposed, they could plunge into dusty infinities of depth and bring back feelings or images which no go-captain had ever found with his ship. He sat up with a grunt of assent. She looked at him fondly, possessively, her dark eyes alight with alertness, happiness, and adventure. Can I lift? she asked, almost timidly. When two telepaths worked together, one cleared the vision for both of them as far as their combined minds could reach, and then the other sprang, with enormous effort, as far and as fast as possible toward any target which presented itself. They had found strange things, sometimes beautiful or dramatic ones, by this method. Kasher was already drinking enormous gulps of air, filling his lungs, holding his breath, letting go with a gasp and then inhaling deeply and slowly again. In this way, he re-oxygenated his brain very thoroughly for the huge effort of a telepathic dive into the remote depth of space. He did not even speak to her, nor did he telepath a word to her. He was conserving his strength for a good jump. He merely nodded to her. The Lady Selalta, too, began the deep breathing, but she seemed to need it less than did Kasher. They were both sitting up, side by side, breathing deeply. The cool night sands of Miser were around them. The harmless gurgle of the Ninth Nile was beside them. The bright star-cluttered sky of Miser was above them. Her hand reached out and took hold of his. She squeezed his hand. He looked at her and nodded to her again. Within his mind, Miser and its entire solar system seemed to burst into flame with a new kind of light. 
The radiance of Selalta's mind trailed off unevenly in different directions, but there, almost two degrees off the pole of Miser's ecliptic, he felt something wild and strange, a kind of being which he had never sensed before. Using Selalta's mind as a base, he let his mind dive for it. The distance of the plunge left them both dizzy, sitting on the quiet night sands of Miser. It seemed to both of them that the mind of man had never reached so far before. The reality of the phenomenon was undoubtable. There were animals all around them, the usual categories, runners, hunters, jumpers, climbers, swimmers, hiders, and handlers. It was some of the handlers who were intensely telepathic themselves. The image of man created an immediate murderous response. Cackle, gabble, gabble, cackle, man, 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 eat them, eat them. Kesher and Selalta were both so surprised that they let the contact go. After making sure that they had touched a whole world full of beings, some of them telepathic and probably civilized. How had the beings known man? Why had their response been immediate? Why anthropophagous and homicidal? They took time before coming completely out of the trance to make a careful, exact note of the direction from which the danger brains had shrieked their warning. This they submitted to the instrumentality shortly after the incident. And that was how, unknown to Folly, Sam, and Finsterness, the inhabitants on the third planet of Linscoten 15 had come to the attention of mankind. 4. As a matter of fact, the three wanderers later on felt a vague, remote telepathic contact, which they sensed as being warm-hearted and human, and therefore did not try to track down, with their minds or their weapons. It was O'Neill and Selalta, many years later by Miser time, reaching to see what the instrumentality had done about Linscoten 15. Folly, Sam, and Finsterness had no suspicion that the two most powerful telepaths in the human area of the galaxy had stroked them, searched them, felt them through, and seen things about them which the three of them did not know about themselves or about each other. Kasher O'Neill said to the Lady Selalta, You got it too? A beautiful woman, encased in a little ship? Kasher nodded. A red head with skin as soft and transparent as living ivory? A woman who was beautiful and will be beautiful again? That's what I got, said the Lady Selalta. And the tired old man, weary of his children, and weary of his own life because his children were weary of him. Not so old, said Kasher O'Neill. And isn't that a spectacular piece of machinery they put him into? A metal giant. It felt like something about a quarter of a kilometer high. Acid-proof, cold-proof. Won't he be surprised when he finds that the instrumentality has rejuvenated his own body inside that monster? He certainly will be, said the Lady Selalta, happily, thinking of the pleasant surprise which lay ahead of a man whom she would never know or see with her own bodily eyes. They both fell silent. Then, said the Lady Selalta, But... The third person. There was a shiver in her voice as though she dared not ask the question. The third person, the one in the cube. She stopped, as though she could neither ask nor say more. It was not a robot or a personality cube, said Kasher O'Neill. It was a human being, all right. But it's crazy. Could you make out, Selalta, as to whether it was male or female? No, said she. I couldn't tell. The other two seemed to think that it was male. But did you feel sure? asked Kasher. With that being, I felt sure of nothing. It was human, all right, but it was stranger than any lost hominid we have ever felt around the forgotten stars. Could you tell, Kasher, whether it was young or old? No, said he. I felt nothing. Only a desperate human mind with all its guards up, living only because of the terrible powers of the Black Cube, the sun killer in which it rode. I never sensed someone before who was a person without characteristics. It's frightening. The instrumentality are cruel sometimes, said Selalta. Sometimes they have to be, Kasher agreed. But I never thought that they would do that. Do what? asked Kasher. 
Her dark eyes looked at him. It was a different night and a different Nile, but the eyes were only a very little bit older, and they loved him just as much as ever. The Lady Selauta trembled, as though she herself might think that the all-powerful instrumentality could have hidden a microphone in the random sands. She whispered to her lover, You said it yourself, Kasher, just a moment ago. Said what? He spoke tenderly but fearlessly, his voice ringing out over the cool night sands. The Lady Selauta went on whispering, which was very unlike her usual self. You said that the third person was crazy. Do you realize that you may have spoken the actual, literal truth? Her whisper darted at him like a snake. At last, he whispered back, What did you sense? What could you guess? They have sent a madman to the stars, or a mad woman, a real psychotic. Lots of pilots, said Kasher, speaking more normally are cushioned against loneliness with real but artificially activated psychoses, it gets them through the real or imagined horrors of the sufferings of space. I don't mean that, said Selauta, still whispering urgently and secretly. I mean a real psychotic. But there aren't any. Not loose, that is, said Kasher, stammering with surprise at last. They either get cured or they are bottled up in thought-proof satellites somewhere. Selauta raised her voice a little, just a little, so that she no longer whispered but spoke urgently. But don't you see? That's what they must have done. The instrumentality made a star killer too strong for any normal mind to guide. So the Lord's got a psychotic somewhere, a real psychotic, and sent a madman out among the stars. Otherwise we could have felt its gender or its age. Kasher nodded in silent agreement. The air did not feel colder, but he got goose flesh sitting beside his beloved Selauta on the familiar desert sands. You're right. You must be right. It almost makes me feel sorry for the enemies out near Linscoten 15. Do you see nothing of them this time? I couldn't perceive them at all. I did a little, said the Lady Selauta. Their telepaths have caught the strange minds coming at them with a high rate of speed— the telepathic ones are wild with excitement, but the others are just going cackle, gabble, cackle, gabble with each other, filled with anger, hunger, and the thought of man. You got that much? he said in wonder. My lord and my lover, I dived this time. Is it so strange that I sensed more than you did? Your strength lifted me. Did you hear what the weapons called each other? Something silly. He could see her knitting her brows in the bright starshine which illuminated the desert, almost the way that the old original moon lit up the nights sometimes on Manhome itself. It was folly and something like superordinated alien measuring and mastery machine, and something like darkness in the ancient Deutsches language. That's what I got too, said Kasher. It sounds like a weird team. But a powerful one, a terribly powerful one, said the Lady Selauta. You and I, my lover and master, have seen strange things and dangers between the stars, even before we met each other, but we never saw anything like this before, did we? No, said he. Well then, said she, let us sleep and forget the matter as much as we can. The instrumentality is certainly taking care of Linscoten 15, and we too need not bother about it. And all that Sam, Folly, and Finsternis knew was that a light touch, unexplained but friendly, had gone over them from the far star region near home. Thought they, if they thought anything about it at all, the instrumentality, which made us and sent us, has checked up on us one more time. 5. A few years later, Sam and Folly were talking again while Finsterness, guarded, impenetrable, uncommunicating, detectable only by the fierce glow of human life which shone telepathically out of the immense cube, rode space beside them and said nothing. Suddenly, Folly cried out to Sam loudly, I can smell them! Smell who? asked Sam mildly. There isn't any smell out here in the nothingness of space. Silly! thought Folly back. I don't mean really smell, 
I mean that I can pick up their sense of odor telepathically. Whose? said Sam, being dense. Our enemies, of course, cried Folly. The man-rememberers who are not man, the cackle-gabble creatures, the beings who remember man and hate him. They smell thick and warm and alive to each other. Their whole world is full of smells. Their telepaths are getting frantic now. They have even figured out that there are three of us, and they are trying to get our smells. And we have no smell. Not when we do not even know whether we have human bodies or not, inside these things. Imagine this metal body of mine smelling. If it did have a smell, said Sam, it would probably be the very soft smell of working steel and a little bit of lubricants, plus whatever odors my jets might activate inside an atmosphere. If I know the instrumentality, they have made my jets smell awful to almost any kind of being. Most forms of life think first through their noses, and then figure out the rest of experience later. After all, I was built to intimidate, to frighten, to destroy. The instrumentality did not make this giant to be friendly with anybody. You and I can be friends, Folly, because you are a little ship, which I could hold like a cigar between my fingers, and because the ship holds the memory of a very lovely woman. I can sense what you once were, what you may still be, if your actual body is still inside that boat. Oh, Sam! she cried. Do you think I might still be alive, really alive, with a real me, in a real me, and a chance to be myself somewhere again, out here between the stars? I can't sense it plainly, said Sam. I've reached as much as I can through your ship with my sensors, but I can't tell whether there's a whole woman there or not. It might be just a memory of you dissected and laminated between a lot of plastic sheets. I really can't tell. But sometimes I have the strangest hunch that you are still alive in the old ordinary way, and that I am alive too. Wouldn't that be wonderful? She almost shouted at him. Sam, imagine being us again. If we fulfill our mission and conquer this planet and stay alive and settle there, I might even meet you and... They both fell silent at the implications of being ordinary alive again. They knew that they loved each other. Out here in the immense blackness of space, there was nothing they could do but streak along in their fast trajectories and talk to each other a little bit by telepathy. Sam, said Folly, and the tone of her thought showed that she was changing a difficult subject. Do you think that we are the furthest out that people have ever gone? You used to be a technician. You might know. Do you? Of course I know thought Sam promptly. We're not. After all, we're still deep inside our own galaxy. I didn't know, said Folly, contritely. With all those instruments, don't you know where you are? Of course I know where I am, Sam, in relation to the third planet of Linscoten 15. I even have a faint idea of the general direction in which old Earth must lie, and how many thousands of ages it would take us to get home traveling through ordinary space if we did try to turn around. She thought to herself, but didn't add in her thought to Sam, which we can't. She thought again to him, but I've never studied astronomy or navigation, so I couldn't tell whether we were at the edge of the galaxy or not. Nowhere near the edge, said Sam. We're not John Joy Tree, and we're nowhere near the two-headed elephants which weep forever in intergalactic space. John Joy Tree? sang Folly. There was joy and memory in her thoughts as she sounded the name. He was my idol when I was a girl. My father was a sub-chief of the instrumentality, and always promised to bring John Joy Tree to our house. We had a country house, and it was unusual and very fine for this day and age. But Mr. and Go Captain Tree never got around to visiting us. So, there I was, a big girl with picture cubes of him all over my room. I liked him because he was so much older than me, and so resolute-looking, and so tender, too. I had all sorts of romantic daydreams about him, but he never showed up, and I married the wrong man several times, and my children got given to the wrong people, so here I am. But what's this stuff about two-headed elephants? Really? said Sam. I don't see how you could hear about John Joytree and not know what he did. 
I knew he flew far, far out, but I didn't know exactly what he did. After all, I was just a child when I fell in love with his picture. What did he do? He's dead now, I suppose, so I don't suppose it matters. Finsterness cut in, grimly and unexpectedly. John Joytree is not dead. He's creeping around a monstrous place on an abandoned planet, and he is immortal and insane. How did you know that? cried Sam, turning his enormous metal head to look at the dark burnished cube which had said nothing for so many years. There was no further thought from Finsterness, not a ghost, not an echo of a word. Folly prodded him. It's no use trying to make that thing talk if it doesn't want to. We've both tried thousands of times. Tell me about the two-headed elephants. Those are the big animals with large, floppy ears and the noses that pick things up, aren't they? And they make very wise, dependable underpeople out of them. I don't know about the underpeople part, but the animals are the kind you mention. Very big indeed. When John Joytree got far outside our cosmos by flying through Space 3, he found an enormous procession of open ships flying in columns where there was nothing at all. The ships were made by nothing which man has ever even seen. We still don't know where they came from or what made them. Each open ship had a sort of animal, something like an elephant with four front legs and a head at each end, and as he passed the unimaginable ships, these animals howled at him, howled grief and mourning. Our best guess was that the ships were the tombs of some great race of beings, and the howling elephants, the immortal half-living mourners who guarded them. But how did John Joytree ever get back? Ah, that was beautiful. If you go into space three, you take nothing more than your own body with you. That was the finest engineering the human race has ever done. They designed and built a whole planiform ship out of John Joytree's skin, fingernails, and hair. They had to change his body chemistry a bit to get enough metal in him to carry the coils and the electric circuits, but it worked. He came back. That was a man who could skip through space like a little boy hopping on familiar rocks. He's the only pilot who ever piloted himself back home from outside our galaxy. I don't know whether it will be worth the time and treasure to use Space 3 for intergalactic trips. After all... Some very gifted people may have already fallen through by accident, Folly. You and Finsterness and I are people who have been built into machines. We are now ourselves the machines. But with Tree, they did it the other way around. They made a machine out of him. And it worked. In that one deep flight, he went billions of times further than we will ever go. You think you know, said Finsterness unexpectedly. That's what you always do. You think you know. Folly and Sam tried to get Finsterness to talk some more, but nothing happened. After a few more rests and talks, they were ready for landing on the third planet of Linscoten 15. They landed. They fought. Blood ran on the ground. Fire scorched the valleys and boiled the lakes. The telepathic world was full of the cackle gabble of fright Hatred throwing itself into suicide, fury turning into surrender, into deep despair, into hopelessness, and at last, into a strange kind of quiet and love. Let us not tell that story. It can be written some other time, told by some other voice. The beings died by thousands and tens of thousands, while Finsterness sat on a mountaintop doing nothing. Folly wove death and destruction, uncoded languages drew maps, showed Sam the strong points and the weapons which had to be destroyed. Part of the technology was very advanced, other parts were still tribal. The dominant race was that of the beings who had evolved into handlers and thinkers. It was they who were the telepaths. All hatred ceased as the haters died. Only the submissive ones lived on. Sam tore cities about with his bare metal hands, ripped heavy guns to pieces while they were firing at him, picking the gunners off the gun carriages as though they were lice, swimming oceans when he had to, with folly darting and hovering around or ahead of him. Final surrender was brought by their strongest telepath, a very wise old male who had been hidden inside a deep mountain. You have come, people. 
We surrender. Some of us have always known the truth. We are Earthborn, too. A cargo of chickens settled here unimaginable times ago. A time twist tore us out of our convoy and threw us here. That's why, when we sensed you far across space, we caught the relationship of eat and eaten. Only our brave ones had it wrong. You eat us, we don't eat you. You are the masters now. We will serve you forever. Do you seek our death? No, no, said Folly. We came only to avert a danger, and we have done that. Live on and on, but plan no war and make no weapons. Leave that to the instrumentality. Blessed is the instrumentality, whoever that may be. We accept your terms. We belong to you. When this was done, the war was over. Strange things began to happen. Wild voices sang from within Folly and Sam, voices not their own. Mission gone. Work finished. Go to Hill with Cube. Go and rejoice. Sam and Folly hesitated. They had left Finsterness, where they landed, halfway around the planet. The singing voices became more urgent. Go, go, go now. Go back to the Cube. Tell the chicken people to plant a lawn and a grove of trees. Go, go now to the good reward. They told the telepaths what had been said to them and voyaged wearily up out of the atmosphere and back down for a landing at the original point of contact, a long, low hill which had been planted with huge patches of green turf and freshly transplanted trees, even in the hours in which they flew off the world and back on it again. The bird telepaths must have had strong and quick commands. The singing became pure music as they landed corrals of reward and rejoicing, with the hint of martial marches and victory fugues woven in. Alan, stand up, said the voices to Sam. Sam stood on the ridge of the hill. He stood like a colossus against the red dawning sky. A friendly, quiet crowd of the chicken people fell back. Alan, put your hand to your right forehead, sang the voices. Sam obeyed. He did not know why the voices called him Alan. Ellen, land, sang the rejoicing voices to Folly. Folly, herself a little ship, landed at Sam's feet. She was bewildered, with happy confusion, and a great deal of pain which did not seem to matter much. Alan, come forth, sang the voices. Sam felt a sharp pain as his forehead, his huge metal forehead, two hundred meters above the ground, burst open and closed again. There was something pink and helpless in his hand. The voices commanded, Alan, put your hand gently on the ground. Sam obeyed and put his hand on the ground. The little pink toy fell on the fresh turf. It was a tiny miniature of a man. Ellen, stand forth, sang the voices again. The ship named Folly opened a door, and a naked young woman fell out. Alma, wake up. The cube named Finsterness turned darker than charcoal. Out of the dark side, there stumbled a black-haired girl. She ran across the hill slope to the figure named Ellen. The man-body named Alan was struggling to his feet. The three of them stood up. The voices spoke to them. This is our last message. You have done your work. You are well. The boat named Folly contains tools, medicine, and the other equipment for a human colony. The giant named Sam will stand forever as a monument to human victory. The cube named Finsterness will now dissolve. Alan, Ellen, treat Alma lovingly and well. She is now a forgetty. The three naked people stood bewildered in the dawn. Goodbye, and a great high thanks from the instrumentality. This is a pre-coded message, effective only if you won. You have won. Be happy. Live on. Ellen took Alma, who had been Finsterness, and held her tight. The great cube dissolved into a shapeless slag heap. Alan, who had been Sam looked up at his former body dominating the skyline. For reasons which the travelers did not understand until many years had passed, 
The bird people around them broke into ululant hymns of peace, welcome, and joy. My house, said Ellen, pointing at the little ship which had spat forth her body just minutes ago, is now a home for all of us. They climbed into the successful little ship which had been called Folly. They knew somehow that they would find clothes and food, and wisdom too. They did. 6. Ten years later they had the proof of happiness playing in the yard before their house, a substantial building, made of stone and brick, which the local people had built under Allen's directions. They had changed their whole technology in the process of learning from him, and thanks to the efficiency and power of the telepathic priestly caste, things learned at any one spot on the planet were swiftly disseminated to the whole group of races on the planet. The proof of happiness consisted of the thirty-five human children playing in the yard. Ellen had had nine, four sets of twins and a single. Alma had had twelve, two sets of quintuplets and a pair of twins. The other fourteen had been bottle-grown from ova and sperm, which they found in the ship, the frozen donations of complete strangers who had done their bit for the off-world settling of the human race. Thanks to the careful genetic coding of both the womb children and the bottle children, there was a variety of types, suitable for natural breeding over many generations to come. Alan came to the door. He measured the time by the place where the great shadow fell. It was hard to realize that the gigantic indestructible statue which loomed above them all had once been his own self. A small glacier was beginning to form around the feet of Sam, and the night was getting cold. I'm bringing the children in already, said Chitikik, one of the local nurses they had hired to help with the huge brood of human babies. She in return got the privilege of hatching her eggs on the warm shelf behind the electric stove. She turned them every hour, eagerly awaiting the time that sharp little mouths would break the shell and human-like little hands would tear an opening from which a human-like baby would emerge, oddly pretty ugly like a gnome, and unusual only in that it could stand upright from the moment of birth. One little boy was arguing with Chitikik. He wore a warm robe of vegetable fiber veins knitted to serve as a base for a feather cloak. He was pointing out that with such a robe he could survive a blizzard and claiming quite justly that he did not have to be in the house in order to stay warm. Was that Rupert? thought Alan. He was about to call the child when his two wives came to the door, arm in arm, flushed with the heat of the kitchen where they had been cooking the two dinners together, one dinner for the humans, now numbering thirty-eight, and the other for the bird people, who were tremendously appreciative of getting cooked food but who had odd requirements in the recipes, such as one quart of finely ground granite gravel to each gallon of oatmeal, sugared to taste and served with soybean milk. Alan stood behind his wives and put a hand on the shoulder of each. It's hard to think, he said, that a little over ten years ago we didn't even know that we were still people. Now look at us, a family and a good one. Alma turned her face up to be kissed, and Ellen, who was less sentimental, lifted her face to be kissed, too, so that her co-wife would not be embarrassed at being babied separately. The two liked each other very much. Alma came out of the cube finsterness as a forgetty, conditioned to remember nothing of her long, sad, psychotic life before the instrumentality had sent her on a wild mission among the stars. When she had joined Alan and Ellen, she knew the words of the old common tongue, but very little else. Ellen had had some time to teach her, to love her, and to mother her before any of the babies were born, and the relationship between the two of them was warm and good. The three parents stood aside as the bird women, wearing their comfortable and pretty feather cloaks, herded the children into the house. The smallest children had already been brought in from their sunning and were being given their bottles by bird girls who never got tired of watching the cuteness and helplessness of the human infant. It's hard to think of that time at all, said Ellen, who had been folly. I wanted beauty and fame and a perfect marriage, and nobody even told me that they didn't go together. I have had to come to the end of the stars to get what I wanted, to be what I might become.
And me, said Alma, who had been Finsterness. I had a worse problem. I was crazy. I was afraid of life. I didn't even know how to be a woman, a sweetheart, a female, a mother. How could I ever guess that I needed a sister and wife, like the one you have been, to make my life whole? Without you to show me, Ellen, I could never have married our husband. I thought I was carrying murder among the stars, but I was carrying my own solution as well. Where else could I turn out to be me? And I, said Alan, who had been Sam, became a metal giant between the stars because my first wife was dead and my own children forgot me and neglected me. Nobody can say I'm not a father now. Thirty-five and more than half of them mine? I'll be more of a father than any other man of the human race has ever been. There was a change in the shadow as the enormous right arm swung heavily toward the sky as a prelude to the sharp robotic call that nightfall, calculated with astronomical precision, had indeed come to the place where he stood. The arm reached its height, pointing straight up. I used to do that, said Alan. The cry came, something like a silent pistol shot, which all of them heard, but a shot without echoes, without reverberations. Alan looked around. All the children are in, even Rupert. Come in, my darlings, and let us have dinner together. Alma and Ellen went ahead of him, and he barred the heavy doors behind them. This was peace and happiness. That, at last, was goodness. They had no obligation but to live and to be happy. The threat and the promise of victory were far, far behind. On the Sand Planet This is the story of the sand planet itself, Miser, which had lost all hope when the tyrant Wedder imposed the reign of terror and virtue, and its liberator, Casher O'Neill, of whom strange things were told from the day of blood in which he fled from his native city of Cahir until he came back to end the shedding of blood for all the rest of his years. Everywhere that Casher had gone, he had had only one thought in his mind, deliverance of his home country from the tyrants whom he himself had let slip into power when they had conspired against his uncle, the unspeakable Kuraf. He never forgot, whether waking or sleeping. He never forgot Kahir itself along the first Nile, where the horses raced on the turf with the sand nearby. He never forgot the blue skies of his home and the great dunes of the desert between one Nile and the others. He remembered the freedom of a planet built and dedicated to freedom. He never forgot that the price of blood is blood, that the price of freedom is fighting, that the risk of fighting is death. But he was not a fool. He was willing, if he had to, to risk his own death. But he wanted odds on the battle which would not merely snare him home, like a rabbit to be caught in a steel trap, by the police of the dictator Wedder. And then he met the solution of his crusade without knowing it at first. He had come to the end of all things, all problems, all worries. He had also come to the end of all ordinary hope. He met Taruth. Now her subtle powers belonged to Kasher O'Neill, to do with as he pleased. It pleased him to return to Mizer, to enter Kahir itself and to confront Wedder. Why should he not come? It was his home, and he thirsted for revenge. More than revenge, he hungered for justice. He had lived many years for this hour, and this hour came. He entered the north gate of Cahir. 1. Kasher walked into Miser wearing the uniform of a medical technician in Wetter's own military service. He had assumed the appearance and the name of a dead man named Bindaud. Kasher walked with nothing more than his hands as weapons, and his hands swung freely at the end of his arms. Only the steadfastness of his feet, the resolute grace with which he took each step, betrayed his purpose. The crowds in the street saw him pass, but they did not see him. They looked at a man, and they did not realize that they saw their own history going step by step through their various streets. Kasher O'Neill had entered the city of Cahir. He knew that he was being followed. He could feel it. He glanced around. He had learned in his many years of fighting and struggle on strange planets countless rules of unremembered hazards. To be alert, he knew what this was. It was a such-as-ache. 
The Such's Ache at the moment had taken the shape of a small, witless boy, some eight years old, who had two trails of stained mucus pouring down from his nostrils, who had forever open lips, ready to call with the harsh bark of idiocy, who had eyes that did not focus right. Casher O'Neill knew that this was a boy, and not a boy. It was a hunting and searching device often employed by police lords, when they presumed to make themselves into kings or tyrants, a device which flitted from shape to shape, from child to butterfly or bird, which moved with the such as ache and watched the victim, watching, saying nothing, following. He hated the such as ache and was tempted to throw all the powers of his strange mind at it so that the boy might die and the machine hidden within it might perish. But he knew that this would lead to a cascade of fire and splashing of blood. He had already seen blood in Cahir long ago. He had no wish to see it in the city again. Instead, he stopped the pacing, which had been following his cadenced walk through the street. He turned calmly and kindly and looked at the boy, and he said to the boy and to the hideous machine within the boy, Come along with me. I'm going straightway to the palace, and you would like to see that. The machine, confronted, had no further choice. The idiot boy put his hand in Casher's hand, and somehow or other Casher O'Neill managed to resume the rolling, deliberate march which had marked so many of his years, while keeping a grip on the hand of the demented child who skipped beside him. Casher could still feel the machine watching him from within the eyes of the boy. He did not care. He was not afraid of guns. He could stop them. He was not afraid of poison. He could resist it. He was not afraid of hypnotism. He could take it in and spit it back. He was not afraid of fear. He had been on Henrietta. He had come home through Space 3. There was nothing left to fear. Straightway went he to the palace. The midday gleamed in the bright yellow sun which rode the skies of Cahir. The whitewashed walls in the arabesque design stayed as they had been for thousands of years. Only at the door was he challenged. But the sentry hesitated as Kasher spoke. I am Bin Daoud, loyal servant to Colonel Wedder, and this is a child of the streets whom I propose to heal in order to show our good Colonel Wedder a fair demonstration of my powers. The sentry said something into a little box which sat in the wall. Kasher passed freely. The such as ache trotted beside him. As he went through the corridors, Laid with rich rugs, military and civilians moving back and forth, he felt happy. This was not the palace of Wedder, though Wedder lived in it. It was his own palace. He, Kasher, had been born in it. He knew it. He knew every corridor. The changes of the years were very few. Kasher turned left into an open courtyard. He smelled the smell of salt water and the sand and the horses nearby. He sighed a little at the familiarity of it, the good and kind welcome. He turned right again and ascended long, long stairs. Each step was carpeted in a different design. His uncle Kurov had stood at the head of these very stairs while men and women, boys and girls, were brought to him to become toys of his evil pleasures. Kurov had been too fat to walk down these stairs to greet them. He always let the captives come up to himself and to his den of pleasures. Kasher reached the top of the stairs and turned left. This was no den of pleasures now. It was the office of Colonel Wedder. He, Kasher, had reached it. How strange it was to reach this office, this target of all his hopes, this one fevered pinpoint in all the universe for which his revenge had thirsted until he thought himself mad. He had thought of bombing this office from outer space, or of cutting it with the thin arc of a laser beam or of poisoning it with chemicals, or of assaulting it with troops. He had thought of pouring fire on this building, or water. He had dreamed of making Miser free, even at the price of the lovely city of Cahir itself, by finding a small asteroid somewhere and crashing it in an interplanetary tragedy directly into the city itself. And the city, under the roar of that impact, would have blazed into thermonuclear incandescence and would have become a poison lake at the end of the Twelve Niles. He had thought of a thousand ways of entering the city and of destroying the city, merely in order to destroy Wedder. Now he was here. So, too, was Wedder. 
Wetter did not know that he, Casher O'Neill, had come back. Even less did Wetter know who Casher O'Neill had become, the master of space, the traveler who traveled without ships, the vehicle for devices stranger than any mind on Miser had ever conceived. Very calm, very relaxed, very quiet, very assured, the doom which was Casher O'Neill walked into the antechamber of Wetter. Very modestly, he asked for Wetter. The dictator happened to be free. He had changed little since Kasher last saw him. A little older, a little fatter, a little wiser. All these, perhaps. Kasher was not sure. Every cell and filament in his living body had risen to the alert. He was ready to do the work for which the light years had ached, for which the worlds had turned, and he knew that within an instant it would be done. He confronted Wetter, gave Wetter a modest, assured smile. Your servant, the technician Bin Daoud, sir and colonel, said Kasher O'Neill. Wetter looked at him strangely. He reached out his hand, and even as their hands touched, Wetter said the last words he would ever say on his own. Within that hand clasp, Wetter spoke again, and his voice was strange. Who are you? Kasher had dreamed that he would say, I am Kasher O'Neill, come back from unimaginable distances to punish you. Or that he would say, I am Kasher O'Neill, and I have ridden star lanes for years upon years to find your destruction. Or he had even thought that he might say, Surrender or die, Wetter, your time has come. Sometimes he had dreamed he would say, Here, Wetter, and then show him the knife with which to take his blood. Yet this was the climax, and none of these things occurred. The idiot boy with the machine within it stood at ease. Kasher O'Neill merely held Wetter's hand and said quite simply, Your friend. As he said that, he searched back and forth. He could feel inner eyes within his own head, eyes which did not move within the sockets of his face, eyes which he did not have, and with which he could nevertheless see. These were the eyes of his perception. Quickly, he adjusted the anatomy of Wetter, working kinesthetically, squeezing an artery there, pinching off a gland here. Here, harden the tissue, through which the secretions of a given endocrine material had to come. In less time than it would take an ordinary doctor to describe the process, he had changed Wetter. Wetter had been tuned down like a radio with dials realigned, like a spaceship with its lock sheets reset. The work which Kasher had done was less than any pilot does in the course of an ordinary landing. But the piloting he had done was within the biochemical system of Wetter himself, and the changes which he had effected were irreversible. The new Wetter was the old Wetter, the same mind, the same will, the same personality. Yet its permutations were different and its method of expression already slightly different, more benign, more tolerant, more calm, more human, even a little corrupt, as he smiled and said, I remember you now, Bin Daoud. Can you help that boy? The supposed Bin Daoud ran his hands over the boy. The boy wept with pain and shock for a moment. He wiped his dirty nose and upper lip on his sleeves. His eyes came into focus. His lips compressed. His mind burned brightly as its old worn channels became human instead of idiot. The such as ache machine knew it was out of place and fled for another refuge. The boy, given his brains but no words, no education yet, stood there and hiccuped with joy. Wetter said very pleasantly, That is remarkable. Is it all that you have to show me? All, said Kasher O'Neill. You were not he. He turned his back on Wetter and did so in perfect safety. He knew Wetter would never kill another man. Kasher stopped at the door and looked back. He could tell from the posture of Wetter that that which had to be done had been done. The changes within the man were larger than the man himself. The planet was free, and Kasher's own work was indeed done. The suddenly frightened child, which had lost the such-as-ache, followed him out of blind instinct. 
The colonels and the staff officers did not know whether to salute or nod when they saw their chief stand at the doorway and waved with unexpected friendliness at Casher O'Neill. As Casher descended the broad, carpeted steps, the child stumbling behind him. At the furthest steps, Casher looked one last time at the enemy who had become almost a part of himself. There stood Wetter, the man of blood, and now he himself, Casher O'Neill, had expunged the blood, had redone the past and reshaped the future. All Miser was heading back to the openness and freedom which it had enjoyed in the time of the old Republic of the Twelve Niles. He walked on, shifting from one corridor to the other and using shortcuts to the courtyards, until he came to the doorway of the palace. The sentry presented arms. At ease, said Kasher. The man put down his gun. Kasher stood outside the palace, that palace which had been his uncle's, which had been his own, which had really been himself. He felt the clear air of Miser. He looked at the clear blue skies which he had always loved. He looked at the world to which he had promised he would return with justice, with vengeance, with thunder, with power. Thanks to the strange and subtle capacities which he had learned from the Turtle Girl to Ruth, hidden in her own world amid the storm-churned atmosphere of Henrietta, he had not needed to fight. Kasher turned to the boy and said, I am a sword which has been put into its scabbard. I am a pistol with the cartridges dropped out. I am a wire point with no battery behind it. I am a man, but I am very empty. The boy made strangled, confused sounds, as though he were trying to think, to become himself, to make up for all the lost time he had spent in idiocy. Kasher acted on impulse. Curiously, he gave to the boy his own native speech of Kahir. He felt his muscles go tight, shoulders, neck, fingertips, as he concentrated with the arts he had learned in the palace of Beauregard, where the girl Teruth governed almost forever in the name of Mr. and owner Murray Madigan. He took the arts and memories he sought. He seized the boy roughly but tightly by the shoulders. He peered into frightened, crying eyes, and then, in a single blast of thought, he gave the boy speech, words, memory, ambition, skills. The boy stood there dazed. At last, the boy spoke, and he asked, Who am I? Kasher could not answer that one. He patted the child on the shoulder. He said, Go back to the city and find out. I have other needs. I have to find out who I myself may be. Goodbye, and peace be with you. Two. Kasher remembered that his mother still lived here. He had often forgotten her. It would have been easier to forget her. Her name was Triheap, and she had been sister to Kurov. Where Kurov had been vicious, she had been virtuous. Where Kurov had sometimes been grateful, she had been thrifty and shifty. Where Kurov, with all his evils, had acquired a toleration for men and things and ideas, she remained set on the pattern of thought which her parents had long ago taught her. Kasher O'Neill did something he thought he would never do. He had never really even thought about doing it. It was too simple. He went home. At the gate of the house, his mother's old servant knew him, despite the change in his face, and she said, with a terrible awe in her voice, It seems to me that I am looking at Kasher O'Neill. I use the name Bindaud, said Kasher, but I am Kasher O'Neill. Let me in and tell my mother that I am here. He went into the private apartment of his mother. The old furniture was still there, the polished bric-a-brac of a hundred ages, the old paintings and the old mirrors, and the dead people, whom he had never known, represented by their pictures and their mementos. He felt just as ill at ease as he felt when he was a small boy, when he had visited the same room before his uncle came to take him to the palace. His mother came in. She had not changed. He half thought that she would reach out her arms to him and cry in a deliberately modern passion, My baby, my precious, come back to me. She did no such thing. She looked at him coldly, as though he were a complete stranger. She said to him, You don't look like my son, but I suppose that you are. You have made trouble enough in your time. Are you making trouble now? I make no malicious trouble, mother, and I never have 
said Kasher, no matter what you may think of me. I did what I had to do. I did what was right. Betraying your uncle was right. Letting down our family was right. Disgracing us all was right. You must be a fool to talk like this. I heard that you were a wanderer, that you had great adventures, and had seen many worlds. You don't sound any different to me. You're an old man. You almost seem as old as I do. I had a baby once, but how could that be you? You are an enemy of the house of Kuraf O'Neill. You're one of the people who brought it down in blood. But they came from outside with their principles and their thoughts and their dreams of power, and you stole from inside like a cur. You opened the door and you let in ruin. Who are you that I should forgive you? I do not ask your forgiveness, mother, said Kasher. I do not even ask your understanding. I have other places to go and other things yet to do. May peace be upon you. She stared at him, said nothing. He went on. You will find Mizra a more pleasant place to live in, since I talked to Wedder this morning. You talked to Wedder? cried she. And he did not kill you? He did not know me. Wedder did not know you? I assure you, mother, he did not know me. You must be a very powerful man, my son. Perhaps you can repair the fortune of the house of Kuraf O'Neill, after all the harm you have done, and all the heartbreak you brought to my brother. I suppose you know your wife's dead. I had heard that, said Kasher. I hope she died instantly in an accident and without pain. Of course it was an accident. How else do people die these days? She and her husband tried at one of those new boats and it overturned. I'm sorry I wasn't there. I know that. I know that perfectly well, my son. You were outside there so that I had to look up at the stars with fear. I could look up in the sky and stare for the man who was my son lurking up there with blood and ruin, with vengeance upon vengeance heaped upon all of us, just because he thought he knew what was right. I've been afraid of you for a long time, and I thought if I ever met you again I would fear you with my whole heart. You don't quite seem to be what I expected, Kasher. Perhaps I can like you. Perhaps I can even love you as a mother should. Not that it matters. You and I are too old now. I'm not working on that kind of mission any longer, Mother. I have been in this old room long enough, and I wish you well. But I wish many other people well, too. I have done what I had to do. Perhaps I had better say goodbye, and much later, perhaps, I will come back and see you again, when both of us know more about what we have to do. Don't you even want to see your daughter? Daughter? said Casher O'Neill. Do I have a daughter? Oh, poor fool you. Didn't you even find that out after you left? She bore your child all right. She even went through the old-fashioned business of a natural birth. The child even looks something like the way you used to look. Matter of fact, she's rather arrogant, like you. You can call on her if you want to. She lives in the house which is just outside the square in Golden Lout, in the leather workers area. Her husband's name is Ali Ali. Look her up if you want to. She extended a hand. Kasher took the hand as though she had been a queen, and he kissed the cool fingers. As he looked her in the face here, too, he brought his skills from Henrietta in place. He surveyed and felt her personally, as though he were a surgeon of the soul. But in this case there was nothing for him to do. This was not a dynamic personality, struggling and fighting and moving against the forces of life and hope and disappointment. This was something else. A person set in life, immobile, determined, rigid even for a man with healing arts who could destroy a fleet with his thoughts, or who could bring an idiot to normality by mere command. He could see that this was a case beyond his powers. He patted the old hand affectionately, and she smiled warmly at him, not knowing what it meant. If anyone asks, said Kasher, the name I have been using is that of the Dr. Bin Daoud. Bin Daoud the Technician. Can you remember that, Mother? Bin Daoud the Technician, she echoed, as she led him out the door to walk in the street. Within twenty minutes he was knocking at his daughter's door. Three. The daughter herself answered the door. She flung it open. 
She looked at the strange man, surveyed him from head to heels. She noted the medical insignia on his uniform. She noted his mark of rank. She appraised him shrewdly, quickly, and she knew he had no business there in the quarters of the leather workers. Who are you? she sang out quickly and clearly. In these hours and at this time I pass under the name of the expert Bin Daoud, a technician and medical man back from the special forces of Colonel Wedder. I'm just on leave, you see, but sometime later, madam, you might find out who I really am, and I thought you better hear it from my lips. I'm your father. She did not move. The significant thing is that she did not move at all. Casher studied her, and could see the cast of his own bones in the shape of her face, could see the length of his own fingers repeated in her hands. He had sensed that the storms of duty, which had blown him from sorrow to sorrow, the wind of conscience, which had kept alive his dreams of vengeance, had turned into something very different in her. It, too, was a force, but not the kind of force he understood. I have children now, and I would just as soon you not meet them. As a matter of fact, you have never done me a good deed except to beget me. You have never done me an ill deed except to threaten my life from beyond the stars. I am tired of you, and I am tired of everything you were or might have been. Let's forget it. Can't you go your way and let me be? I may be your daughter, but I can't help that. As you wish, madam. I have had many adventures, and I do not propose to tell them to you. I can see quickly enough that you have what is seemingly a good life, and I hope that my deeds this morning in the palace will have made it better. You'll find out soon enough. Goodbye. The door closed upon him, and he walked back through the sun-drenched market of the leather workers. There were golden hides here, hides of animals which had been artfully engraved with very fine strips of beaten gold, so that they gleamed in the sunlight. Casher looked upward and around. Where do I go now? thought he. Where do I go when I've done everything I had to do? When I've loved everyone I have wanted to love? When I have been everything I have had to be? What does a man with a mission do when the mission is fulfilled? Who can be more hollow than a victor? If I had lost, I could still want revenge. But I haven't. I've won. And I've won nothing. I've wanted nothing for myself from this dear city. I want nothing from this dear world. It's not in my power to give it or to take it. Where do I go when I have nowhere to go? What do I become when I am not ready for death and I have no reason whatsoever for life? There sprang into his mind the memory of the world of Henrietta with the twisting snakes of the little tornadoes. He could see the slender, pale, hushed face of the girl to Ruth, and he remembered at last that which it was which she had held in her hand. It was the magic. It was the secret sign of the old strong religion. There was the man forever dying nailed to two pieces of wood. It was the mystery behind the civilization of all these stars. It was the thrill of the first forbidden one, the second forbidden one, the third forbidden one. It was the mystery on which the robot, rat, and copt agreed when they came back from Space 3. He knew what he had to do. He could not find himself because there was no himself to be found. He was a used tool, a discarded vessel. He was a shard tossed on the ruins of time, and yet he was a man with eyes and brains to think and with many unaccustomed powers. He reached into the sky with his mind, calling for a public flying machine. Come and get me, he said and the great winged bird-like machine came soaring over the rooftops and dropped gently into the square. I thought I heard you call, sir. Casher reached into his pocket and took out his imaginary pass, signed by Wetter, authorizing him to use all the vehicles of the Republic in the secret service of the regime of Colonel Wetter. The sergeant recognized the pass and almost popped out his eyes in respect. The Ninth Nile. Can you reach it with this machine? Easily, said the sergeant. But you better get some shoes first. Iron shoes, because the ground there is mostly volcanic glass. Wait here for me, said Casher. Where can I get the shoes? Two streets over, and better get two water bottles, too. Four.
Within a matter of minutes, he was back. The sergeant watched him fill the bottles in the fountain. He looked at his medical insignia without doubt and showed him how to sit on the cramped emergency seat inside the great machine bird. They snapped their seat belts and the sergeant said, Ready? And the ornithopter spread out its wings and flew into the air. The huge wings were like oars digging into a big sea. They rose rapidly, and soon Cahir was below them, the fragile minarets and the white sand with the racing turf along the river, and the green fields and even the pyramids copied from something on ancient earth. The operator did something and the machine flew harder. The wings, although far slower than any jet aircraft, were steady, and they moved with respectable speed across the broad, dry desert. Kasher still wore his decimal watch from Henrietta, and it was two whole decimal hours before the sergeant turned around, pinched him gently awake from the drowse into which he had fallen, shouted something, and pointed down. A strip of silver matched by two strips of green wandering through a wilderness of black, gleaming, glittering black, with the beige sands of the everlasting desert stretching everywhere in the distance. The Ninth Nile, shouted Kasher. The sergeant smiled the smile of a man who had heard nothing but wanted to be agreeable, and the ornithopter dived with a lurching suddenness toward the twist in the river. A few buildings became visible. They were modest and small. Verandas, perhaps, for the use of a visitor. Nothing more. It was not the sergeant's business to query anyone on secret orders from Colonel Wetter. He showed the cramped Casher O'Neill how to get out of the ornithopter, and then, standing in his seat, saluted and said, Anything else, sir? Kasher said, No, I'll make my own way. If they ask you who I was, I am the Dr. Bin Daoud, and you have left me here under orders. Right, sir, said the sergeant. And the great machine reached out its gleaming wings, flapped, spiraled, climbed, became a dot, and vanished. Kasher stood there alone, utterly alone. For many years he had been supported by a sense of purpose, by a drive to do something and now the drives and the purpose were gone, and his life was gone, and the use of his future was gone, and he had nothing. All he had was the ultimate imagination, health, and great skills. These were not what he wanted. He wanted the liberation of all misery. But he had gotten that, so what was it? He almost stumbled towards one of the nearby buildings. A voice spoke up, a woman's voice, the friendly voice of an old woman. Very unexpectedly, she said, I've been waiting for you, Kasher. Come on in. Five. He stared at her. I've seen you, he said. I've seen you somewhere. I know you well. You've affected my fate. You did something to me, and yet I don't know who you are. How could you be here to meet me when I didn't know I was coming? Everything in its time, said the woman, with the time for everything and what you need now is rest. I'm Dalma, the dog woman from Pontopidan, the one who washed the dishes. Her, cried he. Me, she said. But you, but you, how did you get here? I got here, she said. Isn't that obvious? Who sent you? You're part of the way to the truth, she said. You might as well hear a little more of it. I was sent here by a lord whose name I will never mention, a lord of the underpeople, acting from Earth. He sent out another dogwoman to take my place, and he had me shipped here as simple baggage. I worked in the hospital where you recovered, and I read your mind as you got well. I knew what you would do to Wetter, and I was pretty sure that you would come up here to the Ninth Nile, because that is the road that all searchers must take. Do you mean he said, that you know the road to... He hesitated, and then plunged into his question. The Holy of Unholies? The Thirteenth Nile? I don't see that it means anything, Kasher, except that you'd better take off those iron shoes. You don't need them yet. You'd better come in here. Come on in. He pushed the beaded curtains aside and entered the bungalow. It was a simple frontier official dwelling. There were cots hither and yon, a room to the rear which seemed to be hers, a dining room to the right, and there were papers, a viewing machine, cards, and games on the table. The room itself was astonishingly cool. She said, Kasher, 
You've got to relax, and that is the hardest of all things to do, to relax, when you had a mission for many, many years. I know it, said he. I know it. But knowing it and doing it aren't the same things. Now you can do it, said De Alma. Do what? he snapped. Relax, as we were talking about. All you have to do here is to have some good meals, just sleep a few times, swim in the river if you want to. I have sent everyone away except myself, and you and I shall have this house. And I am an old woman, not even a human being. You're a man, a true man, who's conquered a thousand worlds, and who has finally triumphed over Wedder. I think we'll get along, and when you're ready for the trip, I'll take you. The days did pass as she said they would. With insistent but firm kindness, she made him play games with her. Simple, childish games with dice and cards. Once or twice he tried to hypnotize her, to throw the dice his own way. He changed the cards in her hand. He found that she had very little telepathic offensive power, but that her defenses were superb. She smiled at him whenever she caught him playing tricks, and his tricks failed. With this kind of atmosphere, he really began to relax. She was the woman who had spelled happiness for him on Pontapadan when he didn't know what happiness was, when he had abandoned the lovely Genevieve to go on with his quest for vengeance. Once he said to her, Is that old horse still alive? Of course he is, she said. That horse will probably outlive you and me. He thinks he's on misery by galloping around a patrol capsule. Come on back, it's your turn to play. He put down the cards, and slowly the peace, the simplicity, the reassuring, calm sweetness of it all stole over him, and he began to perceive the nature of her therapy. It was to do nothing but slow him down. He was to meet himself again. It may have been the tenth day, perhaps it was the fourteenth, that he said to her, When do we go? She said, I've been waiting for that question, and we're ready now. We go. When? Right now. Put on your shoes. You won't need them very much, she said, but you might need them where we land. I am taking you part way there. Within a few minutes they went out into the yard. The river in which he had swum lay below. A shed, which he did not remember having noticed before, lay at the far end of the yard. She did something to the door, removing a lock, and the door flung open, and she pulled out a skeletonized ornithopter motor, wings, tails. The body was just a bracket of metal. The source of power was, as usual, an ultra-miniaturized nuclear-powered battery. Instead of seats, there were two tiny saddles, like the saddles used in the bicycles of old, old Earth, which he had seen in museums. You can fly that? he asked. Of course I can fly it. It's better than going two hundred miles over broken glass. We are leaving civilization now. We are leaving everything that was on any map. We are flying directly to the Thirteenth Nile, as you well knew it should be that. I knew that, he said. I never expected to reach it so soon. Does this have anything to do with that sign of the fish you were talking about? Everything, Kasher, everything. But everything in its place. Climb in behind me. He sat on top of the ornithopter, and this one ran down the yard on its tall, graceful mechanical legs before the flaps of its wings put it in the air. She was a better pilot than the sergeant had been. She soared more and beat the wings less. She flew over country that he, a native of Miser, had never dreamed about. They came to a city gaudy in color. He could see large fires burning alongside the river, and brightly painted people with their hands lifted in prayer. He saw temples and strange gods in them. He saw markets with goods, which he never thought to see marketed. Where are we? he asked. Dalma said, This is the city of hopeless hope. She put the ornithopter down, and as they climbed out of the saddles, it lifted itself into the air and flew back, in the direction from whence they had come. You are staying with me? asked Kasher. Of course I am. I was sent to be with you. What for? You are important to all the world's Kasher, not just Miser. By the authority of the friends I have, they have sent me here to help you.
But what do you get out of it? I get nothing, Kasher. I find my own destruction, perhaps, but I will accept that. Even the loss of my own hope, if it only moves you further on in your voyage. Come, let us enter the city of hopeless hope. 6. They walked through the strange streets. Almost everyone in the streets seemed to be engaged in the practice of religion. The stench of the burning dead was all round them. Talismans, luck charms, and funeral supplies were in universal abundance. Kasher said, speaking rather quietly to Dalma, I never knew there was anything like this on any civilized planet. Obviously, she replied, there must be many people who believe and worry about death. There are many who do know about this place. Otherwise, there would not be the throngs here. These are the people who have the wrong hope and who go to no place at all, who find under this earth and under the stars their final fulfillment. These are the ones who are so sure that they are right that they never will be right. We must pass through them quickly, Kasher, lest we, too, start believing. No one impeded their passage in the streets, although many people paused to see that a soldier, even a medical soldier in uniform, had the audacity to come there. They were even more surprised that an old hospital attendant, who seemed to be an off-world dog, walked along beside him. We cross the bridge now, Kasher, and this bridge is the most terrible thing I've ever seen, whereas now we are going to come to the Jwins, and the Jwins oppose you and me and everything you stand for. Who are the Jwins? asked Kasher. The Jwins are the perfect ones. They are perfect in this earth. You will see soon enough. 7. As they crossed the bridge, a tall, blithe police official, clad in a neat black uniform, stepped up to them and said, Go back. People from your city are not welcome here. We are not from that city, said Dalma. We are travelers. Where are you bound? asked the police official. We are bound for the source of the 13th Nile. Nobody goes there, said the guard. We are going there, said Dalma. By what authority? Kasher reached into his pocket and took out a genuine card. He had remade one from the memories he had retained in his mind. It was an all-world pass authorized by the instrumentality. The police official looked at it and his eyes widened. Sir and Master, I thought you were merely one of Wetter's men. You must be someone of great importance. I will notify the scholars in the Hall of Learning at the middle of the city. They will want to see you. Wait here. A vehicle will come. Dalma and Kasher O'Neill did not have long to wait. She said nothing at all in this time. Her air of good humor and competence ebbed perceptibly. She was distressed by the cleanliness and perfection around her, by the silence, by the dignity of the people. When the vehicle came, it had a driver, as correct, as smooth, and as courteous as the guard at the bridge. He opened the door and waved them in. They climbed in and they sped noiselessly through the well-groomed streets. Houses, each one in immaculate taste, trees planted the way in which trees should be planted. In the center square of the city they stopped. The driver got out, walked around the vehicle, opened their door. He pointed at the archway of the large building and he said, They are expecting you. Kasher and Dalma walked up the steps reluctantly. She was reluctant because she had some sense of what this place was, a special dwelling for quiet doom and arrogant finality. He was reluctant because he could feel that in every bone of her body she resented this place, and he resented it too. They were led through the archway and across a patio to a large, elegant conference room. Within the room a circular table had already been set in preparation of a meal. Ten handsome men rose to greet them. The first one said, You are Kasher O'Neill. You are the wanderer. You are the man dedicated to this planet, and we appreciate what you have done for us, even though the power of Colonel Wetter never reached here. Thank you, said Kasher. I am surprised to hear that you know of me. That's nothing, said the man. We know of everyone. And you, woman, said the same man to Dalma, you know full well that we never entertain women here. And you are the only underperson in this city. A dog at that. But in honor of our guest, we shall let you pass. 
Sit down if you wish. We want to talk to you. A meal was served. Little squares of sweet, unknown meat, fresh fruits, bits of melon, chased with harmonious drinks which cleared the mind and stimulated it, without intoxicating or drugging. The language of their conversations was clear and elevated. All questions were answered swiftly, smoothly, and with positive clarity. Finally, Kasher was moved to ask, I do not seem to have heard of you, Jwins. Who are you? We are the perfect ones, said the oldest Jwins. We have all the answers. There is nothing else left to find. How do you get here, said Kasher. We are selected from many worlds. Where are your families? We don't bring them with us. How do you keep out intruders? If they are good, they wish to stay. If they are not good, we destroy them. Kasher, still shocked by his experience of fulfilling all his life's work in the confrontation with Wetter, though his life might be at stake, asked casually, Have you decided yet whether I am perfect enough to join you, or am I not perfect and to be destroyed? The heaviest of all the Jwins, a tall, portly man with a great bushy shock of black hair, replied ponderously, Sir, you are forcing our decision, but I think that you may be something exceptional. We cannot accept you. There is too much force in you. You may be perfect, but you are more than perfect. We are men, sir, and I do not think that you are any longer a mere man. You are almost a machine. You are yourself, dead people. You are the magic of ancient battles coming to strike among us. We are all of us a little afraid of you. And yet we do not know what to do with you. If you were to stay here a while, if you calmed down, we might give you hope. We know perfectly well what that dog woman of yours calls our city. She calls it the city of the perfect ones. We just call it Jwin's Joe, in memory of the ancient rule of the Jwin's, which somewhere once obtained upon old earth. And therefore, we think that we will neither kill you nor accept you. We think, do we not, gentlemen? that we will speed you on your way, as we have sped no other traveler, and that we will send you then to a place which few people pass. But you have the strength, and if you are going to the source of the Thirteenth Nile, you will need it. I will need strength, Kasher asked. The first Jwins who had met them at the door said, Indeed, you will need strength if you go to Mortaval. We may be dangerous to the uninitiated. Mortaval is worse than dangerous. It is a trap many times worse than death. But go there if you must. 8. Kasher O'Neill and Dalma reached Mortaval on a one-wheeled cart, which ran on a high wire past picturesque mountain gorges, soaring over two serrated series of peaks, and finally dropping down to another bend in the same river, the illegal and forgotten Thirteenth Nile. When the vehicle stopped, they got out. No one had accompanied them. The vehicle, held in place by gyroscopes and compasses, felt itself relieved of their weight and hurried home. This time there was no city, just one great arch. Dalma clung close to him. She even took his arm and pulled it over her shoulder, as though she needed protection. She whined a little as they walked up a low hill and finally reached the arch. They walked into the arch, and a voice not made of sound cried out to them. I am youth, and am everything that you have been or ever will be. Know this now before I show you more. Kasher was brave, and this time he was cheerfully hopeless, so he said, I know who I am. Who are you? I am the force of the Gunung Banga. I am the power of this planet which keeps everyone in this planet— and which assures the order which persists among the stars, and promises that the dead shall not walk among the men, and I serve of the fate and the hope of the future. Pass, if you think you can. Kasher searched with his own mind, and he found what he wanted. He found the memory of a young child, Teruth, who had been almost a thousand years on the planet of Henrietta, a child soft and gentle on the outside, but wise and formidable and terrible beyond belief, in the powers which she had carried, which had been imprinted upon her. As he walked through the arch, he cast the images of truth here and there. Therefore, he was not one person, 
but a multitude, and the machine and the living being which hid behind the machine, the Gunung Banga, obviously could see him, and could see Dalma walking through, but the machine was not prepared to recognize whole multitudes of crying throngs. Who are you thousands that you should come here now? Who are you multitudes that you should be two people? I sense all of you, the fighters and the ships, and the men of blood, the searchers and the forgetters. There's even an old North Australian renunciant here, and the great go-captain Tree, and there are even a couple of men of old earth. You are all walking through me. How can I cope with you? Make us us, said Kasher firmly. Make you you, replied the machine. Make you you. How can I make you you when I do not know who you are, when you flit like ghosts and you confuse my computers? There are too many, I say. There are too many of you. It is ordained that you should pass. If it is so ordained, then let us pass. De Alma suddenly stood proud and erect. They walked on through. She said, You got us through. They had indeed passed beyond the arch, and there, beyond the arch, lay a gentle riverside with skiffs pulled up along the beach. This seems to be next, said Cashier O'Neill. Dalma nodded. I'm your dog, master. We go where you think. They climbed into a skiff. Echoes of tumult followed from the arch. Goodbye to troubles, the echoes said. Had they been people, they would have been stopped. But she was a dog and a servant who had lived many years in the happiness of the sign of the fish. And he was a combat-ready man who had incorporated within himself the memories of adversaries and friends, too tumultuous for any scanner to measure, too complex for any computer to assess. The echoes resounded across the river. There was even a dock on the other side. Kasher tied the skiff to the dock, and he helped the dog woman go toward the buildings that they saw beyond some trees. 9. Dalma said, I have seen pictures of this place. This is the Kermes d'Orgoy, and here we may lose our way, because this is the place where all the happy things of this world come together, but where the man and the two pieces of wood never filter through. We shall see no one unhappy, no one sick, no one unbalanced. Everyone will be enjoying the good things of life. Perhaps I will enjoy it too. May the sign of the fish help me that I not become perfect too soon. You won't be, Kasher promised. At the gate of this city there was no guard at all. They walked on past a few people who seemed to be promenading outside the town. Within the city they approached what seemed to be a hotel and an inn or a hospital. At any rate, it was a place where many people were fed. A man came out and said, Well, this is a strange sight. I never knew that the Colonel Wetter let his officers get this far from home, and as far as you, woman, you're not even a human being. You're an odd couple and you're not in love with each other. Can we do anything for you? Kasher reached into his pocket and tossed several credit pieces of five denominations in front of the man. Don't these mean anything? asked Kasher. Catching them in his fingers, the man said, Oh, we can use money. We use it occasionally for important things. We don't need yours. We live well here and we have a nice life. Not like those two places across the river which stay away from life. All men who are perfect are nothing but talk. Jwins, they call themselves, the perfect ones. Well, we're not that perfect. We've got families and good food and good clothes, and we get the latest news from all the worlds. News, said Kasher. I thought that was illegal. We get anything. You would be surprised at what we have here. It's a very civilized place. Come on in. This is the Hotel of the Singing Swans, and you can live here as long as you wish. When I say that, I mean it. Our treasure has unusual resources, and I can see that you are unusual people. You are not a medical technician, despite that uniform, and your follower is not a mere dog underperson, or you wouldn't have gotten this far. They entered a promenade two stories high. Little shops lined each side of the corridor with the treasures of all the worlds on exhibit. The prices were marked explaining them, but there was no one in the stalls. 
The smell of good food came from a cool dining room in the inn. Come into my office and have a drink. My name is Howard. That's an old earth name, said Casher. Why shouldn't it be? asked Howard. I came here from old earth. I looked for the best of all places, and it took me a long time to find it. This is it. The Kermesse d'Orgoy. We have nothing here but simple and clean pleasures. We have only those vices which help and support. We accomplish the possible. We reject the impossible. We live life, not death. Our talk is about things and not about ideas. We have nothing but scorn for that city behind you, the city of the perfect ones. And we have nothing but pity for the holier-than-holies far back where they claim to have hopeless hope and practice nothing but evil religion. I passed through those places, too, although I had to go around the city of the perfect ones. I know what they are, and I've come all the way from Earth. And if I have come all the way from old, old Earth, I should know what this is. You should take my word for it. I've been on Earth myself, said Casher, rather dryly. It's not that unusual. The man stopped with surprise. My name, said Casher, is Casher O'Neill. The man halted and then gave him a deep bow. If you are Casher O'Neill, you have changed this world. You have come back, my lord and master. Welcome. We are no longer your host. This is your city. What do you wish of us? To look a while, to rest a while, to ask directions for the voyage? Directions? Why should anyone want directions away from here? People come here and ask directions from a thousand places to get to Kermes Dorgoy. Let's not argue this now, said Kasher. Show us the rooms, let us clean ourselves up. Two separate rooms. Howard walked upstairs. With an intricate twist of his hand, he unlocked two rooms. At your service, he said. Call me with your voice. I can hear you anywhere in the building. Kasher called once for sleeping gear, toothbrushes, shaving equipment. He insisted that they send the shampooer, a woman of apparent earth origin, in to attend to D'Alma, and D'Alma actually knocked at his door and begged that he not shower her with these attentions. He said, You with your deep kindness have helped me so far. I am helping you very little. They ate a light repast together in the garden just below their two rooms, and then they went to their rooms and slept. It was only on the morning of the second day that they went with Howard into the city to see what could be found. Everywhere the city was strong with happiness. The population could not have been very large, twenty or thirty thousand persons at most. At one point, Casher stopped. He could smell the scorch of ozone in the air. He knew the atmosphere itself had been burned, and that meant only one thing, spaceships coming in or going out. He asked, Where is the spaceport for Earth? Howard looked at him quickly and keenly. If you were not the Lord Casher O'Neill, I'd never tell you. We have a small spaceport there. That is the way that we avoid our traffic with most of Miser. Do you need it, sir? Not now, said Casher. I just wondered where it was. They came to a woman who danced as she sang to the accompaniment of two men with wild, archaic guitars. Her feet did not have the laughter of ordinary dance, but they had the positiveness, the compulsion of a meaning. Howard looked at her appreciatively. He even ran the tip of his tongue across his upper lip. She is not yet spoken for, said Howard, and yet she is a very unusual thing, a resigned ex-lady of the instrumentality. I find that unusual indeed. What is her name? Sayalta, said Howard. Sayalta, the other one. She has been in many worlds, perhaps as many worlds as you have, sir. She's faced dangers like the ones you've faced. And, oh, my lord and master, forgive me for saying it, but when I look at her dancing, and I see you looking at her, I can see a little bit into the future, and I can see you both dead together, the winds slowly blowing the flesh off your bones and your bones anonymous and white, lying two valleys over from this very place. That's an odd enough prophecy, said Casher, especially from someone who seems not to be poetic. What is that? I seem to see you in the deep, dry lake of the damned Irene. There's a road out of here that goes there, and some people, not many, go there, and when they go there they die. 
I don't know why, said Howard. Don't ask me. Dalma whispered, That is the road to the Shrine of Shrines. That's the place to the quell itself. Find out where it starts. Where does that road start? asked Kasher. Oh, you'll find out. There's nothing you won't find out. Sorry, my lord and master. The road starts just beyond that bright orange roof. He pointed to a roof and then turned back. Without saying anything more, he clapped his hands at the dancer and she gave him a scornful look. Howard clapped his hands again. She stopped dancing and walked over. And what is it you want now, Howard? He gave her a deep bow. My former lady, my mistress, here is the lord and master of this planet, Casher O'Neill. I am not really the lord and master, said Casher O'Neill. I merely would have been if Wedder had not taken the rule away from my uncle. Should I care about that? asked the woman. Kasher smiled back. I don't see why you should. Do you have anything you want to say to me? Yes, said Kasher. He reached over and seized her wrist. Her wrist was almost as strong as his. You have danced your last dance, madam, at least for the time. You and I are going to a place that this man knows about, and he says that we are going to die there, and our bones will be blown with the wind. You give me commands, she cried. I give you commands, he said. What is your authority? she asked scornfully. Me, he said. She looked at him. He looked back at her, still holding her wrist. She said, I have powers. Don't make me use them. He said, I have powers, too. Nobody can make me use mine. I'm not afraid of you. Go ahead. Fire shot at him as he felt the lunge of her mind toward his, her attack, her flight for freedom, but he kept her wrist and she said nothing. But with his mind responding to hers, he unfolded the many worlds, the old earth itself, the gem planet, Olympia of the blind brokers, the storm planet Henrietta, and a thousand other places that most people only knew in stories and dreams. And then, just for a little bit, he showed her who he was, a native of Mizer who had become a citizen of the universe, a fighter who had been transformed into a doer. He let her know that in his own mind he carried the powers of Tiruth, the turtle girl, and behind Tiruth herself he carried the personalities of the Hekazera of Gonfalon. He let her see the ships in the sky turning and twisting as they fought nothing at all, because his mind, or another mind which had become his, had commanded them to. And then with the shock of a sudden vision he projected to her the two pieces of wood, the image of a man in pain. And gently, but with the simple rhetoric of profound faith, he pronounced, This is the call of the first forbidden one, and the second forbidden one, and the third forbidden one. This is the symbol of the sign of the fish. For this you are going to leave this town, and you are going with me, and it may be that you and I shall become lovers. Behind him a voice spoke. And I, said Dalma, will stay here. He turned around to her. Dalma, you've come this far. You've got to come further. I can't, my lord. I read my duty as I see it. If the authorities who sent me want me enough, they will send me back to my dishwasher on Pontopadan. Otherwise, they will leave me here. I am temporarily beautiful, and I'm rich, and I'm happy, and I don't know what to do with myself. But I know I have seen you as far as I can. May the sign of the fish be with you. Howard merely stood aside, making no attempt to hinder them or to help them. Selalta walked beside Kasher like a wild animal which had never been captured before. Kasher O'Neill never let go of her wrist. Do we need food for this trip? he asked of Howard. No one knows what you need. Should we take food? I don't see why, said Howard. You have water. You can always walk back here if you have disappointments. It's really not very far. Will you rescue me? If you insist on it, said Howard. I suppose somewhere people will come out and bring you back, but I don't think you will insist, because that is the deep, dry lake of the damned Irene, and the people who go in there do not want to come out, and do not want to eat, and they do not want to go forward. 
We have never seen anyone vanish to the other side, but you might make it. I am looking, said Kasher, for something which is more than power between the worlds. I am looking for a sphinx that is bigger than the sphinx on old earth, for weapons which cut sharper than lasers, for forces that move faster than bullets. I am looking for something which will take the power away from me and put the simple humanity back into me. I am looking for something which will be nothing, but a nothing I can serve and can believe in. You sound like the right kind of man, said Howard, for that kind of trip. Go in peace, both of you. Selalta said, I do not really know who you are, my lord, master, but I have danced my last dance. I see what you mean. This is the road that leads away from happiness. This is the path which leaves good clothes and warm shops behind. There are no restaurants where we are going, no hotels, no river anymore. There are neither believers nor unbelievers, but there is something that comes out of the soil which makes people die. But if you think, Casher O'Neill, that you can triumph over it, I will go with you, and if you do not think it, I will die with you. We are going, Selalta. I didn't know that it was just going to be the two of us, but we are going, and we are going now. 10. It was actually less than two kilometers to get over the ridge away from the trees, away from the moisture-laden air along the river, and into a dry, calm valley, which had a clean, blessed quietness which Kasher had never seen before. Selalta was almost gay. This? This is the deep, dry lake of the damned Irene? I suppose it is, said Kasher. But I propose to keep on walking. It isn't very big. As they walked, their bodies became burdensome. They carried not only their own weight, but the weight of every month of their lives. The decision seemed good to them that they should lie down in the valley and rest amid the skeletons. Rest as the others had rested. Selalta became disoriented. She stumbled, and her eyes became unfocused. Not for nothing had Kasher O'Neill learned all the arts of battle of a thousand worlds. Not for nothing had he come through Space Three. This valley might have been tempting if already he had not ridden the cosmos on his eyes alone. He had. He knew the way out. It was merely through. Selalta seemed to come more to life as they reached the top of the ridge. The whole world was suddenly transformed by not more than ten steps. Far behind them, several kilometers perhaps, there were still visible the last rooftops of the Kermes d'Orgoy. Behind them lay the bleaching skeletons. In front... In front of them was the final source and the mystery, the quell of the Thirteenth Nile. Eleven. There was no sign of a house, but there were fruits and melons and grain growing, and there were deep trees at the edges of caves, and there were here and there signs of people that had been there long ago. There were no signs of present occupancy. My lord, said the once Lady Selalta. My lord, she repeated, I think this is it. But this is nothing, said Kasher. Exactly. Nothing is victory. Nothing is arrival. Nowhere is getting there. Don't you see now why she left us? She? asked Kasher. Yes, your faithful companion, the dog-woman, Dalma. No, I don't see it. Why did she leave this to us? Selalta laughed. We're Adam and Eve, in a way. It's not up to us to be given a god or to be given a faith. It's up to us to find the power, and this is the quietest and last of the searching places. The others were just phantoms, hazards on our route. The best way to find freedom is not to look for it, just as you obtained your utter revenge on Wetter by doing him a little bit of good. Can't you see it, Kasher? You have won at last the immense victory that makes all battles seem vain. There is food around us. We can even walk back to the Kermes d'Orgoy if we want clothing or company, or if we want to hear the news. But most of all, this is the place in which I feel the presence of the first forbidden one, the second forbidden one, and the third forbidden one. We don't need a church for this though I suppose there are still churches on some planets. What we need is a place to find ourselves and be ourselves, 
and I'm not sure that this chance exists in many other places than this one spot. You mean, said Kasher, that everywhere is nowhere? Not quite that, said Selalta. We have some work to do getting this place in shape, feeding ourselves. Do you know how to cook? Well, I can cook better. We can catch a few things to eat. We can shut ourselves in that cave, and then... And then Selalta smiled, her face more beautiful than he ever expected he would find a face to be. We have each other. Kasher stood battle-ready, facing the most beautiful dancer he had ever met. He realized that she had once been a part of the instrumentality, a governor of worlds, a genuine advisor in the destination of mankind. He did not know what strange motives had caused her to quit authority and to come up to this hard-to-find river, unmarked on maps. He didn't even know why the man Howard should have paired them so quickly. Perhaps there was another force, a force behind that dog woman which had sent him to his final destination. He looked down at Selalta, and then he looked up at the sky and he said, Day is ending. I will catch a few of those birds if you know how to cook them. We seem to be a sort of Adam and Eve, and I do not know whether this is paradise or hell. But I know that you are in it with me, and that I think about you because you ask nothing of me. That is true, my lord, I ask nothing of you. I too am looking for both of us, not myself alone. I can make a sacrifice for you but I look for those things which only we two, acting together, can find in this valley. He nodded in serious agreement. Look, she said, that is the quell itself. There the thirteenth Nile comes out of the rocks, and here are the woods below. I seem to have heard of it. Well, we'll have plenty of time. I'll start the fire, but you go catch two of those chickens. I don't even think they're wild birds. I think they are just leftover people chickens— that have grown wild since their previous owners left. Or died, said Kasher. Or died, repeated Selalta. Isn't that a risk anybody has to take? Let us live, my lord, you and me, and let us find the magic, the deliverance which strange fates have thrown in front of you and me. You have liberated Miser, is that not enough? Simply by touching wetter you have done what otherwise could have been accomplished at the price of battle and great suffering. Thank you, said Kasher. I was once instrumentality, my lord, and I know that the instrumentality likes to do things suddenly and victoriously. When I was there, we never accepted defeat, but we never paid anything extra. The shortest route between two points might look like the long way around. It isn't. It's merely the cheapest human way of getting there. Has it ever occurred to you that the instrumentality might be rewarding you for what you have done for this planet? I hadn't thought of it, said Kasher. You hadn't thought of it? She smiled. Well, said Kasher, embarrassed and at a loss for words. I am a very special kind of woman, said Selalta. You will be finding that out in the next few weeks. Why else do you think that I would be given to you? He did not go to hunt the chickens, not just then. He reached his arms out to her, and, with more trust and less fear than he had felt in many years, he held her in his arms and kissed her on the lips. This time there was no secret reserve in his mind, no promise that after this he would get on with his journey to Miser. He had won. His victory was behind him, and in front of him there lay nothing but this beautiful and powerful place, and Selalta. Under Old Earth I need a temporary dog for a temporary job on a temporary place like Earth. Song from the Merchant of Menace 1. There were the Douglas Ouyang planets which circled their sun in a single cluster, riding around and around the same orbit unlike any other planets known. There were the gentlemen's suicides back on Earth who gambled their lives even more horribly, gambled sometimes for things worse than their lives against different kinds of geophysics which real men had never experienced. There were girls who fell in love with such men, however stark and dreadful their personal fates might be. There was the instrumentality with its unceasing labor to keep man man, 
And there were the citizens who walked in the boulevards before the rediscovery of man. The citizens were happy. They had to be happy. If they were found sad, they were calmed and drugged and changed until they were happy again. This story concerns three of them. The gambler, who took the name Sun Boy, who dared to go down to the Gebier, who confronted himself before he died, the girl Santuna, who was fulfilled in a thousand ways before she died, and the Lord Stowe Odin, a most ancient of days, who knew it all and never dreamed of preventing any of it. Music runs through this story, the soft, sweet music of the earth government and the instrumentality, bland as honey and sickening in the end. The wild, illegal pulsations of the Gebier, where most men were forbidden to enter. Worst of all, the crazy fugues and improper melodies of the Berserk, closed to men for fifty-seven centuries, opened by accident, found trespassed in. And with it, our story begins. 2. The Lady Rue had said, a few centuries before, Scraps of knowledge have been found. In the ultimate beginning of man, even before there were aircraft, the wise man Louds declared, Water does nothing, but it penetrates everything. Inaction finds the road. Later, an ancient lord said this, There is a music which underlies all things. We dance to the tunes all our lives, though our living ears never hear the music which guides us and moves us. Happiness can kill people as softly as shadows seen in dreams. We must be people first, and happy later, lest we live and die in vain. The Lord Stowe Odin was more direct. He declared the truth to a few private friends. Our population is dropping on most worlds, including the Earth. People have children, but they don't want them very much. I myself have been a three-father to twelve children, a two-father to four, and a one-father, I suppose, to many others. I have had zeal for work, and I have mistaken it for zeal in living. They are not the same. Most people want happiness. Good. We have given them happiness. Dreary, useless centuries of happiness, in which all the unhappy were corrected or adjusted or killed. Unbearable, desolate happiness without the sting of grief, the wine of rage, the hot fumes of fear. How many of us have ever tasted the acid, icy taste of old resentment? That's what people really lived for in the ancient days, when they pretended to be happy, and were actually alive with grief, rage, fury, hate, malice, and hope. Those people bred like mad. They populated the stars while they dreamed of killing each other, secretly or openly. Their plays concerned murder or betrayal or illegal love. Now we have no murder. We cannot imagine any kind of love which is illegal. Can you imagine the Merkins with their highway net? Who can fly anywhere today without seeing that net of enormous highways? Those roads are ruined, but they're still here. You can see the abominable things quite clearly from the moon. Don't think about the roads. Think of the millions of vehicles that ran on those roads. The people filled with greed and rage and hate rushing past each other with their engines on fire. They say that 50,000 a year were killed on the roads alone. We would call that a war. What people they must have been to rush day and night and to build things which would help other people to rush even more. They were different from us. They must have been wild, dirty, free, lusting for life, perhaps in a way that we do not. We can easily go a thousand times faster than they ever went, but who, nowadays, bothers to go? Why go? It's the same there as here, except for a few fighters or technicians. He smiled at his friends and added, And lords of the instrumentality, like ourselves, we go for the reasons of the instrumentality, not ordinary people reasons. Ordinary people don't have much reason to do anything. They work at the jobs which we think up for them, to keep them happy while the robots and the under people do the real work. They walk. They make love, but they are never unhappy. They can't be! The Lady Mona disagreed. Life can't be as bad as you say. We don't just think they are happy. We know they are happy. We look right into their brains with telepathy. We monitor their emotional patterns with robots and scanners. It's not as though we didn't have samples. 
People are always turning unhappy. We are correcting them all the time. And now and then there are bad accidents which even we cannot correct. When people are very unhappy, they scream and weep. Sometimes they even stop talking and just die, despite everything we can do for them. You can't say that isn't real. But I do, said the Lord Stowe Odin. You do what? cried Mona. I do say this happiness is not real, he insisted. How can you, she shouted at him, in the face of the evidence? Our evidence, which we of the instrumentality decided on a long time ago. We collected ourselves. Can we, the instrumentality, be wrong? Yes, said the Lord Stowe Odin. This time it was the entire circle who went silent. Stowe Odin pleaded with them. Look at my evidence. People don't care whether they are one father's or one mother's or not. They don't know which children are theirs anyhow. Nobody dares to commit suicide. We keep them too happy. But do we spend any time keeping the talking animals, the under people, as happy as men? And do under people commit suicide? Certainly, said Mona. They are preconditioned to commit suicide if they are hurt too badly for easy repair or if they fail in their appointed work. I don't mean that. Do they ever commit suicide for their reasons, not ours? No, said the Lord Nuru-Or, a wise young lord of the instrumentality. They are too desperately busy doing their jobs and staying alive. How long does an underperson live? said Stowe Odin with deceptive mildness. Who knows, said Nuru Or, half a year, a hundred years, maybe several hundred years. What happens if he does not work, said the Lord Stowe Odin with a friendly, crafty smile. We kill him, said Mona, or our robot police do. And does the animal know it? No, he will be killed if he does not work, said Mona. Of course, we tell all of them the same thing, work or die. What's that got to do with people? The Lord Nuru Or had fallen silent, and a wise, sad smile had begun to show on his face. He had begun to suspect the shrewd, dreadful conclusion toward which the Lord Stowe Odin was driving. But Mona did not see it, and she pressed the point. My Lord, said she, you are insisting that people are happy. You admit they do not like to be unhappy. You seem to want to bring up a problem which has no solution. Why complain of happiness? Isn't it the best which the instrumentality can do for mankind? That's our mission. Are you saying that we are failing in it? Yes, we are failing. The Lord Stowe Odin looked blindly at the room as though alone. He was the oldest and wisest, so they waited for him to talk. He breathed lightly and smiled at them again. You know when I am going to die? Of course, said Mona, thinking for half a second. Seventy-seven days from now. But you posted the time yourself, and it is not our custom, my lord, as you well know, to bring intimate things into meetings of the instrumentality. Sorry, said Stowe Odin, but I'm not violating a law. I'm making a point. We are sworn to uphold the dignity of man, yet we are killing mankind with a bland, hopeless happiness which has prohibited news, which has suppressed religion, which has made all history an official secret. I say that the evidence is that we are failing, and that mankind, whom we've sworn to cherish, is failing too, failing in vitality, strength, numbers, energy. I have a little while to live. I am going to try to find out. The Lord Nuru Or asked with sorrowful wisdom, as though he guessed the answer, And where will you go to find out? I shall go, said the Lord Stowe Odin, down into the Gebier. The Gebier? Oh, no, cried several. And one voice added, You're immune. I shall waive immunity and I shall go, said the Lord Stowe Odin. Who can do anything to a man who is already almost a thousand years old, and who has chosen only seventy-seven more days to live? But you can't, said Mona. Some criminal might capture you and duplicate you, and then we would all of us be in peril. When did you last hear of a criminal among mankind? said Stowe Odin. 
There are plenty of them here and there in the off-worlds. But on old Earth itself? asked Stow Odin. She stammered. I don't know. There must have been a criminal once. She looked around the room. Don't any of the rest of you know? There was silence. The Lord Stow Odin stared at them all. In his eyes was the brightness and fierceness which had made whole generations of lords plead with him to live just a few more years, so that he could help them with their work. He had agreed, but within the last quarter year he had overridden them all and had picked his day of death. He had lost none of his powers in doing this. They shrank from his stare while they waited with respect for his decision. The Lord Stow Odin looked at the Lord Nuru Or and said, I think you have guessed what I am going to do in the Gebier, and why I have to go there. The Gebier is a preserve where no rules apply and no punishments are inflicted. Ordinary people can do what they want down there, not what we think they should want. From all I hear, it is pretty nasty and pointless, the things that they find out. But you, perhaps, may sense the inwardness of these things. You may find a cure for the weary happiness of mankind. That is right, said Stow Odin, and that is why I am going, after I make the appropriate official preparations. 3. Go, he did. He used one of the most peculiar conveyances ever seen on earth, since his own legs were too weak to carry him far. With only two-ninths of a year to live, he did not want to waste time getting his legs regrafted. He rode in an open sedan chair carried by two Roman legionnaires. The legionnaires were actually robots, without a trace of blood or living tissue in them. They were the most compact and difficult kind to create, since their brains had to be located in their chests. Several million sheets of incredibly fine laminations, imprinted with the whole life experience of an important, useful, and long-dead person. They were clothed as legionnaires down to queer asses, swords, kilts, greaves, sandals, and shields, merely because it was the whim of the Lord Stow Odin to go behind the rim of history for his companions. Their bodies, all metal, were very strong. They could batter walls, jump chasms, crush any man or underperson with their mere fingers, or throw their swords with the accuracy of guided projectiles. The forward legionary, Flavius had been head of 14B in the instrumentality, an espionage division so secret that even among lords few knew exactly of its location or its function. He was, or had been, till he was imprinted on a robot mind as he lay dying, the director of historical research for the whole human race. Now he was a dull, pleasant machine, carrying two poles until his master chose to bring his powerful mind into bright, furious alert by speaking the simple Latin phrase, understood by no other person living, Summa Nulla Est. The rear legionary, Livius, had been a psychiatrist who turned into a general. He had won many battles until he chose to die, somewhat before his time, because he perceived that battle itself was a struggle for the defeat of himself. Together, and added to the immense brain power of the Lord Stow Odin himself, they represented an unsurpassable team. The Gabier, commanded the Lord Stow Odin. The Gabier, said both of them heavily, picking up the chair with its supporting poles. And then the Berserk, he added. The Berserk, they chimed in toneless voices. Stow Odin felt his chair tilt back as Livius put his two ends of the poles carefully on the ground, came up beside Stow Odin and saluted with open palm. "'May I awaken?' said Livius in an even mechanical voice. "'Summa nulla est,' said the Lord Stow Odin. Livius's face sprang into full animation. "'You must not go there, my lord! You would have to waive immunity and meet all dangers! There is nothing there yet, not yet! Some day they will come pouring out of that underground Hades and give you men a real fight!' Now, no, they are just miserable beings cooking away in their weird unhappiness, making love in manners which you never thought of. Never mind what you think I've thought. What's your objection in real terms? It's pointless, my lord. You have only bits of a year to live. Do something noble and great for man before you die. 
They may turn us off. We would like to share your work before you go away. Is that all? said Stow Odin. My lord, said Flavius, you have awakened me too. I say go forward. History is being respun down there. Things are loose, which you great ones of the instrumentality have never even suspected. Go now and look before you die. You may do nothing, but I disagree with my companion. It is as dangerous as Space 3 might be, if we ever were to find it. But it is interesting, and in this world where all things have been done, where all thoughts have been thought, it is hard to find things which still prompt the human mind with raw curiosity. I'm dead, as you perfectly well know, but even I, inside this machine brain, feel the tug of adventure, the pull of danger, the magnetism of the unknown. For one thing, they are committing crimes down there, and you lords are overlooking them. We chose to overlook them. We are not stupid. We wanted to see what might happen, said the Lord Stowe Odin, and we have to give those people time before we find out just how far they might go if they are cut off from controls. They are having babies, said Flavius excitedly. I know that. They have hooked in two illegal instant message machines, shouted Flavius. Stow Odin was calm. So that's where the Earth's credit structure has appeared to be leaking in its balance of trade. They have a piece of the Congo helium, shouted Flavius. The Congo helium, shouted the Lord Stow Odin. Impossible! It's unstable! They could kill themselves! They could hurt Earth! What are they doing with it? Making music, said Flavius, more quietly. Making what? Music! Songs! Nice noise to dance to! The Lord Stow Odin sputtered. Take me there right now. This is ridiculous. Having a piece of the Congo helium down there is as bad as wiping out inhabited planets to play checkers. My lord, said Livius. Yes, said Stow Odin. I withdraw my objections, said Livius. Stow Odin said very dryly, Thank you. They have something else down there. When I did not want you to go, I did not mention it. It might have aroused your curiosity. They have a god. The Lord Stow Odin said, If this is going to be a historical lecture, save it for another time. Go back to sleep and carry me down. Livius did not move. I mean what I said. A god? What do you call a god? A person or an idea capable of starting wholly new cultural patterns in motion. The Lord Stow Odin leaned forward. You know this? We both do, said Flavius and Livius. We saw him, said Livius. You told us a tenth year ago to walk around freely for thirty hours, so we put on ordinary robot bodies and happened to get into the gebier. When we sensed the Congo helium operating, we had to go on down to find out what it was doing. Usually it is employed to keep the stars in their place. Don't tell me that. I know it. Was it a man? A man, said Flavius, who is reliving the life of Achnaten. Who's that? said the Lord Stow Odin, who knew history but wanted to see how much his robots knew. A king, tall, long-faced, thick-lipped, who ruled the human world of Egypt long, long before atomic power. Achnaten invented the best of the early gods. This man is reenacting Achnaten's life step by step. He has already made a religion out of the sun. He mocks at happiness. People listen to him. They joke about the instrumentality. Livius added, We saw the girl who loves him. She herself was young but beautiful, and I think she has powers which will make the instrumentality promote her or destroy her some day in the future. They both made music, said Flavius, with that piece of the Congo helium, and this man or god, this new kind of Achnaten, Whatever you may want to call him, my lord. He was dancing a strange kind of dance. It was like a corpse being tied with rope and dancing like a marionette. The effect on the people around him was as good as the best hypnotism you ever saw. I'm a robot now, but it bothered even me. Did the dance have a name? said Stow Odin. I don't know the name, said Flavius, but I memorized the song since I have total recall. Do you wish to hear it? 
Certainly, said the Lord Stow Odin. Flavius stood on one leg, threw his arms out at weird, improbable angles, and began to sing in a high, insulting tenor voice which was both fascinating and repugnant. Jump, dear people, and I'll howl for you. Jump and howl and I'll weep for you. I weep because I'm a weeping man. I'm a weeping man because I weep. I weep because the day is done. Sun is gone, home is lost, time killed dad, I killed time. World is round, day is run. Clouds are shot, stars are out. Mountains fire, rain is hot, hot is blue, I am done, so are you. Jump, dear people, for the howling man. Leap, dear people, for the weeping man. I'm a weeping man because I weep for you. Enough, said the Lord Stow Odin. Flavius saluted. His face went back to amiable stolidity. Just before he took the front ends of the shaft, he glanced back and brought forth one last comment. The verse is skeltonic. Tell me nothing more of your history. Take me there. The robots obeyed. Soon the chair was jogging comfortably down the ramps of the ancient leftover city, which sprawled beneath Earthport that miraculous tower which seemed to touch the stratocumulus clouds in the blue, clear nothingness above mankind. Stow Odin went to sleep in his strange vehicle, and did not notice that the human passers-by often stared at him. The Lord Stow Odin woke fitfully in strange places as the legionnaires carried him further and further into the depths below the city, where sweet pressures and warm, sick smells made the air itself feel dirty to his nose. Stop, whispered the Lord Stow Odin, and the robots stopped. Who am I? he said to them. You have announced your will to die, my lord, said Flavius, seventy-seven days from now, but so far your name is still the Lord Stow Odin. I am alive, the lord asked. Yes, said both the robots. You are dead? We are not dead. We are machines, printed with the minds of men who once lived. Do you wish to turn back, my lord? No. No, now I remember. You are the robots, Livius the psychiatrist and General Flavius, the secret historian. You have the minds of men and are not men? That is right, my lord, said Flavius. Then how can I be alive? I, Stow Odin. You should feel it yourself, sir, said Livius, though the mind of the old is sometimes very strange. How can I be alive? asked Stow Odin, staring around the city. How can I be alive when the people who knew me are dead? They have whipped through the corridors like wraiths of smoke, like traces of cloud. They were here, and they loved me, and they knew me, and now they are dead. Take my wife, Eileen. She was a pretty thing, a brown-eyed child who came out of her learning chamber all perfect and all young. Time touched her, and she danced to the cadence of time. Her body grew full, grew old. We repaired it, but at last she cramped in death, and she went to that place to which I am going. If you are dead, you ought to be able to tell me what death is like— where the bodies and minds and voices and music of men and women whip past these enormous corridors, these hardy pavements, and are then gone. How can passing ghosts like me and my kind, each with just a few dozen or a few hundred years to go before the great blind winds of time, whip us away? How can phantoms like me have built this solid city, these wonderful engines, these brilliant lights which never go dim. How did we do it when we pass so swiftly, each of us, all of us? Do you know? The robots did not answer. Pity had not been programmed into their systems. The Lord Stow Odin harangued them nonetheless. You are taking me to a wild place, a free place, an evil place, perhaps. They are dying there, too, as all men die as I shall die, so soon, so brightly and simply. I should have died a long time ago. I was the people who knew me. I was the brothers and comrades who trusted me. I was the women who comforted me. I was the children whom I loved so bitterly and so sweetly many ages ago. Now they are gone. 
Time touched them, and they were not. I can see everyone that I ever knew racing through these corridors, see them young as toddlers, see them proud and wise and full with business and maturity, see them old and contorted as time reached out for them and they passed hastily away. Why did they do it? How can I live on? When I am dead, will I know that I once lived? I know that some of my friends have cheated and lie in the icy sleep, hoping for something which they do not know. I've had life and I know it. What is life? A bit of play? A bit of learning? Some words well chosen? Some love? A trace of pain? More work, memories, and then dirt rushing up to meet sunlight? That's all we've made of it. We, who have conquered the stars. Where are my friends? Where is my me that I once was so sure of when the people who knew me were time-swept like storm-driven rags toward darkness and oblivion? You tell me you ought to know. You are machines and you were given the minds of men. You ought to know what we amount to from the outside in. We were built, said Livius, by men. And we have whatever men put into us, nothing more. How can we answer talk like yours? It is rejected by our minds, good though our minds may be. We have no grief, no fear, no fury. We know the names of these feelings, but not the feelings themselves. We hear your words, but we do not know what you are talking about. Are you trying to tell us what life feels like? If so, we already know. Not much. Nothing special. Birds have life, too. And so do fishes. It is you people who can talk, and who can knot life into spasms and puzzles. You muss things up. Screaming never made the truth truthful. At least, not to us. Take me down, said Stowe Odin. Take me down to the Gebier, where no well-mannered man has gone in many years. I am going to judge that place before I die. They lifted the sedan chair and resumed their gentle dog trot down the immense ramps, down toward the warm, steaming secrets of the earth itself. The human pedestrians became more scarce, but undermen, most often of gorilla or ape origin, passed them, toiling their way upward while dragging shrouded treasures, which they had filched from the uncatalogued storehouses of man's most ancient past. At other times there was a wild whirl of metal wheels on stone roadway. The undermen, having offloaded their treasures at some intermediate point high above, sat on their wagons and rolled back downhill, like grotesque enlargements of the ancient human children, who were once reported to have played with wagons in this way. A command, scarcely a whisper, stopped the two legionnaires again. Flavius turned. Stowe Odin was indeed calling both of them. They stepped out of the shafts and came around to him, one on each side. I may be dying right now, he whispered, and that would be most inconvenient at this time. Get out my mannequin me. My lord, said Flavius, it is strictly forbidden for us robots to touch any human mannequin, and if we do touch one we are commanded to destroy ourselves immediately thereafter. Do you wish us to try nevertheless? If so, which one of us? You have the command, my lord. Four. He waited so long that even the robots began to wonder if he died amid the thick wet air and the nearby stench of steam and oil. The Lord Stowe Odin finally roused himself and said, I need no help. Just put the bag with my mannequin me on my lap. This one? asked Flavius lifting a small brown suitcase and handling it with a very gingerly touch indeed. The Lord Stowe Odin gave a barely perceptible nod and whispered, Open it carefully for me, but do not touch the mannequin, if those are your orders. Flavius twisted at the catch of the bag. It was hard to manage. Robots did not feel fear, but they were intellectually attuned to the avoidance of danger. Flavius found his mind racing with wild choices as he tried to get the bag open. Stowe Odin tried to help him, but the ancient hand, palsied and weak, could not even reach the top of the case. Flavius labored on, thinking that the Gebier and Berserk had their dangers, 
but that this meddling with mannequins was the riskiest thing which he had ever encountered while in robot form, though in his human life he had handled many of them, including his own. They were mannequin, electroencephalographic, and endocrine in model form, and they showed in miniaturized replica the entire diagnostic position of the patient for whom they were fashioned. Stowe Odin whispered to them, There's no helping it. Turn me up. If I die, take my body back and tell the people that I misjudged my time. Just as he spoke, the case sprang open. Inside it there lay a little naked human man, a direct copy of Stowe Odin himself. "'We have it, my lord,' cried Livius from the other side. "'Let me guide your hand to it, so that you can see what to do.' Though it was forbidden for robots to touch mannequins me, it was legal for them to touch a human person with the person's consent. Livius's strong, cuproplastic fingers, with a reserve of many tons of gripping power in their human-like design, pulled the hands of the Lord Stowe Odin forward until they rested on the mannequin me. Flavius, quick, smooth, agile, held the Lord's head upright on his weary old neck, so that the ancient Lord could see what the hands were doing. "'Is any part dead?' said the old Lord to the mannequin, his voice clearer for the moment. The mannequin shimmered, two spots of solid black showed along the outside upper right thigh and the right buttock. Organic reserve, said the Lord to his own mannequin me, and again the machine responded to his command. The whole miniature body shimmered to a violent purple, and then subsided to an even pink. I still have some all-around strength left in this body, prosthetics and all, said Stu Odin to the two robots, "'Set me up, I tell you! Set me up!' "'Are you sure, my lord?' said Livius. "'That we should do a thing like that here where the three of us are alone in a deep tunnel? "'In less than half an hour we could take you to a real hospital where actual doctors could examine you.' "'I said,' repeated the Lord Stow Odin, "'set me up! I'll watch the mannequin while you do it.' "'Your control is in the usual place, my lord,' asked Livius. How much of a turn? asked Flavius. Nape of my neck, of course. The skin over it is artificial and self-sealing. One twelfth of a turn will be enough. Do you have a knife with you? Flavius nodded. He took a small, sharp knife from his belt, probed gently around the old lord's neck, and then brought the knife down with a quick, sure turn. That did it, said Stow Odin, in a voice so hearty that both of them stepped back a little. Flavius put the knife back in his belt. Stowe Odin, who had almost been comatose a moment before, now held the mannequin me in his unaided hands. See, gentlemen, he cried, you may be robots, but you can still see the truth and report it. They both looked at the mannequin me, which Stowe Odin now held in front of himself, his thumb and fingertip in the armpits of the medical doll. Watch what it reads, he said to them with a clear, ringing voice. Prosthetics, he shouted at the mannequin. The tiny body changed from its pink color to a mixture. Both legs turned the color of a deep, bruised blue. The legs, the left arm, one eye, one ear, and the skull cap stayed blue, showing the prosthetics in place. Felt pain, shouted Stow Odin at the mannequin. The little doll returned to its light pink color. All the details were there, even to genitals, toenails, and eyelashes. There was no trace of the black color of pain in any part of the little body. Potential pain, shouted Stow Odin. The doll shimmered. Most of it settled to the color of dark walnut wood, with some areas of intense brown showing more clearly than the rest. Potential breakdown, one day! shouted Stow Odin. The little body went back to its normal color of pink. Small lightnings showed at the base of the brain, but nowhere else. I'm all right, said Stow Odin. I can continue as I have done for the last several hundred years. Leave me set up in this high life output. I can stand it for a few hours, and if I cannot, there's a little lost. He put the mannequin back in its bag, hung the bag on the door handle of the sedan chair and commanded the legionnaires, Proceed! 
The legionnaires stared at him as if they could not see him. He followed the lines of glance and saw that they were gazing rigidly at his mannequin me. It had turned black. Are you dead? asked Livius, speaking as hoarsely as a robot could. Not dead at all, cried Stow Odin. I have been death in fractions of a moment, but for the time I am still life. That was just the pain some of my living body which showed on the mannequin me. The fire of life still burns within me. Watch as I put the mannequin away. The doll flared into a swirl of pastel orange as the Lord Stow Odin pulled the cover down. They looked away as though they had seen an evil or an explosion. Down, men! Down! he cried, calling them wrong names as they stepped back between their carrying shafts to take him deeper under the vitals of the earth. Five. He dreamed brown dreams while they trotted down endless ramps. He woke a little to see the yellow walls passing. He looked at his dry old hand, and it seemed to him that in this atmosphere he had himself become more reptilian than human. I am caught by the dry, drab entitlement of old, old age, he murmured. But the voice was weak, and the robots did not hear him. They were running downward on a long, meaningless concrete ramp which had become filmed by a leak of ancient oil, and they were taking care that they did not stumble and drop their precious master. At a deep, hidden point, the downward ramp divided, the left into a broad arena of steps, which could have seated thousands of spectators for some never-to-occur event, and the right into a narrow ramp which bore upward and then curved, yellow lights and all. Stop! called Stow Odin. Do you see her? Do you hear it? Hear what? said Flavius. The beat and the cadence of the Congo helium rising out of the gabier. The whirl and the skirl of impossible music coming at us through miles of solid rock. That girl whom I can already see waiting at a door which should never have been opened. The sound of the starborn music, not designed for the proper human ear. He shouted. Can't you hear it? That cadence, the unlawful metal of Congo helium so terrible far underground. Da da, da da, da. Music which nobody has ever understood before, said Flavius. I hear nothing, saving the pulse of air in this corridor, and your own heartbeat, my lord. And something else, a little like machinery, very far away. There, that, cried Stow Odin which you call a little like machinery. Does it come in a beat of five separate sounds, each one distinct? No, no, sir, not five. And you, Livius, when you were a man, you were very telepathic. Is there any of that left in the robot which is you? No, my lord, nothing. I have good senses, and I am also cut into the subsurface radio of the instrumentality. Nothing unusual. No five beat, each note separate, short of prolonged, given meaning and shape by the terrible music of the Congo helium, imprisoned with us inside this much too solid rock. You hear nothing? The two robots, shaped like Roman legionnaires, shook their heads. But I can see her through this stone. She has breasts like ripe pears, and dark brown eyes that are like the stones of fresh-cut peaches, and I can hear what they are singing, their weird, silly words of a pentapol, made into something majestic by the awful music of the Congo helium. Listen to the words. When I repeat them, they sound just silly, because the dread-inspiring music does not come with them. Her name is Santuna. And she stares at him. No wonder she stares. He is much more tall than most men. Yet he makes this foolish song into something frightening and strange. Slim Jim, dim him, grim. And his name is Yebeyi. But now he is Sun Boy. He has the long face and the thick lips of the first man to talk about one god and one only, Akhnaten. Akhnaten the Pharaoh, said Flavius. That name was known in my office when I was a man. It was a secret. 
one of the first and greatest of the more than ancient kings. You see him, my lord. Through this rock I see him. Through this rock I hear the delirium engendered by the Congo helium. I go to him. The Lord Stow Odin stepped out of the sedan chair and beat softly and weakly against the solid stone wall of the corridor. The yellow lamps gleamed. The legionnaires were helpless. Here was something which their sharp swords could not pierce. Their once human personalities, engraved on their micro-miniaturized brains, could not make sense out of the all-too-human situation of an old, old man dreaming wild dreams in a remote tunnel. Stow Odin leaned against the wall, breathing heavily, and said to them with a sibilant rasp, These are no whispers which can be missed. Can't you hear the five-beat of the Congo helium making its crazy music again? Listen to the words of this one. It's another pentapol. Silly, bony words given flesh and blood and entrails by the music which carries them here. Listen! Try, vi! Cry, die! Bye! This one you did not hear either? May I use my radio to ask the surface of Earth for advice? said one of the robots. Advice! Advice! What advice do we need? This is the Gebye! and one more hour of running and you will be in the heart of the berserk. He climbed back into the sedan chair and commanded, Run, men, run! It can't be more than three or four kilometers somewhere in this warren of stone. I will guide you. If I stop guiding you, you may take my body back to the surface, so that I can be given a wonderful funeral and be shot with a rocket coffin into space with an orbit of no return. You have nothing to worry about. You are machines, nothing more. Are you not? Are you not? His voice shrilled at the end. Said Flavius, nothing more. Said Livius, nothing more. And yet? And yet what? Demanded the Lord Stow Odin. And yet, said Livius, I know I am a machine, and I know that I have known feelings only when I was once a living man. I sometimes wonder if you people might go too far. Too far with us robots. Too far, perhaps, with the underpeople, too. Things were once simple when everything that talked was a human being, and everything which did not talk was not. You may be coming to an ending of the ways. If you had said that on the surface, said the Lord Stow Odin grimly, your head might have been burned off by its automatic magnesium flare. You know that there you are monitored against having illegal thoughts. Too well do I know it, said Livius, and I know that I must have died once as a man, if I exist here in robot form. Dying didn't seem to hurt me then, and it probably won't hurt next time. But nothing really matters much when we get down this far into the earth. When we get this far down, everything changes. I never really understood that the inside of the world was this big and this sick. It's not how far down we are, said the Lord crossly. It's where we are. This is the Gebye, where all laws have been lifted, and down below and over yonder is the Berserk, where laws have never been. Carry me rapidly now. I want to look on this strange musician with the face of Akhenaten, and I want to talk to the girl who worships him, Santuna. Run carefully now, up a little, to the left a little. If I sleep, do not worry. Keep going. I will waken myself when we come anywhere near the music of the Congo Helium. If I can hear it now, so far away, think of what it will be like when you yourselves approach it. He leaned back in his seat. They picked up the shafts of the sedan chair and ran in the direction which they had been told. 6. They had run for more than an hour with occasional delays when they had tricky footwork over leaking pipes or damaged walkways, when the light became so bright that they had to reach in their pouches and put on sunglasses, which looked very odd indeed underneath the Roman helmets of two fully armed legionaries. It was even more odd, of course, that the eyes were not eyes at all. Robot eyes were like white marbles, swimming in little bowls of glittering ink, producing a grimly milky stare. They looked at their master, and he had not yet stirred. So they took a corner of his robe and twisted it firmly into a bandage to protect his eyes against the bright light. 
The new light made the yellow bulbs of the corridor fade out of notice. The light was like a whole aurora borealis compressed and projected through the basement corridor of a hotel left over from long ago. Neither of the robots knew the nature of the light, but it pulsed in beats of five. The music and the lights became obtrusive, even to the two robots, as they walked or trotted downward toward the center of the world. The air-forcing system must have been very strong, because the inner heat of the earth had not reached them, even at this great depth. Flavius had no idea of how many kilometers below the surface they had come. He knew that it was not much in planetary distance, but it was very far indeed for an ordinary walk. The Lord Stow Odin sat up in the litter quite suddenly. When the two robots slowed, he said crossly at them, Keep going! Keep going! I am going to set myself up. I'm strong enough to do it. He took out the mannequin me and studied it in the light of the minor aurora borealis, which repeated itself in the corridor. The mannequin ran through its changes of diagnoses and colors. The Lord was satisfied. With firm old fingers, he put the knife tip to the back of his neck and set his output to vital energies at an even higher level. The robots did what they had been told. The lights had been bewildering. Sometimes they made walking itself difficult. It was hard to believe that dozens or hundreds, perhaps thousands, of human beings had found their way through these uncharted corridors in order to discover the inmost precincts of the berserk where all things were allowed. Yet the robots had to believe it. They themselves had been here before, and they scarcely remembered how they had found their way the other time. And the music! It beat at them harder than ever before. It came in beats of five, ringing out the tones of the pentapol, the five-word verse which the mad cat minstrel Kapal had developed while playing his calute some centuries before. The form itself confirmed and reinforced the poignancy of cats combined with the heartbreaking intelligence of the human being. No wonder people had found their way down here. In all the history of man, there was no act which could not be produced by any one of the three bitterest forces in the human spirit. Religious faith, vengeful vainglory, or sheer vice. Here, for the sake of vice, men had found the undiscoverable deep and had put it to wild, filthy uses. The music called them on. This was very special music. It came at Stowe Odin and his legionaries in two utterly different ways by now, reverberating at them through solid rock and echoing, re-echoing through the maze of corridors carried by the dark, heavy air. The corridor lights were still yellow, but the electromagnetic illuminations, which kept time to the music, made the ordinary lighting seem wan. The music controlled all things, paced all time, called all life to itself. It was song of a kind which the two robots had not noticed with such intensity on their previous visit. Even the Lord Stow Odin, for all his travels and experiences, had never heard it before. It was all of this. The beat and the heat and the neat repeat of the notes which poured from the Congo helium, metal never made for music, matter and antimatter, locked in a fine magnetic grid to ward off the outermost perils of space. Now a piece of it was deep in the body of old earth, counting out strange cadences. The churn and the burn and the hot return of music riding the living rock, accompanying itself in an air-carried echo. The surge and the urge of an erotic dirge which moaned, groaned through the heavy stone. Stow Odin woke and stared sharply forward, seeing nothing but experiencing everything. Soon we shall see the gate and the girl, said he. You know this man? You, who have never been here before? Livius had spoken. I know it, said the Lord Stow Odin, because I know it. You wear the feathers of immunity. I wear the feathers of immunity. Does that mean that we, your robots, are free to, down in this berserk? Free as you like, said the Lord Stow Odin, provided that you do my wishes. Otherwise, I shall kill you. If we keep going, said Flavius, may we sing the underpeople song? It might keep some of that terrible music out of our brains. The music has all feelings, and we have none. Nevertheless, it disturbs us. I do not know why. 
My radio contact with the surface has lapsed, said Livius irrelevantly. I need to sing, too. Go ahead, both of you, said the Lord Stow Odin, but keep on going, or you die. The robots lifted their voice in song. I eat my rage. I swallow my grief. There's no relief from pain or age. Our time comes. I work my life. I breathe my breath. I face my death without a wife. Our time comes. We undermen shove, crush, and crash. There'll be a clash and thunder when our time comes. Though the song had the barbarous ancient thrill of bagpipes in it, the melody could not counter or cancel the sane, wild rhythm of the Congo helium beating at them now, from all directions at once. Nice piece of sedition, that, said the Lord Stow Odin dryly, but I like it better as music than I do this noise which is tearing its way through the depths of the world. Keep going, keep going. I must meet this mystery before I die. We find it hard to endure that music coming at us through the rock, said Livius. It seems to us that it is much stronger than it was when we came here some months ago. Could it have changed? asked Flavius. That is the mystery. We let them have the gebier beyond our own jurisdiction. We gave them the berserk to do with as they please. But these ordinary people have created or encountered some extraordinary power. They have brought new things into the earth. It may be necessary for all three of us to die before we settle the matter. We can't die the way you do, said Livius. We're already robots, and the people from whom we were imprinted have been dead a long time. Do you mean you would turn us off? I would, perhaps, or else some other force. Would you mind? Mind? You mean have emotions about it? I don't know, said Flavius. I used to think that I had real, full experience when you used the phrase summa nulla est and brought us up to full capacity, but that music which we have been hearing has the effect of a thousand passwords all said at once. I am beginning to care about my life, and I think that I am becoming what your reference explained by the word afraid. I too feel it, said Livius. This is not a power which we knew to exist on earth before. When I was a strategist, someone told me about the really indescribable dangers connected with the Douglas Uyang planets, and it seems to me now that a danger of that kind is already with us, here inside the tunnel, something which Earth never made, something which man never developed, something which no robot could outcompute, something wild and very strong brought into being by the use of the Congo helium. Look around us. He did not need to say that. The corridor itself had become a living, pulsing rainbow. They turned one last loop in the corridor, and they were there. The very last limit of the realm of distress. The source of evil music. The end of the berserk. They knew it because the music blinded them. The lights deafened them. Their senses ran into one another and became confused. This was the immediate presence of the Congo Helium. There was a door, immensely large, carved with elaborate Gothic ornament. It was much too big for any human man to have had need of it. In the door, a single figure stood, her breasts accented into vivid brights and darks by the brilliant light which poured from one side of the door only, the right. They could see through the door into an immense hall wherein the floor was covered by hundreds of limp bundles of ragged clothing. These were the people unconscious. Above them and between them there danced the high figure of a male, holding a glittering something in his hands. He prowled and leaped and twisted and turned to the pulsation of the music which he himself produced. Summa nulla est, said the Lord Stow Odin. I want you two robots to be keyed to maximum. Are you now to top alert? We are, sir, chorused Livius and Flavius. You have your weapons? We cannot use them, said Livius, since it is contrary to our programming, but you can use them, sir. I'm not sure, said Flavius. I'm not at all sure. We are equipped with surface weapons. This music, these hypnotics, these lights, who knows what they may have done to us and to our weapons, which were never designed to operate this far underground. No fear, said Stowoden. I'll take care of all of it. He took out a small knife.
When the knife gleamed under the dancing lights, the girl in the doorway finally took notice of the Lord Stowe Odin and his strange companions. She spoke to him, and her voice rode through the heavy air with the accents of clarity and death. 7. Who are you, she said, that you should bring weapons to the last uttermost limits of the berserk? This is just a small knife, lady, said the Lord Stowe Odin, and with this I can do no harm to anyone. I am an old man, and I am setting my own vitality button higher. She watched incuriously as he brought the point of the knife to the nape of his own neck and then gave it three full deliberate turns. Then she stared and said, You are strange, my lord. Perhaps you are dangerous to my friends and me. I am dangerous to no one. The robots looked at him, surprised, because of the fullness and the richness of his voice. He had set his vitality very high indeed, giving himself at that rate perhaps no more than an hour or two of life. But he had regained the physical power and the emotional force of his own prime years. They looked at the girl. She had taken Stowe Odin's statement at full face value, almost as though it were an incontrovertible canon of faith. I wear, Stowe Odin went on, these feathers. Do you know what they signify? I can see, she said, that you are a lord of the instrumentality, but I do not know what the feathers mean. Waver of immunity. Anyone who can manage it is allowed to kill me or to hurt me without danger of punishment. He smiled a little grimly. Of course, I have the right to fight back, and I do know how to fight. My name is the Lord Stowe Odin. Why are you here, girl? I love that man in there, if he is a man any more. She stopped and pursed her lips in bewilderment. It was strange to see those girlish lips compressed in a momentary stammer of the soul. She stood there, more nude than a newborn infant, her face covered with provocative, offbeat cosmetics. She lived for a mission of love in the depths of the nothing and nowhere. Yet she remained a girl, a person, a human being capable, as she was now, of an immediate relationship to another human being. He was a man, my lord even when he came back from the surface with that piece of congohelium. Only a few weeks ago, those people were dancing, too. Now they just lie on the ground. They do not even die. I myself held the congohelium, too, and I made music with it. Now the power of the music is eating him up, and he dances without resting. He won't come out to me, and I do not dare go into that place with him. Perhaps I, too, would end up as one more heap on the floor. A crescendo of the intolerable music made speech intolerable for her. She waited for it to pass while the room beyond blazed a pulsing violet at them. When the music of the Congo Helium subsided a little, Stowe Odin spoke. How long has it been that he has danced alone with this strange power coursing through him? One year? Two years? Who can tell? I came down here and lost time when I arrived. You lords don't even let us have clocks and calendars up on the surface. We ourselves saw you dancing just a tenth year ago, said Livius, interrupting. She glanced at them quickly, incuriously. Are you the same two robots who were here a while back? You look very different now. You look like ancient soldiers. I can't imagine why. All right. Maybe it was a week. Maybe it was a year. What were you doing down here? asked Stowe Odin gently. What do you think? she said. Why do all the other people come down here? I was running away from the timeless time, the lifeless life, the hopeless hope that you lords apply to all mankind on the surface. You let the robots and the underpeople work, but you freeze the real people in a happiness which has no hope and no escape. I'm right! cried Stowe Odin. I'm right, though I die for it. I don't understand you, said the girl. Do you mean that you too, a lord, have come down here to escape from the useless hope that wraps up all of us? No, 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 he said, as the shifting lights of the Congo Helium music made improbable traceries across his features. 
I just meant that I told the other lords that something like this was happening to you ordinary people on the surface. Now you are telling me exactly what I told them. Who were you, anyhow? The girl glanced down at her unclothed body, as though she were aware, for the first time, of her nakedness. Stowe Odin could see the blush pour from her face down across her neck and chest. She said very quietly, Don't you know? We never answer that question down here. You have rules, he said. You people have rules, even here in the berserk? She brightened up when she realized that he had not meant the indecent question as an impropriety. Eagerly, she explained, There aren't any rules. They are just understandings. Somebody told me when I left the ordinary world and crossed the line of the Gebier. I suppose they did not tell you because you were a lord, or because they hid from your strange war robots. I met no one coming down. Then they were hiding from you, my lord. Stow Odin looked around at his legionaries to see if they would confirm that statement, but neither Flavius nor Livius said anything at all. He turned back to the girl. I didn't mean to pry. Can you tell me what kind of person you are? I don't need the particulars. When I was alive, I was a once-born, she said. I did not live long enough to be renewed. The robots and a sub-commissioner of the instrumentality took a look at me to see if I could be trained for the instrumentality. More than enough brains, they said, but no character at all. I thought about that a long time. No character at all. I knew I couldn't kill myself, and I didn't want to live so I looked happy every time I thought a monitor might be scanning me, and I found my way to the Gabier. It wasn't death and it wasn't life, but it was an escape from endless fun. I hadn't been down here long. She pointed at the Gabier above them. Before I met him. We loved each other very soon, and he said that the Gabier was not much improvement on the surface. He said he had already been down here in the Berserk, looking for a fun death. A what? said Stowe Odin, as if he could not believe the words. A fun death. Those were his words and his idea. I followed him around, and we loved each other. I waited for him when he went to the surface to get the Congo helium. I thought that his love for me would put the fun death out of his mind. Are you telling me the whole truth? said Stowe Odin. Or is this just your part of the story? She stammered protests, but he did not ask again. The Lord Stowe Odin said nothing, but he looked heavily at her. She winced, bit her lip, and finally said, through all the music and the lights, very clearly indeed, Stop it. You are hurting me. The Lord Stowe Odin stared at her, said innocently, I am doing nothing, and stared on. There was much to stare at. She was a girl the color of honey. Even through these lights and shadows, he could see that she had no clothing at all. Nor did she have a single hair left on her body. No head of hair, no eyebrows, probably no eyelashes, though he could not tell at that distance. She had traced golden eyebrows far up on her forehead, giving her the look of endless mocking inquiry. She had painted her mouth gold so that when she spoke, her words cascaded from a golden source. She had painted her upper eyelids golden, too, but the lower were black as carbon itself. The total effect was alien to all the previous experiences of mankind. It was lascivious grief to the thousandth power, dry wantonness perpetually unfulfilled, femaleness in the service of remote purposes, humanity enraptured by strange planets. He stood and stared. If she were still human at all, this would sooner or later force her to take the initiative. It did. She spoke again. Who are you? You are living too fast, too fiercely. Why don't you go in and dance like all the others? She gestured past the open door, where the ragged, unconscious shapes of all the people lay strewn about the floor. You call that dancing? said the Lord Stow Odin. I do not. There is one man who dances. Those others lie on the floor. Let me ask you the same question. Why don't you dance yourself? 
I want him, not the dance. I am Santuna, and he seized me once in human, mortal, ordinary love. But he becomes Sun Boy, more so every day, and he dances with those people who lie on the floor. You call that dancing? snapped the Lord Stowe Odin. He shook his head and added grimly, I see no dance. You don't see it? You really don't see it? she cried. He shook his head obstinately and grimly. She turned so that she looked into the room beyond her, and she brought her high, clear, penetrating wail, which even cut through the five-beat pulse of the Congo helium. She cried, Sun boy! Sun boy, hear me! There was no break in the quick escape of the feet which pattered in the figure eight, no slowing down the fingers which beat against the shimmering non-focus of the metal which was carried in the dancer's arms. My lover! My beloved! My man! She cried again, her voice even more shrill and demanding than before. There was a break in the cadence of the music and the dance. The dancer sheared toward them with a perceptible slowing down of his cadence. The lights of the inner room, the great door, and the outer hall all became more steady. Stowe Odin could see the girl more clearly. She really didn't have a single hair on her body. He could see the dancer, too. The young man was tall, thin beyond the ordinary suffering of man, and the metal which he carried shimmered like water reflecting a thousand lights. The dancer spoke quickly and angrily. You called me. You have called me thousands of times. Come on in if you wish, but don't call me. As he spoke, the music faded out completely. The bundles on the floor began to stir and to groan and to awaken. Santuna stammered hastily. This time it wasn't me. It was these people. One of them is very strong. He cannot see the dancers. Sun Boy turned to the Lord Stowe Odin. Come in and dance, then, if you wish. You are already here. You might as well. Those machines of yours, he nodded at the robot legionaries, they couldn't dance anyhow. Turn them off. The dancer started to turn away. I shall not dance, but I would like to see it, said Stowe Odin, with enforced mildness. He did not like this young man at all. Not the phosphorescence of his skin, the dangerous metal cradled in his arm, the suicidal recklessness of his prancing walk. Anyhow, there was too much light this far underground, and too few explanations of what was being done. Man, you're a peeper. That's real nasty for an old man like you. Or do you just want to be a man? The Lord Stowe Odin felt his temper flare up. Who are you, man, that you should call man man in such a tone? Aren't you still human yourself? Who knows? Who cares? I have tapped the music of the universe. I have piped all imaginable happiness into this room. I am generous. I share it with these friends of mine. Sunboy gestured at the ragged heaps on the floor, who had begun to squirm in their misery without the music. As Stowe Odin saw into the room more clearly, he could see that the bundles on the floor were young people, mostly young men, though there were a few girls among them. They all of them looked sick and weak and pale. Stowe Odin retorted, I don't like the looks of this. I have half a mind to seize you and to take that medal. The dancer spun on the ball of his right foot as though to leap away in a wild prance. The Lord Stowe Odin stepped into the room after Sunboy. Sunboy turned full circle so that he faced Stowe Odin once again. He pushed the Lord out of the door marching him firmly but irresistibly three steps backward. Flavius, seize the medal! Livius, take the man! spat Stowe Odin. Neither robot moved. Stowe Odin, his senses and his strength set high by the severe twist upward, which he had given his vitality button, stepped forward to seize the Congo helium himself, made one step and no more. He froze in the doorway, immobile. He had not felt like that since the last time the doctors put him in a surgery machine, where they found that part of his skull had developed bone cancer from old, old radiation in space, and from the subsequent effects of sheer age. They had given him a prosthetic half-skull, and for the time of the operation he had been immobilized by straps and drugs. 
This time there were no straps, no drugs, but the forces which Sunboy had invoked were equally strong. The dancer danced in an enormous figure eight among the clothed bodies lying on the floor. He had been singing the song which the robot Flavius had repeated far up above, on the surface of the earth, the song about the weeping man. But Sunboy did not weep. His ascetic, thin face was twisted in a broad grin of mockery. When he sang about sorrow, it was not sorrow which he really expressed, but derision, laughter, contempt for ordinary human sorrow. The Congo helium shimmered, and the aurora borealis almost blinded Sto Odin. There were two other drums in the middle of the room, one with high notes, and the other with even higher ones. The Congo helium resonated. Boom, boom, doom, doom, room. The large, ordinary drum rattled out when Sunboy passed it and reached out his fingers. Ritaplin, Ritaplin, Rataplan, Ritaplin. The small, strange drum emitted only two notes, and it almost croaked them. Kidnork, Kidnork, Kidnork. As Sunboy danced back, the Lord Stowe Odin thought that he could hear the voice of the girl, Santuna, calling to Sunboy but he could not turn his head to see if she were speaking. Sunboy stood in front of Stowoden, his feet still weaving as he danced, his thumbs and his palms torturing hypnotic dissonances from the gleaming Congo helium. Old man, you tried to trick me. You failed. The Lord Stowoden tried to speak, but the muscles of his mouth and throat would not respond. He wondered what force this was, which could stop all unusual effort but still leave his heart free to beat, his lungs to breathe, his brain, both natural and prosthetic, to think. The boy danced on. He danced away a few steps, turned and danced back to Stow Odin. You wear the feather of immunity. I am free to kill you. If I did, the Lady Mona and the Lord Nuru Or and your other friends would never know what happened. If Stow Odin could have moved his eyelids that much, he would have opened his eyes in astonishment at the discovery that a superstitious dancer far underground knew the secret business of the instrumentality. You can't believe what you are looking at, even though you see it plainly, said Sunboy more seriously. You think that a lunatic has found a way to work wonders with a piece of the Congo helium taken far underground, foolish old man. No ordinary lunatic would have carried this metal down here without blowing up the fragment and himself with it. No man could have done what I have done. You are thinking, if the gambler who took the name Sunboy is not a man, what is he? What brings the power and music of the sun so far down underground? Who makes the wretched ones of the world dream in a crazy, happy sleep while their life spills and leaks into a thousand kinds of times, a thousand kinds of worlds. Who does it, if it is not mere me? You don't have to ask. I can tell perfectly well what you are thinking. I'll dance it for you. I am a very kind man, even though you do not like me. The dancer's feet had been moving in the same place while he spoke. Suddenly he whirled away, leaping and vaulting over the wretched human figures on the floor. He passed the big drum and touched it. Ritaplin, Rataplan. Left hand brushed the little drum. Kidnork, Kidnork. Both hands seized the Congo helium, as though the strong wrists were going to tear it apart. The whole room blazed with music, gleamed with thunder as the human senses interpenetrated each other. The Lord Stowe Odin felt the air pass his skin like cool, wet oil. Sunboy the dancer became transparent, and through him, the Lord Stowe Odin could see a landscape which was not Earth, and never would be. Fluminescent, luminescent, incandescent, fluorescent, sang the dancer. Those are the worlds of the Douglas Ouyang planets, seven planets in a close group, all traveling together around a single sun. Worlds of wild magnetism and perpetual dustfall, where the surfaces of the planets are changed by the forever shifting magnetism of their erratic orbits. Strange worlds where stars dance dances wilder than any dance ever conceived by man. Planets which have a consciousness in common, but perhaps not intelligence. Planets 
which called across all space and all time for companionship, until I, me, the gambler, came down to this cavern and found them. Where you had left them, my Lord Stow Odin, when you said to a robot, I do not like the looks of those planets, said you, Stow Odin, speaking to a robot a long time ago. People might get sick or crazy just looking at them, said you, Stow Odin, long, long ago. Hide the knowledge in some out-of-the-way computer, you commanded, Stow Odin, before I was born. But the computer was that one, that one in the corner behind you, which you cannot turn to see. I came down to this room looking for a fun suicide, something really unusual which would bang the noddies when they found I had gotten away. I danced here in the darkness, almost the way I am dancing now, and I had taken about twelve different kinds of drugs so that I was wild and free and very, very receptive. That computer spoke to me, Stow Odin, your computer, not mine. It spoke to me, and you know what it said? You might as well know, Stow Odin, because you are dying. You set your vitality high in order to fight me. I have made you stand still. Could I do that if I were a mere man? Look, I will turn solid again. With a rainbow-like scream of chords and sounds, Sunboy twisted the Congo helium again until both the inner chamber and the outer bloomed with lights of a thousand colors, and the deep underground air became drenched with music which seemed psychotic, because no human mind had ever invented it. The Lord Stowe Odin, imprisoned in his own body with his two legionary robots frozen half a pace behind him, wondered if he really were dying in vain, and tried to guess whether he would be blinded and deafened by this dancer before he died. The Congo helium twisted and shone before him. Sunboy danced backward over the bodies on the floor, danced backward with an odd, cadenced run, which looked as though he were plunging forward in a wild, competitive foot race, when the music and his own footsteps carried him back toward the center of the inner room. The figure jumped in an odd stance, face looking so far downward that Sunboy might have been studying his own steps on the floor, the Congo helium held above and behind his neck, legs lifting high in the cruel high-kneed prance. The Lord Stow Odin thought he could hear the girl calling again, but he could not distinguish words. The drums spoke again. Ritiplin, Ritiplin, Rataplan, and then Kidnork, Kidnork, Kidnork. The dancer spoke as the pandemonium subsided. He spoke and his voice was high, strange, like a bad recording played on the wrong machine. The something is talking to you. You can talk. The Lord Stow Odin found that his throat and lips moved. Quietly, secretly, like an old soldier, he tried his feet and fingers. These did not move. Only his voice could be used. He spoke, and he said the obvious. Who are you, something? Sunboy looked across at Stow Odin. He stood erect and calm. Only his feet moved and they did a wild, agile little jig, which did not affect the rest of his body. Apparently some kind of dance was necessary to keep the connection going between the unexplained reach of the Douglas Uyang planets, the peace of the Congo helium, the more-than-human dancer, and the tortured, blissful figures on the floor. The face, the face itself, was quite composed and almost sad. I have been told, said Sunboy, to show you who I am. He danced around the drums. Rataplan, Rataplan, Kidnork, Nork, Kidnork, Kidnork, Nork. He held the Congo helium high and wrenched it so that a great moan came out. Stow Odin felt sure that a sound as wild and forlorn as that would be sure to reach the surface of the earth many kilometers above, but his prudent judgment assured him that this was a fanciful thought gestated by his personal situation and that any real sound strong enough to reach all the way to the surface would also be strong enough to bring the bruised and shattered rock of the ceiling pouring down upon their heads. The Congo helium ran down the colors of the spectrum until it stopped at a dark, wet liver red, very close to black. 
The Lord Stowe Odin, in that momentary near silence, found that the entire story had been thrust into his mind without being strung out and articulated with words. The true history of this chamber had entered his memory sidewise, as it were. In one moment he knew nothing of it. In the next instant, it was as if he had remembered the whole narrative for most of his life. He also felt himself set free. He stumbled backward three or four steps. To his immense relief, his robots turned around, themselves free, and accompanied him. He let them put their hands in his armpits. His face was suddenly covered with kisses. His plastic cheek felt, thinly and dimly, the imprint, real and living, of female human lips. It was the odd girl, beautiful, bald, naked, and golden-lipped, who had waited and shouted from the door. Despite physical fatigue and the sudden shock of intruded knowledge, the Lord Stowe Odin knew what he had to say. Girl, you shouted for me. Yes, my lord. You have had the strength to watch the Congo helium and not to give in to it? She nodded but said nothing. You have been strong-willed enough not to go into that room? Not strong-willed, my lord. I just love him, my man in there. You have waited, girl, for many months? Not all the time. I go up the corridor when I have to eat or drink or sleep or do my personals. I even have mirrors and combs and tweezers and paint there to make myself beautiful, the way that Sunboy might want me. The Lord Stowe Odin looked over his shoulder. The music was low and keening with some emotions other than grief. The dancer was doing a long, slow dance, full of creeping and reaches, as he passed the Congo helium from one hand to the other. Do you hear me, dancer? called the Lord Stowe Odin, the instrumentality once more coursing through his veins. The dancer did not speak nor seem to change his course, but Kidnork, Kidnork, said the little drum, quite unexpectedly. He and the face behind him, they will let the girl leave if she really forgets him, and this place in the act of leaving, won't you? said Stowe Odin to the dancer. Rittiplin, rattiplan, said the big drum, which had not sounded since Stowe Odin was let free. But I don't want to go, said the girl. I know you don't want to go. You will go to please me. You can come back as soon as I have done my work. She stood mute, so he continued. One of my robots, Livius, the one imprinted by a psychiatrist general, will run with you, but I command him to forget this place and all things connected with it. Summa nulla est. Have you heard me, Livius? You will run with this girl, and you will forget. You will run and forget. You too will run and forget, Santuna, my dear. But two Earth Nixthemerons from now, you will remember just enough to come back here, should you wish to, should you need to. Otherwise, you will go to the Lady Mona and learn from her what you should do for the rest of your life. You are promising, my lord, that in two days and nights I can come back if I even feel like it? Now run, my girl, run! Run to the surface! Livius, carry her if you must, but run, run, run! More than she depends upon it. Santuna looked at him very earnestly. Her nakedness was innocence. The gold upper eyelids met the black lower eyelids as she blinked and then brushed away wet tears. Kiss me, she said and I will run. He leaned down and kissed her. She turned, looked back one last time at her dancer lover, and then ran long-legged into the corridor. Livius ran after her, gracefully, untiringly. In twenty minutes they would be reaching the upper limits of the gebier. You know what I am doing, said Stowe Odin to the dancer. This time the dancer and the force behind him did not deign to answer. Said Stowe Odin, Water. There is water in a jug in my litter. Take me there, Flavius. The robot legionary took the aged and trembling Stowe Odin to the litter. 8. The Lord Stowe Odin then performed the trick which changed human history for many centuries to come, and in so doing exploded an enormous cavern in the vitals of the earth. He used one of the most secret ruses of the instrumentality. He triple thought. Only a few very adept persons could triple think. 
when they were given every possible chance of training. Fortunately for mankind, the Lord Stow Odin had been one of the successful ones. He set three systems of thought into action. At the top level, he behaved rationally as he explored the old room. At a lower level of his mind, he planned a wild surprise for the dancer with the Congo helium. But at the third, lowest level, he decided what he must do in the time of a single blink and trusted his autonomic nervous system to carry out the rest. These are the commands he gave. Flavius should be set on the wild alert and readied for attack. The computer should be reached and told to record the whole episode, everything which Stowe Odin had learned, and should be shown how to take countermeasures, while Stowe Odin gave the matter no further conscious thought. The gestalt of action, the general frame of retaliation, was clear for thousandths of a second in Stowe Odin's mind, and then it dropped from sight. The music rose to a roar. White light covered Stow Odin. You meant me harm, called Sunboy from beyond the Gothic door. I meant you harm, Stow Odin acknowledged, but it was a passing thought. I did nothing. You are watching me. I am watching you, said the dancer grimly. Kidnork, Kidnork, went the little drum. Do not go out of my sight. When you are ready to come through my door, call me or just think of it. I will meet you and help you in. Good enough, said Lord Stow Odin. Flavius still held him. Stow Odin concentrated on the melody which Sunboy was creating, a wild new song never before suspected in the history of the world. He wondered if he could surprise the dancer by throwing his own song back at him. At the same instant, his fingers were performing a third set of actions which Stow Odin's mind no longer had to heed. Stow Odin's hand opened a lid in the robot's chest, right into the laminated controls of the brain. The hand itself changed certain adjustments, commanding that the robot should, within the quarter hour, kill all forms of life within reach, other than the command transmitter. Flavius did not know what had been done to him. Stow Odin did not even notice what his own hand had done. Take me over to the old computer, said Stow Odin, to the robot Flavius. I want to discover how the strange story which I have just learned may be true. Stow Odin kept thinking of music which would even startle the user of the Congo helium. He stood at the computer. His hand, responding to the triple think command which it had been given, turned the computer up and pressed the button. Record this scene. The computer's old relays almost grunted as they came to the alert and complied. Let me see the map, said Stow Odin to the computer. Far behind him, the dancer had changed his pace into a fast jog trot of hot suspicion. The map appeared on the computer. Beautiful, said Stow Odin. The entire labyrinth had become plain. Just above them was one of the ancient, sealed-off anti-seismic shafts, a straight, empty, tubular shaft, 200 meters wide, kilometers high. At the top, it had a lid which kept out the mud and water of the ocean floor. At the bottom, since there was no pressure other than air to worry about, it had been covered with a plastic which looked like rock, so that neither people nor robots which might be passing would try to climb into it. Watch what I am doing! cried Stow Odin to the dancer. I am watching, said Sunboy, and there was almost a growl of perplexity in his sung-forth response. Stow Odin shook the computer and ran the fingers of his right hand over it, and coded a very specific request. His left hand, preconditioned by the triple think, coded the emergency panel at the side of the computer with two simple, clear engineering instructions. Sunboy's laughter rang out behind him. You are asking that a piece of the Congo helium be sent down to you. Stop, stop, before you sign it with your name and your authority as a lord of the instrumentality. Your unsigned request will do no harm. The central computer up top will just think that it is some of the crazy people in the berserk making senseless demands. The voice rose to a note of urgency. Why did the machine signal received and complied with to you just now? The Lord Stow Odin lied blandly. I don't know. Maybe they will send me a piece of the Congo helium to match the one that you have there. You're lying, 
cried the dancer. Come over here to the door. Flavius led the Lord Stow Odin to the ridiculous, beautiful Gothic archway. The dancer was leaping from foot to foot. The Congo helium shone a dull, alert red. The music wept, as though all the anger and suspicion of mankind had been incorporated into a new, unforgettable fugue, like a delirious atonal counterpoint to Johann Sebastian Bach's Third Brandenburg Concerto. I am here, the Lord Stow Odin spoke easily. You are dying, cried the dancer. I was dying before you first noticed me. I set my vitality control to maximum after I entered the berserk. Come on in then, said Sunboy, and you will never die. Stow Odin took the edge of the door and let himself down to the stone floor. Only when he was comfortably seated did he speak. I am dying, that is true, but I would rather not come in. I will just watch you dance as I die. What are you doing? What have you done? cried Sunboy. He stopped dancing and walked over to the door. Search me if you wish, said the Lord Stow Odin. I am searching you, said the dancer. But I see nothing but your desire to get a piece of the Congo helium for yourself and to outdance me. At this point, Flavius went berserk. He ran back to the litter, leaned over, and ran toward the door. In each hand, he carried an enormous solid steel bearing. What's that robot doing? cried the dancer. I can see your mind, but you are not telling him anything. He uses those steel balls to break obstructions. He gasped as the attack came. Quicker than the eye could follow the movement, Flavius's sixty-ton capacity arm whistled through the air as he flung the first steel missile directly at Sunboy. Sunboy, or the power within him, leapt aside with insect speed. The ball plowed through two of the rag-clothed human bodies on the floor. One body said, woof, as it died, but the other body let out no sound at all. The head had been torn off in first impact. Before the dancer could speak, Flavius flung the second ball. This time the doorway caught it. The powers which had immobilized Stowe Odin and his robots were back in operation. The ball sang as it plunged into the doorway, stopped in midair, sang again as the door flung it back at Flavius. The returning ball missed Flavius's head, but crushed his chest utterly. That was where his real brain was. There was a flicker of light as the robot went out, but even in dying, Flavius seized the ball one last time and flung it at Sunboy. The robot terminated operation, and the heavy ball, flung wild, caught the Lord Stow Odin in the right shoulder. The Lord Stow Odin felt pain until he dragged over his mannequin me and turned all pain off. Then he looked at the shoulder. It was almost totally demolished. Blood from his organic body and hydraulic fluid from his prosthetics joined in a slow, heavy stream as the liquids met, merged, and poured down his side. The dancer almost forgot to dance. Stow Odin wondered how far the girl had gone. The air pressure changed. What is happening to the air? Why did you think about the girl? What is happening? Read me, said the Lord Stow Odin. I will dance and get my powers first, said Sunboy. For a few brief minutes it seemed that the dancer with the Congo helium would cause a rock fall. The Lord Stow Odin, dying, closed his eyes and found that it was restful to die. The blaze and noise of the world around him remained interesting but had become unimportant. The Congo helium with a thousand shifting rainbows and the dancer had attained near transparency when Sunboy came back to read Stow Odin's mind. I see nothing, said Sunboy worriedly. Your vitality button is too high and you will die soon. Where is all that air coming from? I seem to hear a faraway roar, but you are not causing it. Your robot went wild. All you do is to look at me contentedly and die. That is very strange. You want to die your way when you could live unimaginable lives in here with us. That is right, said the Lord Stow Odin. I am dying my way. But dance for me. Do dance for me with the Congo helium while I tell you your own story as you told it to me.
It would be a pleasure to get the story straight before I die. The dancer looked irresolute, started to dance, and then turned back to the Lord Stowoden. Are you sure you want to die right away? With the power of what you call the Douglas Ouyang planets, which I receive right here with the help of the Congo Helium, you could be comfortable enough while I danced, and you could still die whenever you wished. Vitality buttons are much weaker than the powers which I command. I could even help to lift you across the threshold of my door. No, said the Lord Stow Odin. Just dance for me while I die. My way. Nine. Thus the world turned. Millions of tons of water were rushing toward them. Within minutes, the Gebier and the Berserk would drown as the air whistled upward. Stow Odin noted contentedly that there was an air shaft at the top of the dancer's room. He did not allow himself to third think of what would happen when the matter and antimatter of the Congo helium were immersed in rushing salt water. Something like forty megatons, he supposed, with the tired feeling of a man who has thought a problem through long, long ago and remembers it briefly only after the situation has long passed. Sunboy was acting out religion before the age of space. He chorused hymns. He lifted his eyes and his hands and his piece of the Congo helium to the sun. He played the rattle of whirling dervishes, the temple bells of the man on the two pieces of wood, and the other temple bells of that saint who had escaped time simply by seeing it and stepping out of it. Buddha, was that his name? and he went on to the severe profanities which afflicted mankind after the old world fell. The music kept measure, and the lights, too. Whole processions of ghostly shadows followed some boy, as he showed how old mankind had found the gods, and the sun, and then other gods. He pantomimed man's most ancient mystery, that man pretended to be afraid of death when it was life that never understood it. And as he danced, the Lord Stow Odin repeated his own story to him. You fled the surface, son boy, because the people were stupid clods, happy and dull in their miserable happiness. You fled because you could not stand being a chicken in a poultry house, antiseptically bred, safely housed, and frozen when dead. You joined the other miserable, bright, restless people, who sought freedom in the Gebier. You learned about their drugs and their liquors and their smokes. You knew their women and their parties and their games. It wasn't enough. You became a gentleman's suicide, a hero seeking a fun death which would stamp you with your individuality. You came on down to the Berserk, the most forgotten and loathsome place of all. You found nothing, just the old machines and the empty corridors. Here and there a few mummies or bones, just the silent lights and the faint murmur of air through the corridors. I hear water now, said the dancer, still dancing. Rushing water? Don't you hear it, my dying lord? If I did hear it, I wouldn't care. Let's get on with your story. You came to this room. The weird door made it look like a good place for a fun death, such as you poor castaways liked to seek except that there was not much sport in dying unless other people know that you did it intentionally and know how you did it. Anyway, it was a long climb back up into the Gabier where your friends were, so you slept by this computer. In the night, while you slept, as you dreamed, the computer sang to you. I need a temporary dog for a temporary job on a temporary place like Earth. When you woke up, you were surprised to find that you had dreamed an entire new kind of music, really wild music which made people shudder with its delicious evil. And with the music, you had a job, to steal a piece of the Congo helium. You were a clever man, son boy, before the trip down here. The Douglas Ouyang planets caught you and made you a thousand times cleverer. You and your friends, this is what you told me or what the presence behind you told me just a half hour ago. You and your friends stole a subspace communicator console, got a fix on the Douglas Ouyang planets, and got drunk at the site. Iridescent, luminescent, 
waterfalls uphill, all that kind of thing. And you did get the Congo helium. The Congo helium is made of matter and antimatter laminated apart by a dual magnetic grid. With that, the presence of the Douglas Ouyang planets made you independent of organic processes. You did not need food or rest or even air or drink anymore. The Douglas Ouyang planets are very old. They kept you as a link. I have no idea what they intended to do with Earth and with mankind. If this story gets out, future generations will call you the Merchant of Menace, because you used the normal human appetitiousness for danger to trap other people with hypnotics and with music. I hear water, interrupted Sunboy. I do hear water. Never mind, said the Lord Stowoden. Your story is more important. Anyhow, what could you and I do about it? I am dying sitting in a pool of blood and effluvium. You can't leave this room with the Congo helium. Let me go on. Or perhaps the Douglas Ouyang entity, whatever it was, is, said Sunboy, whatever it is, may just have been longing for sensuous companionship. Dance on, man, dance on. Sunboy danced, and the drums talked with him. Rataplan, rataplan, kidnork, kidnork, nork while the Congo helium made music scream through the solid rock. The other sound persisted. Sunboy stopped and stared. It is water. It is. Who knows, said the Lord Stow Odin. Look, screamed Sunboy, holding the Congo helium high. Look! The Lord Stow Odin did not need to look. He knew full well that the first few tons of water— Mud-laden and heavy had come frothing down the corridor and into their rooms. But what do I do? screamed the voice of Sunboy. Stow Odin felt that it was not Sunboy speaking, but some relay speaking from the power of the Douglas Ouyang planets, a power which had tried to find friendship with man, but had found the wrong man and the wrong friendship. Sunboy took control of himself. His feet splashed in the water as he danced. The colors shone on the water as it rose. Ritiplin, tiplin, said the big drum. Kidnork, kidnork, said the little drum. Boom, boom, doom, doom, room, said the Congo helium. The Lord Stow Odin felt his old eyes blur, but he could still see the blazing image of the wild dancer. This is a good way to die, thought he, as he died. 10. Far above, on the surface of the planet, Santuna felt the continent itself heave beneath her feet, and saw the eastern horizon grow dark as a volcano of muddy steam shot up from the calm blue sunlit ocean. This must not, must not happen again, she said, thinking of Sunboy and the Congo helium and the death of the Lord Stow Odin. Something must be done about it, she added to herself. And she did it. In later centuries, she brought disease, risk, and misery back to increase the happiness of man. She was one of the principal architects of the rediscovery of man, and at her most famous, she was known as the Lady Alice Moore. Down to a Sunless Sea Hi, oh, hi, oh, they jingle in the sky, oh. Bright, how bright, the lights of those twin moons of Xanadu. Xanadu the lost, Xanadu the lovely, Xanadu the seat of pleasure. Pleasure of the senses, body, mind, soul. Soul? Who said anything about soul? 1. When they were standing, the wind whispered softly. From time to time, Madhu, in an ageless feminine gesture, tugged at her tiny silver skirt, or adjusted her equally nominal open sleeveless jacket. Not that she was cold. Her abbreviated costume was appropriate to Xanadu's equable climate. She thought, I wonder what he will be like, this lord of the instrumentality. Will he be old or young, fair or dark, wise or foolish? She did not think handsome or ugly. Xanadu was noted for the physical perfection of its inhabitants— and Madhu was too young to expect anything less. Leirai, waiting beside her, was not thinking of the Space Lord. 
His mind was seeing again the videotapes of the dancing, the intricate steps and beautiful frenzy of movement of the group from ancient days of Manholm, the group labeled Bolshoi. Someday, he thought, oh, perhaps someday I too can dance like that. Kuat thought, who do they think they're fooling? In all the years I've been governor of Xanadu, this is the first time a lord has been here. War hero of the Battle of Styron Four, indeed. Why, that's been over substantive months ago. He's had plenty of time to recover if it's really true he was wounded. No, there's something more. They know or suspect something. Well, we'll keep him busy. Shouldn't be hard to do here with all the pleasures Xanadu has to offer. And there's Madu. No, he can't complain or he'll blow his cover. And all the while, as the ornithopter neared, their destiny was approaching. He did not know that he was to be their destiny. He did not intend to be their destiny. And their destiny had not been predetermined. The passenger in the descending ornithopter reached out with his mind to try to perceive the place, to sense it. It was hard, terribly hard. There seemed to be a thick cloud-like cover, a mist between his mind and the minds he tried to feel. Was it himself, his mind damaged from the war? Or was it something more, the atmosphere of the planet, something to deter or prevent telepathy? Lord Bin Permaiswari shook his head. He was so full of self-doubt, so confused. Ever since the battle, the mind-scarring probes of the fear machines, how much permanent damage had they done? Perhaps here on Xanadu he could rest and forget. As he stepped from the ornithopter, Lord Bin Permaiswari felt an even greater sense of bewilderment. He had known that Xanadu had no sun, but he was unprepared for the soft, shadowless light which greeted him. The twin moons hung seemingly side by side, while their light was reflected by millions of mirrors. In the near distance, lee after lee of white sand beaches stretched, while farther on stood chalk cliffs with the jet-black sea foaming on their bases. Black, white, silver, the colors of Xanadu. Kuat approached him without delay. Kuat's sense of apprehension had diminished appreciably at the first glimpse of the Space Lord. The visitor did indeed look ill and confused. Correspondingly, Kuat's amiability increased without conscious effort on his part. Xanadu extends you welcome, O Lord Bin Permaiswari. Xanadu and all that Xanadu contains is yours. The traditional greeting sounded strange in his rough tones. The Space Lord saw before him a huge man, tall and correspondingly heavy, muscles gleaming, his longish, reddish hair and beard showing magenta in the light of the moons and mirrors. It gives me pleasure, Governor Kuat, merely to be in Xanadu, and I return the planet and its contents to you, replied Lord Kamal bin Permaiswari. Kuat turned and gestured toward his two companions. This is Madu, a distant relative, and so my ward. And this is Leirai, my brother, son of my father's fourth wife, she who drowned herself in the sunless sea. The space lord winced at Kuat's laugh but the young people appeared not to notice it. Gentle Madu hid her disappointment and greeted the Lord with becoming modesty. She had expected, hoped for, a shining figure, a blazing armor, or perhaps simply an aura which proclaimed, I am a hero. Instead, she saw an intellectual-looking man, tired, looking somehow older than his substantive thirty years. She wondered what he had done. How this man could be the talk of the instrumentality as the savior of human culture in the Battle of Styron IV. Leirai, because he was a male, knew more of the facts of the battle than Madu, and he greeted Lord Bin Permaiswari with grave respect. In his dream world, second only to dancers and runners of easy grace, Leirai looked up to intelligence. This was the man who had dared to pit himself, his living mind, his intellect, against the dread fear machines, and won. The price was evident in his face, but he had won. Leirai placed his hands together and held them to his forehead in a gesture of homage. The Lord reached out in a gesture which won Leirai's heart forever. 
He touched Leirai's hand and said, My friends call me Kamal. Then he turned to include Madu, and almost as an afterthought, Kuat. Kuat did not notice the near omission. He had turned and was walking toward what appeared to be a huge lump of yellow and black striped fur. He made a peculiar hissing sound, and at once the lump separated into four enormous cats. Each cat was saddled, and each saddle was equipped with a holding ring, but there was no apparent means of guiding the cats. Kuat answered Kamal's question. No, of course there's no way to guide them. They're pure cats, you know, unmodified except for size. No under people here. I think we're the only planet in the instrumentality that doesn't have under people. Except for Norstrelia, of course. But the reasons for Norstrelia and Xanadu are at the opposite ends of the spectrum. We enjoy our senses. None of that nonsense about hard work building character like the Norstrelians believe. We don't believe in austerity and all that malarkey. We just get more sensual pleasure out of our unmodified animals. We have robots to do the dirty work. Kamal nodded. After all, wasn't that what he was here for? To allow his senses to repair his damaged mind? Nonetheless, the man who had faced the fear machines with scarcely a tremble did not know how to approach the cat which was designated as his. Madu saw his hesitation. Griselda is perfectly friendly, she said. Just wait a minute till I scratch her ears. She'll lie down, and you can mount. Kamal glanced up and caught an expression of disgust in Kuat's eyes. It did not help in his search for self-mending. Madu, oblivious to Kuat's displeasure, had coaxed the great cat to kneeling position and smiled up at Kamal. Kamal felt something like pain stab him at her glance. She was so beautiful and so innocent. Her vulnerability wrenched at his heart. He remembered the Lady Rue's quotation of an ancient sage. Innocence within is armor without, but a web of fear settled on his mind. He brushed it aside and mounted the cat. As he lay dying nearly three centuries later, he remembered that ride. It was as thrilling as his first space jump, the leap into nothingness, and then the sudden realization that he was traveling, traveling, traveling without volition, with no personal control over the direction his body might take. Before fear had the opportunity to assert itself, it was converted into a visceral, almost orgasmic excitement, a gush of pleasure almost too strong to bear. Lank, dark hair, flying in his face, the Lord Bin Permaiswari would have been unrecognizable to the lords and ladies who gathered at the bell on Old Earth in time of crisis. They would not have recognized the boyish glee in a face which they were accustomed to seeing as grave and preoccupied. He laughed in the wind and tightened his knees against Griselda's flanks, holding the saddle ring with one hand as he turned back to wave at the others who were somewhat behind. Griselda seemed to sense his pleasure at her long, effortless bounds. Suddenly, the ride took on a new proportion. Overhead, the ornithopter which had brought the space lord to Xanadu passed by on its way back to the spaceport. At once, Griselda left the pride and leapt futilely after the ascending ornithopter. As she attempted to bat at it, Kamal was forced to use both hands on the holding ring in order not to fall off ignominiously. She continued to leap and bat hopelessly in its direction until it disappeared from sight. Then she sat down to lick herself and, inadvertently, her passenger. Lord Kamal found her sandpaper tongue not unpleasant, but he winced as her fang brushed his leg. At some distance, Kuat sat laughing. Madu's face, even in the distance, showed concern, however, which cleared as the Lord waved to her. Leirai, Confident in the powers of the hero of Styron IV, was gazing dreamily at the distant city. Slowly now, Griselda joined the rest of the pride. Her attitude, apparently one of some embarrassment at having performed such a kittenish prank, when she had been entrusted with the welfare of the distinguished visitor. In the distance, the domes and towers of the city gleamed nacreous in the soft, shadowless light of the moons and mirrors. 
Lord Kemal had his sense of unreality reinforced. The city looked so beautiful and so unreal that he had the feeling it might vanish as they approached. He was to learn that the city and all it stood for were all too real. As they neared the city walls, Kamal could see that the stark whiteness of the city from afar was an illusion. The shimmering white walls of the buildings were set with gemstones in intricate patterns, flowers, leaves, and geometric designs, all heightening the beauty of the incredible architecture. In all the worlds he had visited, Lord Kamal had seen nothing to equal this city. Philip's palace on the gem planet was a hovel compared to these buildings. Formal gardens with fountains and artificial pools separated the buildings. Shrubbery, in an artful plan which gave the appearance of being natural, was planted here and there. Suddenly, the space lord realized another strange aspect of the planet. He had seen no trees. Dogs yipped at them from safe distances as they entered the city, but this time Griselda refused to be tempted. Now that she was in the city, she had assumed a certain dignity. It was as if she wanted to forget her previous dereliction. She headed straight for the palace steps. Lord Kamal could feel the muscles of Griselda's haunches tighten as she prepared to hurdle up the steps and through the open door. It would be a tight squeeze for the two of them. Fortunately, Kuat reached the steps first and hissed his command to her. Kamal could feel her reluctance. She would much have preferred bounding up the steps, but she obeyed. She lay belly down, back feet crouched, front feet stretched forward. The Lord Kamal dismounted easily, but with reluctance. A regret almost as great as Griselda's that the ride was over. He reached over to scratch the cat's ears. Madu smiled approvingly. That's right. When you make friends with your cat, she'll obey you much more readily. Kuat grunted. I have my own way for making them obey if they get too many ideas of their own. For the first time, the space lord noticed a small barbed whip tucked into Kuat's belt, to which Kuat pointed now. Kuat, you wouldn't, Madu protested. You never have. You haven't seen me, he said. Then, as her face clouded, he added as if reassuringly, Up to now, I haven't needed to. But don't think I wouldn't. Kamal noticed that Kuat's reassurance was not quite adequate. A gauze of doubt or wonder seemed to obscure the open brightness of Madu's face. Once more, the Lord Kamal felt a stab of fear for her, and once more dismissed it. It was her innocence he feared for. He found that her eyes reminded him of Direna from the ancient days of his true youth, before he had been made wise in the ways of mankind, before he had been made to know that under persons and true men could not mix as equals. Direna with the fawn-like grace, the soft, gentle mouth, the innocent eyes of the doe she was derived from. What had happened to her after he left? Did her eyes still hold that candid ingenuousness which he saw mirrored in Madu's eyes? Or had she mated with some gross stag, and had some of his grossness transferred itself to her? He hoped, remembering her fondly, that she had mated with a fine buck who had given her does as gentle and as graceful as she was in his memory. He shook his head. The fear machines had stirred up all kinds of strange memories and feelings. Absently, he petted the cat. Servants came forward to unsaddle the cats. With a renewed start, the space lord realized that these were true men, not underpersons, doing work. And he remembered Kuat's statement about enjoying the sensuality of animals. There was something else, something he had almost thought of, but he could not quite think. It was as if he tried to catch the tail of an elusive animal as it disappeared around the corner. Led by Kuat and trailed by Madu and Leirai, the Lord Kamal threaded his way through a maze of rooms and corridors. Each seemed more amazing than the last. The only time the Space Lord had seen anything similar had been on videotapes, a reconstruction of old man home as it had been before Radiation 3. The walls were hung with tapestries and paintings based on reproductions of those from Earth, couches, statues, Rugs of color and warmth brought here by Xanadu's founder, the original Khan. Yes, 
Xanadu was a return to pleasure of the senses, to luxury and beauty, to the unnecessary. Kamal felt himself beginning to relax in this atmosphere of enchantment, but the spell was broken when, upon reaching the main salon, Kuat unceremoniously flung himself into the nearest couch. As he stretched full length, he vaguely waved a hand to the rest of the party. Sit down, sit down, he said. Candles flickered and glowed. Low tables and couches stood about invitingly. For the first time since the introduction on the Space Lord's arrival, Leirai spoke spontaneously. We welcome you to our home, he said, and hope that we can do all possible to make your visit enjoyable. Kamal realized that he had paid little attention to the youth because he had been so absorbed in new impressions and, he had to admit it to himself, the girl Madhu had fascinated him. Leirai, in his own way, was as physically perfect as Madhu, tall, slender, lightly muscled, a golden boy. And, like Madhu, he had a curious air of openness, of vulnerability. It seemed strange to the Lord Kamal that these two should grow up so innocent under the guardianship of a man as coarse and boorish as Kuat seemed. Kuat interrupted his reverie. Come, the Judai. Madhu immediately moved toward a table on which rested a copper-colored tray with silvery highlights. On the tray sat a dual-spouted pitcher of the same material and eight small matching goblets. A lid covered the top of the pitcher. As Madhu picked up the pitcher, Kuat gave one of the grunts which the Space Lord was finding increasingly distasteful. Just be sure you put your thumb over the right hole. Her answering tone was indulgent, but as nearly scornful as Kamal could imagine her being. I've been doing this since childhood. Is it likely I'd forget now? In after years, it seemed to Kamal bin Permaiswari that this night was one of the important turns that his life took in its convoluted passage through time. He seemed removed from events as they occurred. He seemed a spectator watching the actions not only of the others but of himself, as if he had no control over them, as if in a dream. Madhu knelt gracefully and placed a thumb over one of the two holes at the top of the pitcher. Candlelight played over the light silvery dusting of powder which covered the entire area of her bare skin. As she poured the reddish liquid into four of the little goblets, Kamal noticed that even the nails of her small hands were painted silver. Kuat raised his goblet. The first toast by the rules of politeness should have been to the guest of honor, or, at the very least, to the instrumentality, but Kuat went by his own rules. To pleasure, he said, and drank the contents with one gulp. While the rest of the party slowly sipped their drinks, Kuat roused himself to pour another cupful. He had swallowed the second cupful before the others had finished their first the Lord Kamal savored the taste of the Judai. Unlike anything he had ever tasted before, neither sweet nor sour, it was more like the juice of pomegranate than any other flavor he had tasted, and yet it was unique. As he sipped, he felt a pleasant tingling sensation pervade his body. By the time he had finished the cup, he had decided that Judai was the most delicious thing he had ever tasted. Instead of muddling his wits like alcohol, or conferring nothing but sensual pleasure like the electrode, Judai seemed to heighten all his senses, his awareness. All colors were brighter. Background music, of which he had been only dimly aware, was suddenly piercingly lovely. The texture of the brocaded couch was a thing of joy. Perfumes of flowers he had never known overwhelmed him. His scarred mind rejected Styron for and all its implications. He felt a glow of comradeship, momentarily even toward Kuat, and suddenly felt he had come against a daimony wall. Then he knew. His inability to sense or to read the other minds on this planet did not lie within himself or any defect incurred through the fear machines, but was directly connected to Kuat, to some non-authorized barrier which Kuat had erected. The barrier was imperfect, however. Kuat had not been able merely to keep his own thoughts from being read. He had had to set up a universal barrier. 
This was obvious from the fact that Kuat showed no indication that he could sense the Space Lord. And what, thought Kamal, do you have to hide? What is so much against the laws of the instrumentality that you have had to set up a universal mind barrier? Kuat, relaxed, smiled pleasantly. For the first time since Styron IV, the Lord Kamal bin Permaiswari felt that he might in truth recover completely. It was the first time he had felt really interested in anything. Madhu brought him back to his present situation. You like our Judai? It was hardly a question. Kamal nodded, blissful and still absorbed in the puzzle he had encountered. You may have one more, she said, but that is all that is good for you. After that, one begins to lose one's senses, and that, after all, is not pleasurable, is it? She poured the second cup for Kamal, for Leirai and herself. Kuat reached for the pitcher, and she slapped playfully at his hand. One more and you might pour yourself pisang by accident. He laughed. I am bigger than most men and can drink more than they. At least let me pour it then, she said, and proceeded to do so. She turned again to the space lord with a playful gaiety which did not ring quite true. He is one whom we must all indulge, but really, it is dangerous to have too much. You see how this pitcher is made? She took off the lid to demonstrate the division of the pitcher. In one half is judai, in the other there is pisang, which is identical in taste to judai, but it is deadly. One cup kills anyone drinking it within Ifunjung. Involuntarily, Kamal shuddered. The unit of time she mentioned was so small as to be almost instantaneous. No antidote? None. Leirai, who had been sitting quietly, now spoke. It is the same thing, really. Judai is the distilled pisang. They come from a fruit which grows here, only on Xanadu. Galaxy knows how many people must have died eating the fruit or drinking the fermented but undistilled pisang before the secret of Judai was discovered. Worth every one of them, Kuat laughed. Any remaining warmth engendered by the Judai which the Space Lord might have felt toward the governor of Xanadu was dissipated. His curiosity regarding the duality of the pitcher, however, was aroused. But if you know that Pisang is poison, why do you keep it in the same container with Judai? For that matter, why do you keep it in its undistilled state at all? Madu nodded agreement. I have often asked the same question, and the answers I get make no sense. It's the excitement of danger, Leirai said. Don't you enjoy the Judai more knowing there's the element of chance you'll get Pisang? That's what I said, Madu repeated. The answers make no sense. At this point, Kuat broke in. His speech was slightly slurred, but he spoke intelligently enough. In the first place, there is tradition. In the old days, under the first Khan and before Xanadu came under the jurisdiction of the lords of the instrumentality, there was a great deal of lawlessness on Xanadu. There were power struggles for leadership. People came here from other planets to plunder our richness. There had to be some simple way of eliminating them before they knew they were being eliminated. The double picture is copied, so they say, from a Chinesean one brought by the first Khan. I don't know about that, but it has become traditional here. You won't find a Judai holder on Xanadu without its corresponding Pisang holder. He nodded wisely, as if he had explained everything. But the Space Lord was not satisfied. All right, he said. You make the pitchers in the traditional way, but why, by Venus's clouds, must you continue to put Pisang in them? Kuat's answer, when it came, was in even more slurred tones than his previous speech— the effects of too much Judai began to make him sound intoxicated, and the Space Lord made mental note to heed Madu's injunctions not to exceed two cupfuls of the drink. Kuat gave a rather leering smile and wagged a finger admonishingly at Lord Kamal. Strangers mustn't ask too many questions. Might still be enemies around, and we're all prepared. Anyway, that's the way we execute criminals on Xanadu. His laugh was uninhibited. They don't know what they're getting. It's like a lottery. Sometimes I tease them a little. Give them Judai first and they start to think they're going to be freed. 
Then I give them another cup, and they don't suspect a thing. Drink it happily because nothing happened with the first cup. Then, when the paralysis hits them, ha! You should see their faces. For an instant, the latent dislike which the Space Lord had conceived for Kuat sprang full-grown. But the man's intoxicated, in effect, he thought. And then, but is this the real man speaking? No, no, Kuat, you don't mean that. Realization seemed to return to Kuat. He gave his brother's knee a reassuring pat. No, no, of course don't. Think I'll go to bed. You'll take care of guests, won't you? He staggered slightly as he stood up, but managed to walk fairly steadily from the room. Suddenly, the barrier was down slightly. He could not read Kuat's mind, but the Space Lord could sense, somewhere on the planet, something evil, strange, unlawful. A coldness seemed to replace the warmth of the Judai in his veins. Across the white dunes, the wind was beginning to rise. Far from the city, protected by the ancient crater lake of the sunless sea, the laboratory had a deceptive exterior placidity. Within, the illegal dire dead, not yet quite sentient, stirred in their ambiotic fluid. Outside, trees bearing their deadly fruit seemed to quiver, as if in dread anticipation. Madu sighed. I knew he shouldn't have had that last one, but he would do it. She turned toward Leirai, oblivious of the Space Lord, and said reassuringly, Of course he didn't mean what he said about teasing the prisoners. He's been so good to us all these years. Nobody could be so kind to us and cruel in other ways, could he? Once more the Space Lord glanced in Leirai's direction. The handsome young face, vital but young, so young, held a look of uneasiness. No, I suppose not. And still I've heard tales. He broke off, remembering the presence of the Space Lord. Of course it's all nonsense, he concluded. But Lord Kamal had the feeling that he was trying as much to reassure himself as to erase the bad impression his brother had made. We will eat now, Madu said brightly, and stood up to go into the dining salon. Again the Space Lord felt as if the subject were being changed. 2. In after years the Space Lord remembered. Thoughts raced through his mind. Oh, Xanadu, there is nothing with which to liken you in all the galaxies. The shadowless days and nights, the treeless plains, the sudden rainless blasts of thunder and lightning which somehow add to your charm. Griselda. The only pure animal I ever knew. The great rumbling purr, the soft pink nose with the black spot on one side, the eyes which seemed to look beyond the features of my face into my very being. Oh, Griselda, I hope that somewhere you still bound and leap. But now, the first few days of the Lord Kamal bin Permiswari on Xanadu passed quickly as he was introduced to the infinite pleasures of Xanadu. On the day following Kamal's arrival, a foot race had been scheduled in which Leirai was to run. The element of competition which had been brought back to Xanadu was part of a deliberate return to the simpler joys which mankind, in its mechanization, had forgotten. Crowds at the stadium were gay and bright. Most of the young girls wore their hair loose and flowing. The women, old and young alike, wore the typical costume of Xanadu tiny short skirt, and open sleeveless jacket. On most worlds, the older women would have looked grotesque, or at least ludicrous in this costume, and the younger women would have seemed lewd. But on Xanadu there was a basic innocence and acceptance of the body, and almost without exception the women of Xanadu, irrespective of age, seemed to have retained their lovely lithe figures, and there was no false modesty to call attention to their semi-nudity. Most of the young people, male and female alike, wore the shimmering body powder which the Space Lord had first noted on Madu. Some matched the powder to their clothes, others to their hair or eyes. A few wore a colorless, luminescent dusting. Of them all, the Space Lord thought Madu the loveliest. She radiated excitement, a portion of which communicated itself to Lord Kamal. Kuat seemed unemotional. 
How can you sit there so calmly? she asked. The boy will win, you know. Anyway, horse racing is more exciting. For you, maybe, not for me. Lord Kamal was interested. I have never seen this racing, he said. What is it? The horses all run together to see which is the fastest? Madhu nodded agreement. They all start at a given signal and run a predetermined path. The one who reaches the goal first is the winner. He, she nodded her head playfully in Kuat's direction, likes to bet, that is to wager, that his horse will win. That is why he likes horse races better than human races. And you have no wager on the human races? Oh, no, it would be degrading to human beings to wager on their abilities or accomplishments. There were three races that day, each one narrowing the field of contestants. It became evident that there was no real competition. Leirai so far outdistanced the others that it was almost embarrassing. If he had not been so obviously a superb runner, it would have been easy to assume that the others had held back in order to allow the brother of the governor of Xanadu to win. Kuat went off to the center of the stadium to participate in a copy of an ancient ritual from Old Man Home, in which a crown of golden leaves was set on Leirai's hair. In his absence, Lord Kamal heard various whisperings behind him, in which he caught the words, Dance with the Aroi. Old Governor will not be pleased. Too bad his mother. Madhu seemed not to be listening. After the celebrations, when the governor and his party had returned to the palace, Lord Kamal remembered the curious phrases. In particular, he was puzzled by the present or future tense of Old Governor will be, not would have been, pleased. It stuck in his mind and fretted there, like a splinter in a sore finger. His mind was only just recovering from the wounds of the fear machines, and he decided he could not risk a further infection. While Kuat was having his second goblet of Judai, Lord Kamal said, most casually, How long have you been governor of Xanadu, Kuat? The latter glanced up, sensing something beneath the casualness of the immediate question. Leirai interrupted, I was a small baby. Kuat's gesture silenced him. For many years, he said. Does it matter how many? No, I was curious, said the space lord, deciding on modified candor. I thought that the governorship of Xanadu was hereditary, but I heard something today which made me believe that the governor your father was still alive. Again, Leirai, before Kuat could silence him, rushed to answer. But he is. He's with the Aroi. That's why my mother— Kuat's frown silenced him. These are not matters for the instrumentality. These are matters of Xanadu's local customs, protected by Article Number 376984, Sub-Article A, Paragraph 34C, of the instrument under which Xanadu agreed to come under the protection of the instrumentality. I can assure the Lord that only domestic matters of purely autoxinous origin are concerned. Lord Kamal nodded in ostensible agreement. He felt that he had somehow uncovered another small portion of the mystery which intrigued him, interested him as nothing else had done since Styron IV. 3. On the fourth day of his stay on Xanadu, Lord Kamal went out with Madhu and Leirai for his first experience beyond the walls of the city since his arrival. By this time, the Space Lord had become quite fond of the cat, Griselda. It pleased him inordinately when she gave a great purr of pleasure and laid down for him to mount without awaiting a command. He saw animals in a new light. With poignancy, he knew that underpersons, modified animals in the shape of human beings, were truly neither one thing nor the other. Oh, there were underpersons of great intelligence and power, but he let the thought trail off. They raced across the plains with a singular joy. Windswept, treeless, the small planet had a wild beauty of its own. The black sea lashed at the foot of the chalk cliffs. Kamal, watching the lee of sand, felt the strangeness of the place once more. In the distance, he saw a great bird rise, falter, then fall. Later, much later, the song the computer wrote when he fed it the facts of time and place became known throughout the galaxies. On a dark mountain, alone in the cloud, 
The eagle paused, and the wind shrieked aloud. The thunder rolled, and the mist of the cloud formed the eagle's shroud, as it fell to the ground, wings battered and torn. And the surf at the foot of the cliff was white that night, and bright the wings of the falling bird. I heard the cry. Perhaps it was testimony to the depth of his feeling that the Lord Kamal fed these facts to the computer in such a way that some of his agony was expressed. Madhu and Lehrai watched also as the bird fell, their bright joy overcast by something they could not quite comprehend. But why? Madhu whispered. It flew along as freely as we were riding. We bounded as it soared, all free and happy. And now? And now we must forget it said the Space Lord, of a wisdom born of endless endurance and a wariness he wished he did not feel. But he himself could not forget it, hence the computer. On a dark mountain. More slowly now, chilled by the death of beauty, of life, they proceeded, each involved in thought. What waste, the Space Lord thought. What waste of beauty. The bird had soared free as a dream. Why? A strange current of air, or something more deadly? What did my mother feel, thought Leirai? What were her feelings and thoughts when she walked into the warm, deep, dark sea and knew she would never return? Madhu felt confused and lonely. It was the first time that she personally had ever confronted death in any form. Her parents were unreal to her. She had never known them. But this bird, she had seen it alive and free flying, concerned with nothing more important than its graceful glides and soaring, and now suddenly it was dead. She could not reconcile the two thoughts in her mind. It was Lord Kamal who, because of his age and experience, recovered first. You haven't told me, he said, where we are going. Madhu's smile was a feeble echo of her usual glow, but she made the effort— we're going to ride around the edge of the crater up there by the peak. It's a beautiful view, and when you stand there, you can almost get the idea that you can see the whole planet. Leirai nodded, determined to participate in the conversation, despite the dark thoughts which had clouded his mind. It's true, he said. You can even see the grove of Bua trees from there. It's from the fruit of the Bua trees that we get Pisang and Judai. I was curious about that the Space Lord said. I haven't seen a tree since I landed on the planet. No, said Madhu and Leirai simultaneously. It created a small diversion, and they both laughed spontaneously, acting more naturally than they had since the death of the bird. Unconsciously, they communicated their more cheerful attitude to the cats, which now began to bound forward once more at increased speed. The Space Lord's happiness at the upswing in spirits of his young companions was tempered with chagrin that the conversation, which had started to be interesting, could not continue while their steeds were proceeding at this breakneck speed. As they continued uphill, however, the cats gradually began to slow. The change was imperceptible at first, but as the long climb continued, Lord Kamal could feel Griselda's increasing effort. He had begun to think that nothing could tire her, but the climb to the edge of the crater was considerably longer than it looked from below. That the other cats were also feeling the strain was evident from their decreased pace. The Space Lord reopened the conversation. You were going to tell me about the trees, he said. It was Leirai who answered first. You are quite right about not having seen any trees, he said. The only trees which grow on Xanadu, except the Bua trees, are the Kelapa trees, and they grow down in the craters of the smaller volcanoes. You can see some of them, too, when we get to the crater rim, but the Bua trees always grow in groves. There must be both male and female to bear fruit, and the fruit can only be approached at certain times. Otherwise, even to inhale the scent is deadly. Madhu gravely concurred. We must always keep at a distance from the Bua Grove until Kuat has consulted with the Aroi, and when he tells us the time is right, then everyone on Xanadu participates in the harvest, the Aroi dance, and it is the best time of all. Leirai shook his head disapprovingly. Madhu? 
There are things we don't talk about to outsiders. Her face suffused, eyes suddenly welling, she stammered. But a lord of the instrumentality... Both men realized her unhappiness, and each in his own way hastened to remedy it. The space lord said, I'm good at not remembering things I shouldn't. Lerai smiled at her and put his right hand hard on her shoulder. It's all right. He understands, and you didn't mean any harm. We won't either of us say anything to Kuat. As he lay in his room after dinner, the space lord tried to reconstruct the afternoon. They had reached the rim of the crater, and it had been as Madhu said. One could feel as if the horizon were infinite. The space lord had felt an overwhelming sense of the magnitude of infinity, something he had never quite experienced to this degree before in all of his trips through space or time. And yet there had been a small, nagging feeling that something was not quite right. Part of the feeling was associated with the grove of Bua trees. He was sure that he had glimpsed a building as the uncertain, sometimes gusting, sometimes gentle wind blew the bua branches. He had not mentioned this observation to the young people. It was probably something else autochthonous, and therefore forbidden to discussion, or surely one of them would have mentioned it. He searched his memory. Yes, he felt his mind was definitely recovering— for a person among the servants at the palace who might be willing to talk to a lord of the instrumentality. Suddenly he remembered something of which he must have made subliminal note at the time without being consciously aware. One of the men in the cat stable. What was it now? He had drawn a fish in the cat sand, and then, glancing at the face of the space lord, had casually brushed it over. Later, he had caught the gleam of metal at the man's neck. Could it have been a cross of the god nailed high? Was there a member of the old strong religion here on Xanadu? If so, he had a subject for blackmail. Or did he? The man had been trying to communicate to him. Now that he thought of it, he was sure. Well, at least he had a possible colleague. Now all he had to do was remember the man's name. He gave his mind free association. The face came to him the man's hand fumbling at the chain at his neck. Yes, certainly, the cross. He could see it now. Why hadn't he noticed it before? But there it was, recorded on his mind. And yes, the man's name, Mr. Stokely from Boston. The unlikely suspicion that there was, after all, an underperson on Xanadu crossed his mind. Mr. Stokely from Boston did not look as if he were animal-derived, but the name indicated something odd in his background. Lord Kamal bin Permaiswari felt he could not wait until morning to try to further his acquaintance with Mr. Stokely from Boston. What excuse could he have to go down to the cat stables at this hour? The gates of Xanadu were closed for the next eight hours. Then he realized that he had been thinking as an ordinary human being. He was a lord of the instrumentality. Why should he have to have an excuse for anything he chose to do? Kuat might be governor of Xanadu, but in the schema of the instrumentality, he was a very small speck. Nevertheless, the space lord felt it best to be circumspect in his movements. Kuat had demonstrated his ruthlessness, and certain of these autochthonous practices seemed very peculiar. A space lord who accidentally drank pisang while of a disordered mind might be written off and there was the well-being of Mr. Stokely from Boston to be considered? Griselda. That was the answer. He had noticed that she was sneezing this afternoon. He had even mentioned it to Madhu and Leirai, and they had passed it off as dust or pollen, but it would serve as an excuse. He had become so obviously fond of Griselda as to be the subject of teasing of a mild sort on her behalf. Certainly no one would find his concern for her out of the ordinary. The corridors seemed strangely deserted as he strode through on his way to the cat stable. He realized that he had not ventured from his living area after the final meal of the day since his arrival on Xanadu. Apparently everyone retired after this meal, servants and masters alike. He wondered if the stables would also be deserted. It was his incredible good fortune to find Mr. Stokely from Boston alone. 
At least at the time, he assumed that the meeting was fortuitous. Later, he questioned the Birdman. Mr. Stokely from Boston had proved to be, as the Space Lord had wildly surmised, an underperson. Mr. Stokely from Boston's smile was wise and kindly. You see, Governor Kuat has no suspicion at all that I am an underperson, and of course the universal mind barrier has no operative effect on me. It was a little difficult, but I see I did manage to get through to you. I was somewhat worried when my mind probe showed all the leftover scar tissue from Styron 4, but I've been using the latest methods to try healing your mind, and I'm sure we're succeeding very nicely. The Space Lord felt an odd momentary resentment that this animal-derived person had such an intimate acquaintance with his mind, but the anger was short-lived because he quickly equated the empathy he had built up with Griselda to the mental communication he was having with the Birdman. Mr. Stokely from Boston smiled even more broadly. I was quite right about you, Lord Bin Permiswari. You are the ally we have been needing here on Xanadu. You look surprised? Lord Bin Permiswari nodded. The governor was so firm that there were no underpersons on Xanadu. Getting through has not been without its difficulties, Mr. Stokely from Boston acknowledged. But I am not alone. And we have other human families, of course, but none so powerful as a space lord up to now. Lord Kamal found that he did not resent the assumption that he was an ally. Again, the birdman read his thoughts and smiled at him. He had a curiously winning smile, assured but kindly. He looked trustworthy, and Lord Kamal felt himself ready to accept whatever the birdman might say. Their thoughts locked. Let me introduce myself properly, speaked the birdman. My real name is Edward, and my progenitor was the great Itelli Kelly, of whom you may have heard. Lord Kamal found the false modesty of this statement rather touching. He bowed his head momentarily in respect. The legendary birdman, the Itelli Kelly, was known throughout the instrumentality as the acknowledged leader and spiritual advisor of the underpersons. This egg-derived underperson could be a most helpful ally in carrying out the work of the instrumentality or an opposition of fearful proportions. The lords and ladies who ruled the instrumentality were anxious for his cooperation. Many underpersons were known to have extraordinary medical and psychic powers, and it comforted the space lord to know that the animal-derived person who had been manipulating his mind was a descendant of the Atelli Kelly. He found that he was speaking his thoughts because Edward could obviously hear them. It would certainly make the process of solving Xanadu's mystery simpler for the Space Lord if they cooperated, but first he wanted to know if their peculiar alliance violated any of the laws of the instrumentality. No, Edward was emphatic. In fact, it is a correction of matters which are in direct conflict with the laws of the instrumentality, with which we have to deal. Something. Autochthonous? asked the Space Lord shrewdly. Native culture is involved, Edward agreed, but it's really being used as a screen for something far more evil. And I use the word evil not only in this sense. He held up the cross of the god nailed high. But in its sense of the basic violation of the rights of the living. I mean the right of an entity to exist to exist on its own terms provided they do not violate the rights of others, to come to its own terms with life, and to make its own decisions. For a second time, Lord Kamal bin Permaiswari nodded in respect and agreement. These are inalienable rights. Edward shook his head. They should be, he speaked. But on Xanadu, Kuat has found a way around that inalienability. You are, of course, familiar with the dire dead? Of course, a narrow life of their own, he quoted from an ancient song. But what does that have to do with the rights of the living? The dire dead are grown from the frozen bits of flesh of remarkable achievers long dead. It's true that in regenerating the physical person of the dead one, we have sometimes had extraordinary results with the dire dead in their second lives, but sometimes not. Their achievements seem to have been a combination of circumstances and genes, not of genes alone. 
Again, Edward shook his head. It's not of the legal, scientifically controlled, dire dead I speak, although I sometimes feel very sorry for them. But what would you think of dire dead grown from the living? The space lord looked his wonder and horror as Edward continued. Dire dead who are controlled like puppets by Kuat. Dire dead who are substituted for the originals, so that in truth, neither the dire dead nor the original has a life of its own. With quick realization, the space lord knew what was in the building he had glimpsed in the grove of Bua trees. That's the laboratory, isn't it? Edward nodded. It's a perfect location. Kuat has spread the rumor that the scent of the Bua tree is deadly, except when, after consultation with the Arroy, he pronounces it safe to harvest the fruit. So nobody dares approach the laboratory. All nonsense. There is only a very short period just before harvest when the scent of the Bua fruit is deadly. In other words, just enough truth to the rumor to give it currency. You saw our scout killed this morning? Lord Kamal looked uncomprehending. The unmodified eagle you saw fall from the skies this morning on your ride. He was scouting the laboratory for us. He was shot with a pissang dart. It's things like that which make people believe they must stay away from the grove. You could communicate? For the first time, the space lord thought that the smile of the birdman was a little smug. Of course. Then his face fell, and his eyes became old and sad. He was a brother of mine. We were hatched in the same nest, but I was chosen for genetic coding as an underperson, and he was not. Our feelings are somewhat different from those of true persons, but we are capable of love and loyalty and sadness as well. Lord Kamal saw again in memory the handsome soaring bird of his morning's ride, and he felt Edward's sadness. Yes, he could believe in the feelings of the underpersons. Edward touched his hand with a tentative finger. I could tell that you grieved for him without knowing any of the circumstances. It is one of the reasons I willed you to come tonight. There was a quick change in his mood. We must deal first with the Arroy. I have heard the word, but I don't know its meaning, the space lord acknowledged. I'm not surprised. The Arroy lead a life of pleasure. They sing, they dance, they entertain and they serve as a kind of priesthood. Both men and women make up the Arroy, and they are respected and honored. But there's a singularly ghastly requirement for joining the Arroy. The Space Lord looked his question. All living descendants of the current mate of the person joining the Arroy must be sacrificed, or the mate must die. And if there is more than one offspring of that union, an equivalent number of other volunteers must also die. Lord Kamal comprehended. So that is the reason that Leirai's mother drowned herself in the sunless sea to save her infant son. But why did the old governor join the Arroy? Don't you see? With Kuat as governor and the old governor with the Arroy, that pair of conspirators wields a power over this planet so absolute. So it was a conspiracy from the beginning. Of course. Kuat was the son of the first wife, when the governor was in his first youth. In his old age, he wanted to continue the power, but with the help of a viceroy, as it were. And the dire dead in the laboratory? That is the reason that the matter is urgent. They are full-grown and almost sentient. They must be destroyed before they are substituted for the originals, and the originals killed. I suppose there is no other way, but it... Seems almost like murder. Edward disagreed. The substitution is both physical and spiritual murder. These dire dead are like robots without soul. He saw the space lord's faint smile. I know you do not believe in the old strong religion, but I think you know what I mean. Yes, they are not, in the sense you mean, living beings. They have no will of their own. The Arroy are two villages away, about one hundred li. After they have performed their entertainment in those villages, they will proceed here. That will be the signal for the harvest of the Bua fruit and the substitution of the dire dead for their living counterparts. 
Then there will be no opposition to Kuat on the planet, and he can give his cruelty full reign. And plan for the conquest of other worlds. His brother Leirai is one of the planned victims because he fears the boy's popularity with the crowds. The Space Lord was almost incredulous. But the two persons he has seemed to be truly fond of are Leirai and the girl Madu. Nevertheless, one of the Dyer dead in the laboratory is a replica of the boy Leirai. Won't the old governor, the father, object? Possibly. Although the mere fact that he joined the Arroy when he knew what the cost would be in human terms argues against his interference. And Madu? He will keep her as she is, for the time being, and try to mold her to his will. He so little respects individuality that if he cannot, he will obtain some bit of her flesh, and eventually she too will be replaced by a dire dead. He could be satisfied with a physical replica without caring that the person was missing. The Space Lord felt his tired mind attempting to ingest more than was possible at one time. Immediately, Edward was sympathetic. I have kept you too long. You must rest. We will be in touch. And don't worry. Kuat's mind barrier applies to him, too. Only underpersons and animals are exempt, and we are all in league. As he made his way back to his living quarters, Lord Bin Permaiswari was again aware of the silence, the absence of any human activity anywhere in the palace. He wondered how long it had been since he had left his room to seek Mr. Stokely from Boston in the cat stables. He wished he had remembered to ask Edward how he had acquired that unlikely name. Immediately, he was aware of Edward's voice speaking in his mind. It was bestowed upon me for some small service I rendered the instrumentality on old man home. The space lord started with surprise. He had forgotten that there were no space barriers to speaking if he left his mind open. He speaked thank you, then closed his mind. 4. When he awoke from a dream-tormented sleep, the space lord felt a weariness which he knew Edward would have termed a tiredness of the soul. There was no way in which he could communicate with the instrumentality. The next scheduled spaceship for the spaceport above Xanadu was too far in the future to be of any use in the matter of the illegal dire dead. Edward was right. The substitution must be stopped before it began. But how? He felt it somehow belittling to his position for a space lord to have to rely on an underperson. The only consolation was that the underperson involved was a descendant of the great Itali Kelly. As they ate their first meal of the day, Madu seemed subdued. Leirai was not present. Lord Kamal, making his voice as pleasant as he could, queried Kuat about the boy. He's gone down to Raraku to dance with the Aroi, Kuat said. Then apparently he realized that the Space Lord would not know the word Aroi. It's a group of dancers and entertainers we have here on Xanadu, he explained kindly. Kamal felt a coldness about his heart. He could hardly wait to communicate with Edward. Leiraya's missing, he speaked, as soon as he was sure that Kuat would not notice his expression. All the dire dead are still in place, our scouts report. Edward speaked back. We will try to locate him and communicate with you. But time passed. The only things the underpersons were able to assure Lord Kamal were that Leirai was not with the Arroy at Raraku, and that the dire dead replica of him was still in place in the laboratory. He seemed to have vanished from the planet. Madu had taken Kuat's statement at its face value. She was much quieter now, but she apparently believed that Leirai was dancing with the Arroy. The space lord tried a gentle probing. I had gathered from what I heard that the Arroy was a closed group which one had to join in order to participate. Oh, yes, to participate fully, Madu said. But near harvest time, the best dancers are allowed to dance with the Arroy, whether they are members or not. It will not be so long now. The Arroy have moved from Raraku to Poik. Then they will come here. I will be so glad to see Leirai again. I always miss him when he goes off to run or to dance. He has gone away before to dance? The space lord asked. Well, no. 
not to dance, to run, but not to dance before. But he is very good. He really hasn't been quite old enough before. And do you have other entertainment at the harvest besides the dancing? The space lord asked, still seeking a clue as to the whereabouts of the vanished Leirai. Her smile had some of its old radiance. Oh, yes, that is when we have the horse racing I told you about. It is Kuat's favorite sport, only... Her face clouded. This time, I'm afraid his horse doesn't have much chance of winning. Gogol has really been raced too long and too hard. His back legs are wearing out. The vet was talking about doing a muscle transplant if they had a suitable donor, but I don't think they've found one. At the prospect of seeing Leirai soon again, however, she seemed happier with some of the joy the Space Lord associated with her. They went for a cat ride, and Lord Kamal felt again the overwhelming sense of wonder and pleasure as he and the cat Griselda became as one being. Their feelings were in such close communication that he did not have to tighten his knees or hiss at her to obey his slightest wish. For the first time in days, Lord Bin Permiswari was able to forget about Edward and the dire dead, about his concern for Leirai, and his worry as to whether the instrumentality would approve his cooperation with the Birdman. For the first time also, the Space Lord began to wonder to what extent Madu and Leirai were committed to each other. Now that he had Madu to himself, he felt more than ever the strong attraction she held for him. He had never in all the worlds he had known felt such an attraction for a woman before. And, such was his honor, he began to feel it all the more imperative to restore Leirai safely before he could express his feelings to her. He tried speaking to Edward. Nothing, said the birdman. We have found no trace of him. The last time he was seen by one of our people was on the outskirts of the palace, headed in the direction of the stables. That is all. On the day of the festival before the harvest, the space lord, using Griselda as a pretext, once more went to the cat stables. Edward, as Mr. Stokely from Boston, was hard at work. He looked gravely at the space lord, but his mind remained closed. He did not speak. Lord Bin Permiswari found himself annoyed. He opened his mind and speaked. Animals! Edward winced slightly, but did not speak. The space lord apologetic speaked. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. This time Edward speaked back. Yes, you did. And we are. But why so much contempt? We are each what we are. I was annoyed that your mind was closed to me, a space lord. You have the right to close your mind to anyone. I apologize. Edward accepted the statement graciously. He said, There was a reason that my mind was closed to you. I was trying to decide how to tell you something, and I needed to know your full feelings about the girl Madu and the boy Leirai before I can speak freely. Lord Bin Permiswari felt a sense of shame. He had behaved not as a space lord, but as a child. He tried to speak with complete frankness. I am truly worried about the boy Leirai. As to Madu, you must know that there is a strong attraction, but I must first find out about the boy and see what her feelings are. Edward nodded. You speak as I hoped you would. We have found Leirai. He is crippled for life. Lord Kamel's intake of air hurt his throat. What do you mean? Kuat had his vet take the boy's calf muscles and transplant them to his favorite horse, Gogol. The horse will be able to run one more race at top speed, thus fooling all those who bet against Kuat. It's improbable that any surgery will enable the boy to walk again, much less to run or dance. The space lord found his mind a blank. He realized that Edward was still speaking. We will have the boy in his wheelchair at the horse race tomorrow. You will need Madu's help. Then you can decide what to do. Until the time of the race next day, Lord Kamal found himself moving as if in a dream, dispassionately observing his movements. Edward speaked to him only once. We must kill off the dire dead at once, he said. After the race tomorrow... When everybody is celebrating will be the time. Keep Kuat busy and I will take care of the matter. Fearful, unhappy, 
feeling weaker than he had since Styron IV. Lord Kemal bin Pirmaiswari accompanied Madhu and Governor Kuat to the horse race. At their box sat Leirai, white-faced, thin, much older, in a wheelchair. Why? Speak shrieked the space lord. Edward's voice came through much more calmly. Kuat actually thought he was being kind. With the boy crippled, he can't be the racer hero he has been to the people of Xanadu. Kuat thought that way he wouldn't need to substitute the dire dead. He didn't realize he's taken the boy's chief reason for wanting to live. He might almost as well have substituted the dire dead. Madhu was sobbing. Kuat, in what he intended as rough kindness, stroked her hair. We'll take care of him, and Venus will we fool the betters today. They think Gogol can't run anymore. Will they be fooled? Of course, it's only for this one race, but it'll be worth it. Be worth it, the space lord thought. Be worth the rest of Leirai's life, spent crippled, unable to do what he loved most. Be worth it, Madhu thought, never to dance again never to run, to feel the wind in his hair as the crowds cheered. Be worth it, Leirai thought. What does anything matter anymore? Gogol won by half a track. Kuat, his mood expansive, said to the others, See you in the main salon of the palace. Have to collect my wagers. Madhu's face was carved of marble as she wheeled Leirai toward a special two-cat cart brought up beside the stadium. Lord Kemal, without a word, mounted Griselda. He felt the need, for a little while at least, for solitude. They loped, in silent communication, away from the walls of the city. Lord Kemal heard a cry from the city gate, but he paid no attention. His mind was on Leirai. Again the cry, another lope. Suddenly Griselda faltered, stumbled, fell. At once the space lord was down, beside her face. Her eyes were glazing. He saw then the dart piercing her neck. Pisang. She tried to lick his hand. He petted her, his eyes filled with tears. She gave one great wrenching sigh, looked into her being, shuddered, and died. Part of him died with her. When he reached the gate, he queried the guard. No one was supposed to leave the city between the end of the races and the harvesting of the bua fruit. Griselda was the victim of an error of administrative oversight. No one had remembered to tell the space lord. Silently, he walked back through the pathways of the city. How beautiful it had seemed to him a short while ago. How empty and how sad it seemed now. He reached the main salon shortly after Madhu and Leirai in his wheelchair arrived. It was strange how all the budding desire for Madhu had withered like a flower in the frost. Kuat entered laughing. Lord Kemal would be tortured for more than two centuries by a question. When did the end justify the means? When was the law absolute? He saw in his mind's eye Griselda bounding over dunes and plains. A Madhu innocent as dawn, Leirai dancing under a sunless moon. Judai, demanded Kuat. Madhu moved gracefully toward the low table. She picked up the two-hold pitcher. Lord Kamal saw through Edward's speech that the pissang flow was being let into the ambiotic fluid of the dire dead. Soon they would be truly dead. Kuat laughed. I won every bet I made today. He looked away from Madhu toward the Lord Kamal. Almost imperceptibly, Madhu's thumb moved from one hole to the other. Lord Kamal did nothing in the endless night. The Queen of the Afternoon Above all, as she began to awaken, she wished for her family. She called to them, Muti, Vati, Carlotta, Carla, where are you? But of course she tried it in German, since she was a good Prussian girl. Then she remembered. How long had it been since her father had put her and her two sisters into the space capsules? She had no idea. Even her father, the Ritter vom Ocht, and her uncle, Professor Dr. Joachim vom Ocht. 
who had administered the shots in Pardubice, Germany, on April 2, 1945, could not have imagined that the girls would remain in suspended animation for thousands of years. But so it was. Afternoon sunlight gleamed orange and gold on the rich purple shades of the fighting trees. Charles looked at the trees, knowing that as the sunset moved from orange to red, and as darkness crept over the eastern horizon, they would once again glow with quiet fire. How long was it since the trees were planted? Fighting trees, the true men called them, for the express purpose of sending their immense roots down into the earth, seeking out the radioactives in the soil and the waters beneath, concentrating the poisonous wastes into their hard pods, then dropping the waxy pods until, at some later time, the waters which came from above the earth, and those yet in the earth, would once more be clean. Charles did not know. One thing he did know, to touch one of the trees, to touch it directly, was certain death. He wanted very much to break a twig, but he did not dare. Not only was it taboo, but he feared the sickness. His people had made much progress in the last few generations, enough so that at times they did not fear to face true men and to argue with them. But the sickness was not something with which one could argue. At the thought of a true man, an unaccountable thickness gripped him in the throat. He felt sentimental, tender, fearful. The yearning that gripped him was a kind of love, and yet he knew that it could not be love since he had never seen a true man except at a distance. Why, Charles wondered, was he thinking so much about true men? Was there perhaps one nearby? He looked at the setting sun, which was by now red enough to be looked at safely. Something in the atmosphere was making him uneasy. He called to his sister. Oda! Oda! She did not answer. Again he called. Oda! Oda! This time he heard her coming, plowing recklessly through the underbrush. He hoped she would remember to avoid the fighting trees. Oda was sometimes too impatient. Suddenly there she was before him. You called me, Charles? You called me? You've found something? Shall we go somewhere together? What do you want? Where are mother and father? Charles could not help laughing. Oda was always like that. One question at a time, little sister. Weren't you afraid you would die the burning death going through the trees like that? I know you don't want to believe in the tambu, but the sickness is real. It isn't, she said. She shook her head. Maybe it was once. I guess it really was once, granting him a concession. But do you yourself know of anybody who has died from the trees for a thousand years? Of course not, silly. I haven't been alive a thousand years. Oda's impatience returned. You know what I mean. And anyway, I decided the whole thing is silly. We all accidentally brush against the trees. So one day, I ate a pod, and nothing happened. He was appalled. You ate a pod? That's what I said, and nothing happened. Oda, one of these days you're going to go too far. She smiled at him. And now I suppose you are going to say that the ocean's beds were not always filled with grass. He was indignant. No, of course I know better than that. I know that the grass was put into the oceans for the same reason that the fighting trees were planted— to eat up all the poisons that the old ones left in the days of the ancient wars. How long they would have bickered, he did not know. But just then his ears caught an unfamiliar noise. He knew the sound the true men made as they sped on their mysterious errands in the upper air. He knew the ominous buzz that the cities gave off should he approach them too closely. He knew also the clicking noises that the few remaining mansion jaggers made as they crept through the wild— alert for any non-German to kill. Poor, blind machines. They were so easy to outsmart. But this noise, this noise was different. It was nothing he had ever heard before. The whistling sound rose and throbbed against the upper reaches of his hearing. It had a curiously spiral quality about it, as though it approached and receded, all the while veering toward him. 
Charles was filled with terror, feeling threatened beyond all understanding. Now Oda heard it too. Their quarrel forgotten, she seized his arm. What is it, Charles? What could it be? His voice was hesitant and full of wonder. I don't know. Are the true men doing something? Something new that we never heard before? Do they want to hurt us or enslave us? Do they want to catch us? Do we want to be caught? Charles, tell me, do we want to be caught? Could it be the true men coming? I seem to smell true man. They did come once before and caught some of us and took them away and did strange things to them so that they looked like true men, didn't they? Charles, could it be the true men again? In spite of his fear, Charles had a certain amount of impatience with Oda. She talked so much. The noise persisted and intensified. Charles sensed that it was directly over his head, but he could see nothing. Oda said, Charles, I think I see it. Do you see it, Charles? Suddenly he too saw the circle, a dim whiteness, a vapor train that increased in size and volume. Concomitantly, the sound increased until he felt his eardrums would burst. It was nothing ever before seen in his world. A thought struck him. It was as hard as a physical blow. It sapped his courage and manhood as nothing before had ever done. He did not feel young and strong anymore. He could hardly frame his words. Oda, could that be? Be what? Could it be one of the old, old weapons from the ancient past? Could it be coming back to destroy us all, as the legends have always foretold? People have always said they would come back. His voice trailed off. Whatever the danger, he knew that he was completely helpless. Helpless to protect himself, helpless to protect Oda. Against the ancient weapons, there was no defense. This place was no safer than that place. That place no better than this. People still had to live their lives under the threat of weapons from long, long ago. This was the first time that he personally had met the threat, but he had heard of it. He reached for Oda's hand. Oda, singularly courageous now that there was real danger, drew him over onto the bank, away from the Sanoti. With half his mind, he wondered why she seemed to want to move away from the water. She tugged at his arm and he sat down beside her. Already he knew it was too late to go looking for their parents or others of their pack. Sometimes it took a whole day to round up the entire family. The thing was coming down relentlessly, and Charles felt so drained of energy that he stopped talking. He thought at her, let's just wait it out here. And she squeezed his hand as she thought back, yes, my brother. The long box and the circle of light continued to descend, inexorable. It was odd. Charles could feel a human presence, but the mind was strangely closed to him. He felt a quality of mind that he had never felt before. He had read the minds of true men as they flew far overhead. He knew the minds of his own people. He could distinguish the thoughts of most of the birds and beasts— it was no trouble to detect the crude electronic hunger of the mechanical mind of a mansion yager. But this, this being had a mind that was raw, elemental, hot, and closed. Now the box was very near. Would it crash in this valley or the next? The screams from within it were extremely shrill. Charles's ears hurt and his eyes smarted from the intensity of heat and noise. Oda held his hand tightly. The object crashed into the ground. It ripped the hillside just across the Sanoti. Had Oda not instinctively moved away from the Sanoti, the box would have hit them, Charles realized. Charles and Oda stood up cautiously. Somehow the box must have decelerated. It was hot, but not hot enough to make the broken trees around it burst into flame. Steam rose from the crushed leaves. The noise was gone. Charles and Oda moved to within ten man lengths of the object. Charles framed his clearest thought and flung it at the box. Who are you? The being within obviously did not perceive him as he was. There came forth a wild thought directed at living beings in general. 
Fools, fools, help me! Get me out of here! Oda caught the thought, as did Charles. She stepped in mentally, and Charles was astonished at the clarity and force of her inquiry. It was simple but beautifully strong and hard. She thought the one idea. How? From the box there came again the frantic babble of demand. The handles, you fools, the handles on the outside. Take the handles and let me out. Charles and Oda looked at each other. Charles was not sure that he really wanted to let this creature out. Then he thought further. Maybe the unpleasantness that radiated from the box was simply the result of imprisonment. He knew that he himself would hate to be encased like that. Together, Charles and Oda risked the broken leaves, walking gingerly up to the box itself. It was black and old. It looked like something the elders called iron and never touched. They saw the handles, pitted and scarred. With the ghost of a smile, Charles nodded to his sister. Each took a handle and lifted. The sides of the box crackled. The iron was hot, but not unbearably so. With a rusty shriek, the ancient door flew open. They looked into the box. There lay a young woman. She had no fur, only long hair on her head. Instead of furs, she had strange, soft objects on her body, but as she sat up, these objects began to disintegrate. At first, the girl looked frightened. Then, as she glanced at Oda and Charles, she began to laugh. Her thought came through, clearly and rather cruelly. I guess I don't have to worry about modesty in front of puppy dogs. Oda did not seem to mind the thought, but Charles's feelings were hurt. The girl said words with her mouth, but they could not understand them. Each of them took an elbow and led her to the ground. They reached the edge of the cenote, and Oda gestured to the strange girl to sit down. She did, and made more words. Oda was as puzzled as Charles, but then she began to smile. Speaking had worked before when the girl was in the box. Why not now? The only thing was this odd girl did not seem to know how to control her thoughts. Everything she thought was directed at the world at large, at the valley, at the sunset sky, at the cenote. She did not seem to realize that she was shouting every thought aloud. Oda put her question to the young woman. Who are you? The hot, strange mind flung back quickly. Julie, of course. At this point, Charles intervened. There's no of course about it, he speaked. What am I doing? The girl's thoughts ran. I'm in mental telepathy with puppy dog people. Embarrassed, Charles and Oda watched her as her thoughts splashed out. Doesn't she know how to close off her thoughts? Charles wondered. And why had her mind seemed so closed when she was in the box? Puppy dog people. Where can I be if I'm mixed up with puppy dog people? Can this be Earth? Where have I been? How long have I been gone? Where is Germany? Where are Carlotta and Carla? Where are Daddy and Mother and Uncle Joachim? Puppy dog people. Charles and Oda felt the sharp edge of the mind that was so recklessly flinging all these thoughts. There was a kind of laughter that was cruel each time she thought puppy dog people. They could feel that this mind was as bright as the brightest minds of the true men. But this mind was different. It did not have the singleness of devotion or the wary wisdom that saturated the minds of the true men. Then Charles remembered something. His parents had once told him of a mind that was something like this one. Julie continued to pour out her thoughts like sparks from a fire, like raindrops from a big splash. Charles was frightened and did not know what to do, and Oda began to turn away from the strange girl. Then Charles perceived it. Julie was frightened. She was calling them puppy dog people to cover her fear. She really did not know where she was. He mused, not directing his thought to Julie. Just because she's frightened, it doesn't mean she has the right to think sharp, bright things at us. Perhaps it was his posture that betrayed his attitude. Julie seemed to catch the thought. 
Suddenly she burst into words again, words that they could not understand. It sounded as though she were begging, asking, pleading, expostulating. She seemed to be calling for specific persons or things. Words poured forth, and these were names that the true men used. Was it her parents, her lover, her siblings? It had to be someone she had known before entering that screaming box where she had been captive in the blue of the sky for... for how long? Suddenly she was quiet. Her attention had shifted. She pointed to the fighting trees. The sunset had so darkened that the trees were beginning to light up. The soft fire was coming to life as it had during all the years of Charles's life and those of his forefathers. As she pointed, Julie made words again. She kept repeating them. It sounded like V-A-S-I-S-D-A-S. -S. Charles could not help being a little irritated. Why doesn't she just think? It was odd that they could not read her mind when she was using the words. Again, although Charles had not aimed the question at her, Julie seemed to catch it. From her there came a flame of thought, a single idea that leapt like a fountain of fire from that tired little female head. What is this world? Then the thought shifted focus slightly. Vati, Vati! Where am I? Where are you? What has become of me? There was something forlorn and desolate to it. Oda put out a soft hand toward the girl. Julie looked at her, and some of the harsh, fearful thoughts returned. Then the sheer compassion of Oda's posture seemed to catch Julie's attention, and with relaxation came complete collapse. The great and terrifying thought disappeared. Julie burst into tears. She put her long arms about Oda. Oda patted her back, and Julie sobbed even harder. Out of the sobbing came a funny, friendly thought, loving and no longer contemptuous. Dear little puppy dogs, dear little puppy dogs, please help me. You are supposed to be our best friends. Do help me now. Charles perked up his ears. Something, or someone, was coming over the top of the hill. Certainly a thought as big and as sharp as Julie's could attract all living forms within kilometers. It might even catch the attention of the aloof but ominous true men. A moment later, Charles relaxed. He recognized the stride of his parents. He turned to Oda. Hear that? She smiled. It's father and mother. They must have heard that big thought the girl had. Charles watched with pride as his parents approached. It was a well-justified pride. Bill and Kay both appeared, as they were, sensitive and intelligent. In addition, their fur was well-matched. Bill's beautiful caramel coat had spots of white and black only along his cheekbones and nose and at the tip of his tail. Kay was a uniform fawn beige, with which her beautiful green eyes made a striking contrast. Are you both all right? Bill asked as they approached. Who is that? She looks like a true man. Is she friendly? Has she hurt you? Was she the one who was doing all that violent thinking? We could feel it clear across the hillside. Oda burst into a giggle. You ask as many questions as I do, Daddy. Charles said, All we know is that a box came from the sky and that she was in it. You heard that shrieking noise as it came down first, didn't you? Kay laughed. Who didn't hear it? The box hit right over here. You can see where it hurt the hillside. The area where the box had landed was black and forbidding. Around it, the fallen fighting trees gleamed in tangled confusion on the ground. Bill looked at Julie and shook his head. I don't see why she wasn't killed if it hit that hard. Julie began to speak in words again, but at last she seemed to understand. Shouting her language would not help any. Instead, she thought, Please, dear little puppy dogs, please help me. Please understand me. Bill kept his dignity, but he noticed with dismay that his tail was wagging of its own accord.
He realized that the urge was uncontrollable. He felt both resentful and happy as he thought back at her. Of course we understand you and we'll try to help you, but please don't think your thoughts so hard or so recklessly. They hurt our minds when they are so bright and sharp. Julie tried to turn down the intensity of her thought. She pleaded, Take me to Germany. The four unauthorized men, mother, father, daughter, and son, looked at each other. They had no idea of what a Germany might be. It was Oda who turned to Julie, girl to girl, and speaked. Think some Germany at us so we can know what it is. There came forth from the strange girl images of unbelievable beauty. Picture after clear picture emerged until the little family was almost blinded by the magnificence of the display. They saw the whole ancient world come to life. Cities stood bright in a green encircled world. There were no aloof and languid true men. Instead, all the people they saw in Julie's mind resembled Julie herself. They were vital, sometimes fierce, forceful. They were tall, erect, long-fingered, and of course they did not have the tales of the unauthorized men. The children were pretty beyond belief. The most amazing thing about this world was the tremendous number of people in it. The people were thicker than the birds of passage, more crowded than the salmon at running time. Charles had thought himself a well-traveled young man. He had met at least four dozen other persons besides his own family, and he had seen true men in the skies above him hundreds of times. He had often witnessed the intolerable brightness of cities and had walked around them more than once until, each time, he had been firmly assured that there was no way for him to enter. He thought his valley a good one. In a few more years he would be old enough to visit the nearby valleys and to look for a wife for himself. But this vision that came from Julie's mind, he could not imagine how so many people could live together. How could they all greet each other in the mornings? How could they all agree on anything? How could they all ever become still enough to be aware of each other's presence, each other's needs? There came a particularly strong, bright image. Small wheeled boxes were hurtling people at insensate speed up and down smooth, smooth roads. So that's what roads were for, he gasped to himself. Among the people he saw many dogs. They were nothing like the creatures of Charles's world. They were not the long, otter-like animals whom the unauthorized men despised as lowly kindred, nor were they like the unauthorized men themselves, and they were certainly not like those modified animals who in appearance were almost indistinguishable from true men. No, these dogs of Julie's world were bounding, happy creatures with few responsibilities. There seemed to be an affectionate relationship between them and the people there. They shared laughter and sorrow. Julie had closed her eyes as she tried to bring Germany to them. Concentrating hard, now she brought into the picture of beauty and happiness something else. Fearful flying things that dropped fire, thunder and noise, a most unpleasant face. A screaming face with a dab of black fur above the mouth, a licking of flame in the night, a thunder of death machines. Across this thunder there was the image of Julie and two other girls who resembled her. They were moving with a man, obviously their father, toward three iron boxes that looked like the one Julie had landed in. Then there was darkness. That was Germany. Julie slumped to the ground. Gently, the four of them probed at her mind. To them it was like a diamond, as clear and transparent as a sunlit pool in the forest, but the light it shot back to them was not a reflection. It was rich and bright and dazzling. Now that it was at rest, they could see deeply into it. They saw hunger, hurt, and loneliness. They saw a loneliness so great that each of them in turn tried to think of a way to assuage it. Love, they thought. What she needs is love, and her own kind. But where would they find an ancient one? 
Would a true man answer? Bill said, There's only one thing to do. We've got to take her to the house of the wise old bear. He has communications with the true men. Oda cried out, But she hasn't done anything wrong. Her father looked at her. Darling, we don't know what this is. She's an ancient one come back to this world after a sleep in space itself. It's been thousands of years since her world lived. I think she's beginning to realize that, and that's what put her into shock. We need help. Our people may once have been dogs, and that's what she thinks we are. We can't let that bother us. But she needs a house, and the only unauthorized house that I know of belongs to the wise old bear. Charles looked at his parents. His eyes were troubled. What is this business about dogs? Is that why we feel so mixed up when we think about true men? I'm confused about her, too. Do you suppose I really want to belong to her? Not really, his father said. That's just a feeling left over from long, long ago. We lead our own lives now. But this girl, she's too big a problem for us. We will take her to the bear. At least he has a house. Julie was still unconscious, and to them she was so big. Each took a limb, and with difficulty they managed to carry her. Within less than a tenth of a night they had reached the house of the wise old bear. Fortunately, they had not met any mansion yaggers or other dangers of the forest. At the door of the house of the wise old bear, they gently laid the girl on the ground. Bill shouted, Bear! Bear! Come out! Come out! Who is there? A voice boomed from within. Bill and his family, we have an ancient with us. Come out! We need your help. The light that had been streaming from the doorway with a yellow glare was suddenly reduced to endurable proportions as the immense bulk of the bear loomed in the doorway before them. He pulled his spectacles from a case attached to his belt, put them on his nose, and squinted at Julie. Bless my soul, he said, another one. Where on earth did you get an ancient girl? Pompous but happy, Charles spoke up. She came out of the sky in a screaming box. The bear nodded wisely. Then Bill spoke up. You said, another one. What did you mean? The bear winced slightly. Forget I said that, he told them. I forgot for a moment that you were not true men. Please forget it. Bill said, you mean it's something unauthorized men are not supposed to know about? The bear nodded unhappily. Understanding, Bill said, Well, if you can ever tell us about it, will you please? Of course, the bear replied. And now I think I'd better call my housekeeper to take care of her. Herky? Herky, come here. A blonde woman appeared, peering anxiously. Obviously, there was something the matter with her blue eyes, but she seemed to be functioning adequately. Bill backed away from the door. That's an experimental person, he said. That's a cat. The bear was completely uninterested. So it is, but you can see that her eyes are imperfect. That's why she is allowed to be my housekeeper, and why her name isn't prefaced by a C. Bill understood. The errors true men made in trying to breed underpersons were often destroyed, but occasionally one was allowed to live if it seemed able to function at some necessary task. The bear had connections with true men. If he needed a housekeeper, an imperfect, modified animal provided an ideal solution. Herky bent over Julie's still form. She peered in puzzlement at Julie's face. Then she looked up at the bear. I don't understand, she said. I don't see how it could be. Later, the bear said, when we are alone. Herky strained to see into the darkness and perceived the dog family. Oh, I see, she said. Bill and Charles were embarrassed. Oda and Kay did not seem to notice the slight. 
Bill waved his hand. Well, goodbye. I hope you can take care of her all right. Thank you for bringing her, the bear said. The true men will probably give you a reward. In spite of himself, Bill felt his tail beginning to wag again. Will we ever see her again? Oda asked. Do you think we'll ever see her again? I love her. I love her. Perhaps, her father answered. She will know who saved her, and I think she will seek us out. Julie awoke slowly. Where am I? What is this place? She had a partial return of memory. The puppy dog people. Where are they? She felt conscious of someone at her bedside. She looked up into clouded blue eyes, staring anxiously into hers. I'm Herky, the woman said. I'm the bear's housekeeper. Julie felt as though she had awakened in a mental hospital. It was all so impossible. Puppy dog people and now a bear? And surely the blonde woman with the bad eyes was not a human. Herky patted her hand. Of course, you're confused, she said. Julie was taken aback. You're talking. You're talking and I understand you. You're talking German. We're not just communicating telepathically. Of course, Herky said. I speak true Deutsch. It's one of the bear's favorite languages. One of... Julie broke off. It's all so confusing. Again, Herky patted her hand. Of course it is. Julie lay back and looked at the ceiling. I must be in some other world. No, Herky thought at her, but you've been gone a long time. The bear came into the room. Feeling better, he asked. Julie merely nodded. In the morning we will decide what to do, he said. I have some connections with the true man, and I think that we had best take you to the Vomacht. Julie sat up as if hit by a bolt of lightning. What do you mean, the Vomacht? That is my name, Vomacht. I thought it might be, the bear said. Herky, peering at her from the bedside, nodded wisely. I was sure of it, she said. Then, I think you need some good hot soup and a rest— in the morning it will all straighten itself out. The tiredness of years seemed to settle in Julie's bones. I do need to rest, she thought. I need to get things sorted out in my mind. So suddenly that she did not even have a chance to be startled by it, she was asleep. Herky and the bear studied her face. There is a remarkable resemblance, the bear said. Herky nodded in agreement. It's the time differential I'm worried about. Do you think that will be important? I don't know, Herky replied. Since I'm not human, I don't know what bothers people. She straightened and stretched to her full length. I know, she said. I do know. She must have been sent here to help us with the rebellion. No, the bear said. She has been too long in time for her arrival to have been intentional. It is true that she may help us. She may very well help us. But I think that her arrival at this particular time and place is fortuitous rather than planned. Sometimes I think I understand a particular human mind, Herky said. But I'm sure you're correct. I can hardly wait for them to meet each other. Yes, he said although I'm afraid that it's going to be rather traumatic, in more than one way. When Julie awoke after her deep sleep, she found a thoughtful herky awaiting her. Julie stretched, and her mind, still uncontrolled, asked, Are you really a cat? Yes, herky thought back at her. But you are going to have to discipline that thought process of yours. Everyone can read your thoughts. I'm sorry. Julie speaked, but I'm just not used to all this telepathy. I know. Herky had switched to German. I still don't understand how you know German, Julie said. It's rather a long story. I learned it from the bear. I think perhaps you had better ask him how he learned it. Wait a minute. 
I'm beginning to remember what happened before I fell asleep. The bear mentioned my name, my family name, Vom Acht. Herky switched the subject. We've made you some clothes. We tried to copy the style of those you had on, but they were coming to pieces so badly that we are not sure we got the new ones right. She looked so anxious to please that Julie reassured her immediately. If they fit, I'm sure they'll be just fine. Oh, they fit, Herky speaked. We measured you. Now, after your bath and meal, you will dress, and the bear and I will take you to the city. Underpersons like me are not ordinarily allowed in the city, but this time I think that an exception will be made. There was something sweet and wise in the face with the clouded blue eyes. Julie felt that Herky was her friend. I am, Herky speaked, and Julie was once more made aware that she must learn to control her thoughts, or at least the broadcasting of them. You'll learn, Herky speaked. It just takes some practice. They approached the city on foot, the bear leading the way, Julie behind him and Herky bringing up the rear. They encountered two mansion jaggers along the road, but the bear spoke true Deutsch to them from some distance, and they turned silently and slunk away. Julie was fascinated. What are they? she asked. Their real name is Menschenjäger, and they were invented to kill people whose ideas did not accord with those of the Sixth German Reich. But there are very few of them still functional, and so many of us have learned Deutsch since... Since? Yes? Since an event you'll find out about in the city. Now, let's get on with it. They neared the city wall, and Julie became conscious of a buzzing sound, and of a powerful force that excluded them. Her hair stood on end, and she felt a tingling sensation of mild electrical shock. Obviously, there was a force field around the city. What is it? she cried out. Just a static charge to keep back the wild, the bear said soothingly. Don't worry, I have a damper for it. He held up a small device in his right paw, pushed a button on it, and immediately a corridor opened before them. When they reached the city wall, the bear felt carefully along the upper ridge. At a certain point he paused, then reached for a strange-looking key that hung from a cord around his neck. Julie could see no difference between this section of the wall and any other but the bear inserted his key into a notch he had located, and a section of the barrier swung up. The three passed through, and silently the wall fell back into position. The bear hurried them along dusty streets. Julie saw a number of people, but most of them seemed to her aloof, austere, uncaring. They bore little resemblance to the lusty Prussians she remembered. Eventually, they arrived at the door of a large building that looked old and imposing. Beside the door, there was an inscription. The bear was hurrying them through the entryway. Oh, please, Mr. Bear, may I stop to read it? Just plain bear is all right. And yes, of course you may. It may even help you to understand some of the things that you are going to learn today. The inscription was in German, and it was in the form of a poem it looked as though it had been carved hundreds of years earlier, as indeed it had. Julie could not know that at this time. Herky looked up. Oh, the first... Hush, said the bear. Julie read the poem to herself, silently. Youth, fading, fading, going, flowing, like lifeblood from our veins, little remains... The glorious face erased, replaced by one which mirrors tears. The years gone by. O oh, youth, linger yet a while. Smile still upon us, the wretched few who worship you. I don't understand it, said Julie. You will, the bear said. Unfortunately, you will. An official in a bright green robe trimmed with gold approached. We have not had the honor of your presence for some time, he said respectfully to the bear. I've been rather busy, the bear replied. But how is she? Julie realized with a start that the conversation was not telepathic but was in German. 
How do all these people know German? She unthinkingly flung her thought abroad. Hush, came back the simultaneous warnings from Herky and the bear. Julie felt thoroughly admonished. I'm sorry, she almost whispered. I don't know how I'll ever learn the trick. Herky was immediately sympathetic. It is a trick, she said, but you're already better at it than you were when you arrived. You just have to be careful. You can't fling your thoughts everywhere. Never mind that now, the bear said, and he turned to the green uniformed official. Is it possible to have an audience? I think it's important. You may have to wait a little while, the official said, but I'm sure she will always grant audience to you. The bear looked a little smug at that, Julie noticed. They sat down to wait, and from time to time Herky patted Julie's arm reassuringly. It was actually not long before the official reappeared. She will see you now, he said. He led them through a long corridor to a large room at the end of which was a dais with a chair. Not quite a throne, Julie thought to herself. Behind the chair stood a young and handsome male, a true man. In the chair sat a woman, old, old beyond imagining. Her wrinkled hands were claws, but in the haggard, wrinkled face one could still detect some trace of beauty. Julie's sense of bewilderment grew. She knew this person, but she did not. Her sense of orientation, already splintered by the events of the past day, almost disintegrated. She grabbed Herky's hand, as if it were the only familiar element in a world she could not understand. The woman spoke. Her voice was old and weak, but she spoke in German. So, Julie, you have come. Laird told me he was bringing you in. I am so happy to see you, and to know that you are all right. Julie's senses reeled. She knew. She knew. But she could not believe. Too much had changed. Too much had happened in the short time that she had returned to life. Gasping tentatively, she whispered, Carlotta? Her sister nodded. Yes, Julie, it is I. And this is my husband, Laird. She nodded her head toward the handsome young man behind her. He brought me in about two hundred years ago, but unfortunately, as an ancient, I cannot undergo the rejuvenation process that has been developed since we left the earth. Julie began to sob. Oh, Carlotta, it's all so hard to believe, and you're so old. You were only two years older than I. Darling, I've had two hundred years of bliss. They couldn't rejuvenate me, but they could at least prolong my life. Now, it is not from purely altruistic purposes that I have had Laird bring you in. Carla is still out there, but since she was only sixteen when she was suspended, we thought that you would be better suited to the task. In fact, we really didn't do you any favor in bringing you in, because now you too will begin to age. But to be forever in suspended animation is not any life either. Of course not, Julie said. And anyway, if I had lived a normal life, I would have aged. Carlotta leaned over to kiss her. At least we're together at last, Julie sighed. Darling, Carlotta said. It is wonderful to have even this little time together. You see, I'm dying. There comes a point when, with all technology, the scientists cannot keep a body alive. And we need help. Help with the rebellion. The rebellion? Yes, against the Jwins. They were Chineseans, philosophers. Now they are the true rulers of the earth, and we, so they believe, are merely their instrumentality, their police force. Their power is not over the body of man, but over the soul. That is almost a forgotten word here now. Say mind instead. 
They call themselves the perfect ones and have sought to remake man in their own image. But they are remote, removed, bloodless. They have recruited persons of all races, but man has not responded well. Only a handful aspire to the kind of aesthetic perfection the Jwins have as their goal. So the Jwins have resorted to their knowledge of drugs and opiates to turn true man into a tranquilized, indifferent people, to make it easy to govern them, to control everything that they do. Unfortunately, some of our, she nodded toward Laird, descendants have joined them. We need you, Julie. Since I came back from the ancient world, Laird and I have done what we could to free true men from this form of slavery. Because it is slavery. It is a lack of vitality, a lack of meaning to life. We used to have a word for it in the old days. Remember? Zombie. What do you want me to do? During the entire conversation between the sisters, Herky, the bear, and Laird had remained silent. Now Laird spoke. Until Carlotta came to us, we were drifting along, uncaring, in the power of the Jwins. We did not know what it was, really, to be a human being. We felt that our only purpose in life was to serve the Jwins. If they were perfect, what other function could we perform? It was our duty to serve their needs, to maintain and guard the cities, to keep out the wild, to administer the drugs. Some of the instrumentality even preyed upon the unauthorized men, the unforgiven, and as a last resort, the true men, to supply their laboratories. But now many of us no longer believe in the perfection of the Jwins, or perhaps we have come to believe in something more than human perfection— we have been serving men. We should have been serving mankind. Now we feel that the time has come to put an end to this tyranny. Carlotta and I have allies among some of our descendants, and among some of the unforgiven, and as you have seen, even among the unauthorized men, and other animal-derived persons. I think there must still be a connection from the time that human beings had pets in the old days. Julie looked about her and realized that Herky was quietly purring. Yes, she said. I see what you mean. Laird continued. What we want to do is to set up a real instrumentality. Not a force for the service of the Jwins, but one for the service of man. We are determined that never again shall man betray his own image. We will establish the instrumentality of mankind— one benevolent, but not manipulative. Carlotta nodded slowly. Her aged face showed concern. I will die in a few days, and you will marry Laird. You will be the new Vomacht. With any luck, by the time you are as old as I am, your descendants and some of mine should have freed the earth from the power of the Jwins. Julie again felt completely disoriented. I'm to marry your husband? Again Laird spoke. I have loved your sister well for more than two hundred years. I shall love you too, because you are so much like her. Do not think that I am being disloyal. She and I have discussed this for some time before I brought you in. If she were not dying, I should continue to be faithful to her. But now... We need you. Carlotta concurred. It is true. He has made me very happy, and he will make you happy too, through all the years of your life. Julie, I could not have had you brought in had I not had some plan for your future. You could never be happy with one of those drugged, tranquilized true men. Trust me in this, please. It is the only thing to do. Tears formed in Julie's eyes. To have found you at last, and then to lose you after such a short time. Herky patted her hand, and Julie looked up to see sympathetic tears in her clouded blue eyes. It was three days later that Carlotta died. 
She died with a smile on her face and Laird and Julie each holding one of her hands. She spoke at the last and pressed their hands. I'll see you later, out among the stars. Julie wept uncontrollably. They postponed the wedding ceremony for seven days of mourning. For once, the city gates were opened and the static fields of electricity cut off, because even the Jwins could not control the feelings of the animal-derived persons. The unauthorized men, even some of the true men, toward this woman who had come to them from an ancient world. The bear was particularly mournful. I was the one who found her, you know, after you brought her in, he said to Laird. I remember. So that's what the bear meant when he said, another one, Bill said. Charles and Oda, Bill and Kay, were among the mourners. Julie saw them and thought, my dear little puppy dog people. But this time, the thought was loving and not contemptuous. Oda's tail wagged. I've thought of something, she speaked at Julie. Can you meet me down by the cenote in two days' time? Yes, thought Julie, proud of herself at being sure for the first time that her thought had gone only to the person for whom it was meant. She knew that she had been successful when she glanced at Laird's face and saw that he had not read her thought. When she met Oda at the cenote, Julie did not know what was expected of her, nor what she herself expected. You must be very careful in directing your thoughts, Oda speaked. We never know when some of the Jwins are overhead. I think I'm learning, Julie speaked. Oda nodded. What my idea was, it was to make use of the fighting trees. The true men are still afraid of the sickness. But you see, I know that the sickness is gone. I got so tired of brushing past the trees and always worrying about it that I decided to test it out and I ate a pod from one of the fighting trees, and nothing happened. I've never been afraid of them since. So if we met there, we rebels, in a grove of the fighting trees, the officials of the Jwins would never find us. They'd be afraid to hunt for us there. Julie's face lightened. That's a very good idea. May I consult with Laird? Certainly. He has always been one of us. And your sister was, too. Julie was sad again. I feel so alone. No, you have Laird, and you have us, and the bear, and his housekeeper, and in time there will be others. Now we must part. Julie returned from her meeting with Oda at the cenote to find Laird deep in conference with the bear and a young man who bore a singular resemblance to Laird, and to the youthful Carlotta that Julie remembered. Laird smiled at her. This is your great-nephew, he said, my grandson. Julie's perspective of time and age received another jolt. Laird appeared to be no older than his grandson. How do I fit into this, she wondered, and accidentally broadcast the thought. I know that all of this must be difficult for you to comprehend, Laird said, taking her hand. Carlotta had some difficulty in adjusting, too. But try. Please try, my dear, because we need you so desperately. And I, I particularly, have already become dependent on you. I could not face Carlotta's loss without you. Julie felt a vague sense of embarrassment. What is my... She could not say it. What is his name? I beg your pardon. He is named Joachim, for your uncle. Joachim smiled and then gave her a brief hug. You see, he said, the reason we need your help with the rebellion is the cult that was built up around your sister, my grandmother. When she returned to Earth as an ancient one, there was a kind of cult set up about her. That is why she was the Vomacht, and why you must also be. It is a rallying point for those of us who oppose the power of the Jwins. Grandmother Carlotta had a mini-kingdom here, and even the Jwins could not keep people from coming to pay her court. You must have realized that at the morning session for her. 
Yes, I could see that she had a great deal of respect for many kinds of people. If she was in favor of a rebellion, I am sure she must have been correct. Carlotta was always a most upright person. And now I must tell you about the plan that Oda proposes. She proceeded to do so. It might work, the bear said. True men have been very careful about observing the tambu of the fighting trees. In fact, I may even have an improvement on Oda's idea. He began to get excited and dropped his spectacles. Joachim picked them up. Bear, he said, you always do that when you're excited. I think it means I have a good idea, the bear said. Look, why don't we use the mansion yaggers? The others looked at him in bewilderment, and Laird said slowly, I think I may see what you're getting at. The mansion yaggers, although there are not many of them left, respond only to German and... And the leaders of the Jwins are Chinesian, too proud to have learned another language, the bear broke in, smiling. Yes, so if we establish headquarters in the fighting trees, and let it be known that the new Vomacht is there and surround the grove with mansion yaggers. They were breaking in upon each other as the idea began to take shape. The excitement grew. I think it will work, Laird said. I think so, too, Joachim reassured him. I will get together the band of cousins, and after you're established in the fighting trees, we'll make a raid on the drug center and bring the tranquilizers to the grove, where we can destroy them. The band of cousins? Julie asked. Carlotta's and my descendants who have not joined the instrumentality of the Jwins, Laird told her. Why would any of them have joined? Laird shrugged. Greed, power, all kinds of very human motives, even an illusion of physical immortality. We tried to give our children ideals, but the corruption of power is very great. You must know that. Remembering a howling, hateful face, with a black mustache above the mouth, a face from her own time and place, Julie nodded. Herky and the bear, Charles and Oda, Bill and Kay accompanied Julie into the grove of fighting trees. At first, Bill and Kay were reluctant. It was only after Oda's confession of having eaten a pod that they agreed to go, and then Bill's reaction was that of a typical father. How could you take such a chance? he asked Oda. Her eyes were bright and her tail wagged furiously. I just had to, she said. He glanced at Herky. Now, if she had done it... Herky drew herself up to her full height. I think that the relationship of curiosity and cats has, perhaps, been a little exaggerated, she said. Actually, we're generally rather careful. I didn't mean to be disrespectful, Bill said hastily, and Herky saw his tail droop. It's a common misconception, she said kindly, and Bill's tail straightened. When they reached the center of the grove, they spread a picnic and gathered around. Julie was hungry. In the city, she had been offered synthetic food, no doubt healthful and full of vitamins, but not satisfying to the appetite of an ancient Prussian girl. The animal-derived persons had brought real food, and Julie ate happily. The bear, in particular, noticed her enjoyment. You see, he said, that's how they did it. Did what? asked Julie, her mouth full of bread. How they drugged the majority of true men. True men were so accustomed to living on synthetic foodstuffs that when the Jwins introduced tranquilizers into the synthetics— True men never knew the difference. I hope that if the band of cousins succeeds in capturing the drug supply, the withdrawal symptoms for the true men will not be too severe. Bill looked up. That's something we should consider, he said. If there are severe withdrawal symptoms, a number of the true men may be tempted to join the Jwins in an attempt to recover the drugs. The bear nodded. That's what I was thinking, he said. It was several days before Laird, Joachim, and the band of cousins joined them. 
By this time, Julie had become almost accustomed to the daylight darkness under the thick leaves and branches of the fighting trees, and the soft glowing illumination at night. Laird greeted her affectionately. I have missed you, he said simply. Already I have grown very attached to you. Julie blushed and changed the subject. Did you, or rather the band of cousins, succeed? Oh, yes, there was very little difficulty. The officials of the Jwins had grown quite careless since they have had the minds of most true men under their control for generations. It was only a matter of Joachim's pretending to be tranquilized, and he had free access to the drug room. Over a period of days, he managed to transfer the entire supply to the cousins and to substitute placebos. I wonder when that will be discovered. As soon as the first withdrawal symptoms occur, I should think, Joachim ventured. Something that had been nagging at the back of Julie's mind surfaced. You have your grandson here, and the band of cousins, but where are your and Carlotta's own children? Obviously you had some. His face saddened. Of course, but since they were half ancient, they could not only not be rejuvenated— but the combination of the chemistry made it such that their lives could not even be prolonged. They all died in their seventies and eighties. It was a great sadness to Carlotta and me. You too, my dear, if we have children, must be prepared for that. By the time of the next generation, however, the ancient blood is sufficiently diluted that rejuvenation may take place. Joachim is a hundred and fifty years old. And you? And you? she said. He looked at her. This is very hard on you, isn't it? I'm over three hundred years old. Julie could not disbelieve, but neither could she quite comprehend. Laird was so handsome and youthful. Carlotta had been so old. She tried to shake the cobwebs from her mind. What do we do with the tranquilizers now that we have them? Oda had approached at the latter part of the conversation— her eyes sparkled and her tail wagged madly. I have an idea, she announced. I hope it's as good as your last one, Laird said. I hope so, too. Look, why don't we just feed the tranquilizers back to the officials? The Jwins probably will never notice. Then we won't have to worry about fighting them. They could just gradually die off, or maybe... Do you think we could send them out into space? To another planet? Laird nodded slowly. You do have good ideas. Yes, to feed the tranquilizers back to them. But how? We work well together, the bear said, indicating Oda. She has an idea, and it triggers another one in my mind. Carefully, he put on his spectacles. I have here a map of the terrain in this vicinity. Except for the Cenote, there is no water for many kilometers in any direction. If we dropped the tranquilizers, all of them, into the Cenote, and then if one of the cousins could prepare the synthetic food of the Jwins' officials, so it was very spicy, I think that the problem would be solved. Laird said, We do have one of the cousins who has infiltrated the Jwins, but what would induce them to drink the water? Charles had joined the group. I have heard, he said, of an ancient spice people used to like which eventually produced thirst. It used to be found in the oceans before they were filled with grass, but some of it remains on the banks of the sea. I believe that it was called salt. Now that you mention it, I've heard of that too. The bear nodded wisely. So that is what we need to do. Salt. We introduce it into their food, then we entice them to the grove with the knowledge that the new Vomacht is here together with the heart of a rebellion. It's risky, but I think it's the best idea, or combination of ideas yet. Laird agreed. It's, as you say, risky, but it may work, and they're not likely to execute any of us if it doesn't. They'll just tranquilize us. I think that we have a better-than-even chance of winning— and if true man is not revitalized, not freed from this bondage of tranquility and apathy, 
I believe that the entire breed will be extinguished within a few hundred years. They have come to the point that they care about nothing. All worlds know how the plan was carried out. It was exactly as the bear had foretold. The thirsty officials of the Jwins, their food highly salted, drank eagerly from the water of the Cenote and were quickly tranquilized. They put up no opposition to the members of the rebellion who soon thereafter emerged from the shelter of the fighting trees. Joachim was sad. One of my brothers had joined them, he said. Laird laid a comforting arm across his shoulder. Well, he's only tranquilized. We may be able to help him as he comes out of it. Perhaps, but it violates all my principles. Don't be too high-minded, Joachim. Principles are fine, but there is such a thing as rehabilitation. And this was the way that the instrumentality of mankind was established. In time, it would govern many worlds. Julie, by virtue of being the Vomacht, became one of the first ladies of the instrumentality. Laird, as her husband, was one of the first lords. Julie lived to see some of her descendants among the first great scanners in space— she was very proud of them, and she was very old. Laird, of course, was as young as ever. All of her animal-descended friends had long since died. She missed them, although Laird was ever faithful. At last, so old that she had difficulty in moving, Julie called Laird to her. She looked up into his handsome face. "'My darling, you have made me very happy, just as you did Carlotta.' But now I am old, and I think, dying, you are still so young and vital. I wish it were possible for me to undergo the rejuvenation, but since it isn't possible, I think we should call in Carla. He responded so rapidly that her feelings were somewhat hurt. Yes, I think that we should call in Carla. He turned away from her momentarily. She said with a hint of tears in her voice, I know that you will make her happy and love her very much. His silence continued for a moment before he turned back to her. She saw suddenly that there were lines in his face, lines she had never seen before. What is happening to you? she asked. My darling and last love, he said. I will be losing you twice. I cannot bear it. I have asked the physician for medicine to counteract the rejuvenation. In an hour I shall be as old as you. We are going together. And somewhere out there we will meet Carlotta, and we will hold hands, the three of us, among the stars. Carla will find her own man and her own fate. Together they sat and watched the descent of Carla's spacecraft. The colonel came back from the nothing at all. One. The naked and alone. We looked through the peephole of the hospital door. Colonel Harkening had torn off his pajamas again and lay naked face down on the floor. His body was rigid. His face was turned sharply to the left so that the neck muscles showed. His right arm stuck out straight from the body. The elbow formed a right angle with the forearm and hand pointing straight upward. The left arm also pointed straight out, but in this case the hand and forearm pointed downward in line with the body. The legs were in the grotesque parody of a running position, except that Colonel Harkening wasn't running. He was lying flat on the floor. Flat, as though he were trying to squeeze himself out of the third dimension and to lie in two planes only. Grosbeck stood back and gave Timofeyev his turn at the peephole. I still say he needs a naked woman, said Grosbeck. Grosbeck always went in for the elementals. We had atropine, surgital, a whole family of the digitalinids, assorted narcotics, electrotherapy, hydrotherapy, subsonic therapy, temperature shock, audiovisual shock, mechanical hypnosis, and gas hypnosis. None of these had had the least effect on Colonel Harkening. When we picked the Colonel up, he tried to lie down. When we put clothes on him, he tore them off. We had already brought his wife to see him. She had wept because the world had acclaimed her husband a hero, 
dead in the vast, frightening emptiness of space. His miraculous return had astonished seven continents on Earth and the settlements on Venus and Mars. Harkening had been test pilot for the new device, which had been developed by a team at the research office of the Instrumentality. They called it a chronoplast, though a minority held out for the term planiform. The theory of it was completely beyond me, though the purpose was simple enough. Crudely stated, the theory sought to compress living material bodies into a two-dimensional frame while skipping the living body and its material adjuncts through two dimensions only to some inconceivably remote point in space. As our technology now stood, it would have taken us a century at the least to reach Alpha Centauri, the nearest star. Desmond, the Harkening, who held the titular rank of colonel under the chiefs of the instrumentality, was one of the best space navigators we had. His eyes were perfect, his mind cool, his body superb, his experience first-rate. What more could we ask? Humanity had sent him out in a minute spaceship, not much larger than the elevator in an ordinary private home. Somewhere between Earth and the Moon, with millions of televideo watchers following his course, he had disappeared. Presumably, he had turned on the chronoplast and had been the first man to planiform. We never saw his craft again. But we found the colonel all right. He lay naked in the middle of Central Park in New York, which lay about a hundred miles west of the ancient ruins. He lay in the grotesque position in which we had just observed him in the hospital cell, forming a sort of human starfish. Four months had passed, and we had made very little progress with the colonel. It was not much trouble keeping him alive, since we fed him by massive rectal and intravenous administrations of the requisites of medical survival. He did not oppose us. He did not fight, except when we put clothes on him, or tried to keep him too long out of the horizontal plane. When kept upright too long, he would awaken just enough to go into a mad, silent, gloating rage, fighting the attendants, the straitjacket, and anything else that got in his way. We had had one hellish time in which the poor man suffered for an entire week, bound firmly in canvas and struggling every minute of the week to get free and to resume his nightmarish position. The wife's visit last week had done no more good than I expected Grosbeck suggesting to do this week. The colonel paid no more attention to her than he paid to us doctors. If he had come back from the stars, come back from the cold beyond the moon, come back from all the terrors of the up and out, come back by means unknown to any man living, come back in a form not himself, and nevertheless himself, how could we expect the crude stimuli of previous human knowledge to awaken him? When Timofeyev and Grosbeck turned back to me after looking at him for the some thousandth time, I told them I did not think we could make any progress with the case by ordinary means. Let's start all over again. This man is here. He can't be here because nobody can come back from the stars, mother naked in his own skin, and land from outer space in Central Park so gently that he shows not the slightest abrasion from a fall. Therefore, he isn't in that room, you and I aren't talking about anything, and there isn't any problem. Is that right? No, they chorused simultaneously. I turned on Grosbeck as the more obdurate of the two. Have it your way, then. He is there, major premise. He can't be there, minor premise. We don't exist, Q.E.D. That suits you any better? No, sir and doctor, chief and leader, said Grosbeck, sticking to the courtesies even though he was angry. You are trying to destroy the entire context of this case, and by doing so, are trying to lead us even further into unorthodox methods of treatment. Lord and heaven, sir, we can't go any further that way. This man is crazy. It doesn't matter how he got into Central Park. That's a problem for the engineers. It's not a medical problem. His craziness is a medical problem. We can try to cure it, or we can try not to cure it but we won't get anywhere if we mix the medicine with the engineering. It's not that bad, interjected Timofeyev gently. 
As the older of my associates, he had the right to address me by my short title. He turned to me. I agree with you, sir and Dr. Anderson, that the engineering is mixed up with this man's mental and physical state. After all, he is the first person to go out in a chronoplast, and neither we nor the engineers nor anybody else has the faintest idea of what happened to him. The engineers can't find the machine, and we can't find his consciousness. Let's leave the machine to the engineers, but let's persevere on the medical side of the case. I said nothing, waiting for them to let off steam, until they were prepared to reason with me and not just shout at me in their desperation. They looked at me, keeping their silence grudgingly, and trying to make me take the initiative in the unpleasant case. Open the cell door, I said. He's not going to run away in that position. All he wants to do is be flat. Flatter than a scotch pancake in a Chinese hell, said Grosbeck, and you're not going to get anywhere by leaving him in his flatness. He was a human being once, and the only way to make a human being be a human being is to appeal to the human being side of him, not to some imaginary flat side that got thrown into him while he was out wherever he was. Grosbeck himself smiled a lopsided grin. He was capable of seeing the humor of his own vehemence at times. Shall we say he was out underneath space, sir and doctor, chief and leader? That's a good way to put it, I said. You can try your naked woman idea later on, but I frankly don't think it's going to do any good. That man isn't corticating at a level above that of the simplest invertebrates, except when he's in that grotesque position. If he's not thinking, he's not seeing. If he's not seeing, he won't see a woman any more than anything else. There's nothing wrong with the body. The trouble lies in the brain. I still see it as a problem of getting into the brain. Or the soul, breathed Timofeyev, whose full name was Herbert Hoover Timofeyev, and who came from the most religious part of Russia. You can't leave the soul out sometimes, doctor. We had entered the cell and stood there looking helplessly at the naked man. The patient breathed very quietly. His eyes were open. We had not been able to make the eyes blink, even with a photo flash. The patient acquired a grotesque and elementary humanity when he was taken out of his flat position. His mind reached, intellectually speaking, a high point no higher than that of a terrorized, panicked, momentarily deranged squirrel. When clothed or out of position, he fought madly, hitting indiscriminately at objects and persons. Poor Colonel Harkening. We three were supposed to be the best doctors on earth, and we could do nothing for him. We had even tried to study his way of fighting, to see whether the muscular and eye movements involved in the struggle revealed where he had been, or what experiences he had undergone. Even that was fruitless. He fought something after the fashion of a nine-month-old infant, using his adult strength, but using it indiscriminately. We never got a sound out of him. He breathed hard as he fought. His sputum bubbled. Froth appeared on his lips. His hands made clumsy movements to tear away the shirts and robes and walkers which we put on him. Sometimes his fingernails or toenails tore his own skin as he got free of gloves or shoes. He always went back to the same position. On the floor, face down, arms and legs in swastika form. There he was, back from outer space. He was the first man to return, and yet he had not really returned. As we stood there helpless, Timofeyev made the first serious suggestion we had gotten that day. Do you dare to try a secondary telepath? Grosbeck looked shocked. I dared to give the subject thought. Secondary telepaths were in bad repute because they were supposed to come into the hospitals and have their telepathic capacities removed once it had been proved that they were not true telepaths, with a real capacity for complete interchange. Under the ancient law, many of them could and did elude us. With their dangerous part telepathic capacities, they took up charlatanism and fakery of the worst kind, pretending to talk with the dead, precipitating neurotics into psychotics, healing a few sick people and bungling ten other cases for each case that they did heal, and in general disturbing the good order of society. And yet, if everything else had failed... 2. The Secondary Telepath 
A day later, we were back in Harkening's hospital cell, almost in the same position. The three of us stood around the naked body on the floor. There was a fourth person with us, a girl. Timofeyev had found her. She was a member of his own religious group, the post-Soviet Orthodox Eastern Quakers. You could tell when they spoke Anglic because they used the word thou from the ancient English language instead of the word thee. Timofeyev looked at me. I nodded at him very quietly. He turned to the girl. Canst thou help him, sister? The child was scarcely more than twelve. She was a little girl with a long, lean face, a soft, mobile mouth, quick gray-green eyes, a mop of tan hair that fell over her shoulders. She had expressive, tapering hands. She showed no shock at all at the sight of the naked man lost in the depths of his insanity. She knelt down on the floor and spoke gently directly into the ear of Colonel Harkening. Canst thou hear me, brother? I have come to help thee. I am thy sister, Liana. I am thy sister under the love of God. I am thy sister born of the flesh of man. I am thy sister under the sky. I am thy sister come to help thee. I am thy sister, brother. I am thy sister. Waken a little and I can help thee. Waken a little to the words of thy sister. Waken a little for the love and the hope. Waken to let the love come in. Waken to let the love awaken thee further. Waken to let mankind get thee. Waken to return again. Return again to the realm of man. The realm of man is a friendly realm. The friendship of man is a friendly thing. Thy friend is thy sister. By the name of Liana, thy friend is here. Waken a little to the words of thy friend. As she talked on, I saw that she made a gentle movement with her left hand, motioning us out of the room. I nodded to my two colleagues, jerking my head to indicate that we should step out in the corridor. We stepped just beyond the door so that we could still look in. The child went on with her endless chant. Grosbeck stood rigid, glaring at her, as though she were an intrusion into the field of regular medicine. Timofeyev tried to look sweet, benevolent, and spiritual. He forgot and instead just looked excited. I got very tired and began to wonder when I could interrupt the child. It did not seem to me that she was getting anywhere. She herself settled the matter. She burst into tears. She went on talking as she wept, her voice broken with sobs, the tears from her eyes pouring down her cheeks and dropping on the face of the colonel just below her face. The colonel might as well have been made of personalized concrete. I could see his breathing, but the pupils of his eyes did not move. He was no more alive than he had been all these weeks. No more alive and no less alive. No change. At last the girl gave up her weeping and talking and came out to the corridor to us. She spoke to me directly. Art thou a brave man, Anderson, sir and doctor, chief and leader? It was a silly question. How does anybody answer a question like that? All I could say was, I suppose so. What do you want to do? I want you three, said she as solemnly as a witch. I want you three to wear the helmet of the pinlighters and ride with me into hell itself. That soul is lost. It is frozen by a force I do not know, frozen out beyond the stars where the stars caught it and made it their own so that the poor man and brother that thou seest is truly among us. But his soul weeps in the unholy pleasure between the stars, where it is lost to the mercy of God and to the friendship of mankind. Wilt thou, O brave man, sir and doctor, chief and leader, ride with me to hell itself? What could I say but yes? 3. The Return Late that night, we made the return from the nothing at all. There were five pinlighters' helmets, crude things, mechanical correctives to natural telepathy, devices to throw the synapses of one mind into another, so that all five of us could think the same thoughts. It was the first time that I had been in contact with the minds of Grosbeck and Timofeyev. They surprised me. Timofeyev really was clean all the way through, as clean and simple as washed linen. He was really a very simple man. The urgencies and pressures of his everyday life did not go down to the insides. Grosbeck was very different. 
He was as alive, as cackling, and as violent as a whole barnyard full of fowl. His mind was dirty in spots, clean in others. It was bright, smelly, alive, vivid, moving. I caught an echo of my own mind from them. To Timofeyev I seemed cold, high, icy, and mysterious. To Grosbeck I looked like a solid lump of coal. He couldn't see into my mind very much, and he didn't even want to. We all sensed out toward Liana, and in reaching for the sense of the mind of Liana, we encountered the mind of the colonel. Never have I encountered something so terrible. It was raw pleasure. As a doctor, I have seen pleasure. The pleasure of morphine, which destroys. The pleasure of phenine, which kills and ruins. Even the pleasure of the electrode buried in the living brain. As a doctor, I had been required to see the wickedest of men kill themselves under the law. It was a simple thing we did. We put a thin wire directly into the pleasure center of the brain. The bad man then put his head near an electric field of the right phase and voltage. It was simple enough. He died of pleasure in a few hours. This was worse. This pleasure was not in human form. Liana was somewhere near, and I caught her thoughts as she said, We must go there, sirs and doctors, chiefs and leaders. We must go there together, the four of us. Go to where no man was. Go to the nothing at all. Go to the hope and the heart of the pain. Go to the pain which return may this man. Go to the power which is greater than space. Go to the power which has sent him home. Go to the place which is not a place. Find the force which is not a force. Force the force which is not a force to give this heart and spare it back to us. Come with me if you come at all. Come with me to the end of things. Come with me. Suddenly there was a flash, as of sheet lightning in our minds. It was bright lightning, bright, delicate, multicolored, gentle, suffusing everything. It was like a cascade of pure color, pastel in hue, but intense in its brightness. The light came. The light came, I say. Strange. And it was gone. That was all. The experience was so quick that it could hardly be called instantaneous. It seemed to happen less than instantaneously, if you can imagine that. We all five felt that we had been befriended, looked at. We felt that we had been made the toys or the pets of some gigantic form of life immensely beyond the limits of human imagination, and that that life, in looking at the four of us, the three doctors and Liana, had seen us and the colonel, and had realized that the colonel needed to go back to his own kind. Because it was five, not four, who stood up. The colonel was trembling, but he was sane. He was alive. He was human again. He said very weakly, Where am I? Is this an earth hospital? And then he fell into Timofeyev's arms. Liana was already gliding out the door. I followed her out. She turned on me. Sir and doctor, chief and leader, all I ask is no thanks and no money, no notice and no word of what has happened. My powers come from the goodness of the Lord's grace and from the friendliness of mankind. I should not intrude into the field of medicine. I should not have come if thy friend Timofeyev had not asked me as a matter of common mercy. Claim the credit for thy hospital, sir and doctor, chief and leader, but thou and thy friends should forget me. I stammered at her. But the reports? Write the reports any way thou wishes, but mention me not. But our patient, he is our patient too, Liana. She smiled a smile of great sweetness, of girlish and childish friendliness. If he needs me, I shall come to him. The world was better, but not much the wiser. The chronoplast spaceship was never found. The colonel's return was never explained. The colonel never left Earth again. All he knew was that he had pushed a button out somewhere near the moon, and that he had then awakened in a hospital after four months had been unaccountably lost. And all the world knew was that he and his wife had unaccountably adopted a strange but beautiful little girl, poor in family, but rich in the mild generosity of her own spirit. War number 81Q, rewritten version. 
For a few brief happy centuries, war was made into an enormous game. Then the world population passed the 30 billion point. Acting Chief Minister Chatterjee presented the rightful proportions formula to the world authorities, and war turned from a game into realities. When it was over, hideous new creepers covered the wreckage of cities. Saints and morons camped in the overpasses of disused highways, and a few man-hunting machines scoured the world in search of surviving weapons. 1. Long before real war set mankind back a thousand ages, the nations played with their formulae of safe war. Wars were easily declared, safely fought, won or lost with noblesse oblige, and accepted as decisive. Wars were rare enough to sweep all other events from the television screens, beautiful enough to warrant the utmost in scenic decoration, and tough enough to call for champions with perfect eyesight and no nerves at all. The weapons were dirigibles armed with missiles, countermissiles, and fainting screens. They had been revived because they were slow enough to show well on the view screens, hard enough to demand a skillful fight. A whole class of warriors developed to manage these, men who trained on the ski slopes and underwater beaches of the world's resorts, and who then, tanned and fit, sat in control rooms and managed the ships from their own home bases. The kinescopes were paired up so that pictures of the battle alternated with scenes of the warriors sitting in their controls, the foreheads wrinkled with worry, their gasps of dismay or smiles of triumph showing plainly, and the whole drama of human emotion revealed in their performance of a licensed war. War came near between Tibet and America. Tibet had been liberated from the Gunhogo, the central Chinese government, only with generous American help and with a threat, was it bluff, was it death, trembling in the rocket pits around Lake Erie. No one ever found out whether the Americans would have risked a real war because the Chinese did not force a show of strength. The Americans had been supported by the reunion of India and the federated Congos on the floor of the World Assembly, and there were political debts to be settled when the Tibetan liberation came true. The Congo asked for support on Saharan claims, which was easy enough since this was a matter of voting in the assembly. But the reunion of India asked for the largest solar power collector to reach 80 miles along the southern crest of the Himalayas. The Americans hesitated and then built it under lease from Tibet, keeping title in their own hands. Just before the first surges of power were due to pour down into the Bengal plains, Tibetan soldiers entered the control rooms with a warrant from the Tibetan Ministry of the Interior seizing the plant. Tibetan technicians hooked in new cables, which had been flown from the Gunhogo base at Teli in Yunnan, and the Tibetans announced they had leased the entire power output to their recent enemies, the Gunhogo of China. Even in politics, where gratitude is seldom expected, such bleak ingratitude was hard to bear. The Americans had just freed the Tibetans from the Chinese, and now the Tibetans seized the reward which America had built for Indian help on Tibetan territory. Legally, the deal was tight. The solar accumulators were on Tibetan soil, and under the system of sovereignty, which prevailed at that time, any nation could do what it pleased on its own territory and get off scot-free. Some Americans were so furious that they clamored for a real war against the Gunhogo of China. The president himself remarked mildly that it did not seem right to fight an antagonist merely because he showed himself cleverer than we. Congress voted a licensed war. The president had no further choice. He had to declare war on Tibet. He put a request for the permit into the World Secretariat. The license came back for War Number 81Q, since someone in the World Secretariat figured that Tibet should not pay for any but the smallest size war. The Americans had asked for a Class A war, which would have lasted up to four full days. The World Secretariat refused a review of the case. There was nothing left to do. America was at war. The president sent for Jack Reardon. 
Two, Reardon was the best licensed warrior America had. Morning, Jack, said the president. You haven't fought for two years when Iceland beat us. Do you feel up to it now? Fitter than ever, sir, said Jack. He hesitated and then went on. Please don't mention Iceland, sir. Nobody has ever beaten Sigurd Sigurdsson. Lucky for us that he's retired. I wouldn't have called you if I just meant to reproach you. I know you did the best that anyone could do short of the great Sigurd himself. That's why you're here. How do you think we should run it? There's not much choice on ships, not with a Class Q war. They had better all five be the new Mark Zeros. Since we challenged, I think the Tibetans will choose the cheapest war they can. They don't want to run up a big bill on themselves. The Gun Hogo would help them, but the Chinese would be around two days later asking for payment. I didn't know, said the President, with a gentle smile, that you were also an expert on international affairs. Reardon looked uncomfortable. Sorry, sir, he muttered. That's all right, said the President. I had it figured the same way. They will take the Kerguelen Islands, then? Probably, said Reardon. And our picture people are going to be furious, but the French keep those islands cheap. It's the only way they can hold it in the market as a war zone. The President's manner changed completely. Instead of being a civilized old gentleman who had recently had his breakfast, he acted like the shrewd, selfish politician who had beaten all his competitors for the job and who had then found that his country needed a president much more than he had ever needed a presidency. He looked Reardon in the face, staring sharply and deeply into his eyes, and then asked in a formal, solemn tone, Jack, this may be the biggest question of your life. How do you want to fight it? Reardon stiffened. I thought it would be out of place to make up a list of teammates, sir. I thought perhaps you would have a list. I don't mean that at all, said the President. Do you prefer to fight it alone? Alone, sir? Don't play modest with me, Reardon, said the President. You're the best man we have. As a matter of fact, you're the only first-class man we have. There are some youngsters coming up, but there aren't any more in your class. Reardon forgot himself. So technical was the subject, and interrupted the president. Boggs is good, sir. He's had six fights as a mercenary in these little African wars. Reardon, said the president. You interrupted me. I beg your pardon, sir, stammered Reardon. Boggs has nothing to do with it. I've seen him too, you know. Even if I add him, that only makes two pilots who are first class. Reardon looked straight at the president, his face begging for permission to speak. The president smiled faintly. Okay, what is it? How about filling in the team with mercenaries, sir? Mercenaries, shouted the president. Good Lord, no. That would be the worst possible thing we could do. We'd look like fools all over the world. I played with real war to get Tibet free, and the Goon Hogo of China gave in just because some of the people in the Goon Hogo thought that Americans were still tough. Hire one mercenary and it's all gone. We have the posture of America to preserve. Will you or won't you? Reardon looked genuinely puzzled. Will I what, sir? You fool, said the president. Can you fight the war alone or can't you? You know the rules. Reardon knew them. For using a single pilot, the nation obtained a tremendous advantage. Two enemy ships down and his nation won, no matter how many ships he himself lost. There hadn't been a one-pilot war since the great Sigurd Sigurdsson defeated Federated Europe, Morocco, Japan, and Brazil in one, two, three, four order, 32 years ago. After that, no one had challenged Iceland to a Class Q war. Iceland went on declaring licensed wars on the slightest provocation. The Icelanders had accumulated enough credit to fight a hundred wars. The challenged powers all chose the largest, most complicated wars they could, trying to swamp Sigurd in a maze of teamwork. Reardon stared out of the window. The president let him think. At last he spoke, and his voice was heavy with conviction. I can try it, sir. 
They've given us the chance by demanding a Class Q war. But I'm no Sigurd, and you know it, sir. I know it, Reardon, said the President, seriously. But perhaps none of us, not even you yourself, know what your very best performance can be. Will you do it, Reardon, for the country, for me, for yourself? Reardon nodded. Fame and victory looked very bleak to him at that moment. Three. The formalities came through with no trouble. Tibet and America both claimed the Himalayan escarpment solar banks. They agreed that the title should yield through war. The Universal War Board granted a war permit, subject to strict and clear conditions. One, the war was to be fought only at the times and places specified. Two, no human being was to be killed or injured, directly or indirectly, by any performance of the machines of war. Emotional injury was not to be considered. 3. An appropriate territory was to be leased and cleared. Provisions should be made for the maximum removal of wildlife, particularly birds, which might be hurt by the battle. 4. The weapons were to be winged dirigibles with a maximum weight of 22,000 tons, propelled by non-nuclear engines. 5. All radio channels were to be strictly monitored by the UWB and by both parties. At any complaint of jamming or interference, the war was to be brought to a halt. 6. Each dirigible should have 6 non-explosive missiles and 30 non-explosive countermissiles. 7. The UWB was to intercept and to destroy all stray missiles and real weapons before the missiles left the war zone, and each party, regardless of the outcome of the war, was to pay the UWB directly for the interception and destruction of stray missiles. 8. No living human beings were to be allowed on the ships, in the war zone, or on the communications equipment, which relayed the war to the world's televisions. The last remembered casualties of safe war had been video crews who had ridden their multicopter into the blazing guns of a combat dirigible before the pilot, thousands of miles away, could see them and stop his guns. 9. The stipulated territory was to be the war territory of Kurgolin, to be leased by both parties from the 14th French Republic as agent for Federated Europe at the price of 4 million gold livres the hour. 10. Seating for the war, apart from video rights belonging to the combatants, should remain the sole property of the lessor of the war territory of Kurgolin. With these arrangements, the French off lifted their sheep from the island ranges of Kurgolin. The weary sheep were getting thoroughly used to being lifted from their grazing land to Antarctic lighters every time a war occurred, and the scene was ready. Reardon planned to work from Omaha. He supposed that his Tibetan counterparts would be stationed in Lhasa, but since Tibet had not been an independent power for many generations, he wondered what mercenaries they might obtain. They might get Sung from Peking. He had six battles more than Reardon and was a dependable fighter. 4. The French sold out their seats and view spots around Kerguelen very easily. The usual smugglers sold telescopes which would allegedly give perfect non-copyright views of the war, and as usual, most of them did not work. The purchasers merely had a cruise out of Durban, Madras, or Perth in vain. The warships were ready. The American ones were gold in color, stubby wings sticking out from the sides of their cigar-shaped bodies, the ancient American eagles surrounded by red, white, and blue circles on their sides. The five Tibetan ships turned out to be old Chinese Gunhogo models on rental. The emblem of China had been painted out, and the prayer wheel of Tibet shone fresh with new paint. The Chinese mechanics were expert to the point of trickiness. The American member of the Empire team insisted on inspection of all ten ships, before he signed for the entry into the war territory of Kurgolin. The minute of opening was noon, local time. Reardon started with a real advantage. Positions had been chosen at random by the empires, and he was facing into a strong west wind. 
while the enemy ships had to hold back lest they be blown out of the territory. Some fool in a swivel chair had named the American airships for characters out of Shakespeare, so that Reardon found himself managing the Prospero, the Ariel, the Oberon, the Caliban, and the Titania. The Tibetans had not taken the time to rename the Chinese ships, which had the titles of old dynasties, the Han, the Yuan, the Qing, the Qin, and the Ming. Reardon kept his ships lined up close to the spectators, so that the Tibetans could not fire missiles at him without shooting out of the territory and being penalized. He glanced up at the board in Omaha to see his antagonists, who had come on the telescreen. Sung was there, all right. So, too, was Bartek, a famous mercenary who flew under the flag of Liechtenstein and looked for quarrels wherever he could find them. The other three were strangers. One of them, wearing Tibetan clothes, was a girl. That's a good Chinese propaganda trick, thought Reardon. Trust the goon Hogo never to miss a bet. The Chinese got the displeasure of the spectators by casting a smokescreen. There really wasn't much else they could do, with their dirigibles pumping awkwardly in reverse against the wind. When the smokescreen neared his ships, Reardon jumped. He put the Prospero on manual, made three wild guesses, and sprang. The Prospero came ruined out of the other side of the smoke wall. Two missiles had pierced her, and Reardon doubted that the salvage crew would get much of her by the time the war ended. But he had almost won the war. He had rammed both the Han and the Ming. He used the eyes of the Ariel to watch them. The crippled Ming fought for position over the cold, cold waters of the deep South Indian Ocean. Reardon suspected that Bartek had taken over. She fired suddenly. He twisted the Ariel. Sheets of flame behind his ship told him that the UWB had intercepted the missiles with live weapons to keep them from harming the massed spectators. The flashes went on for so long that his view screens shone with a quivering milky white. There were going to be a lot of headaches among those spectators who watched those interception flashes too long, thought he. Bartek obviously did not care what his Tibetan employers paid in penalty money. Yet the Ariel had gotten away so easily. The Han, meanwhile, though falling, had attacked the Caliban, which lost its left wing and began drifting downward. Reardon shot a reproachful glance at the robot who had been managing the ship for him, and decided not to take time to curse the robot programmers who had guessed events so poorly. The face and voice of the UWB umpire appeared on all screens. The Caliban American, the Han Tibetan. Take both of them off the field. Suspend fire and remove. Under the scoring system, Reardon had just lost the winning of the war. All he needed to do was to down two enemy ships and keep one of his own in the air for the period of the war, and he had won. But the Ming, now in the white caps and breaking up, was the first of his victories. The Han was to have been the other. Now he had to start over again. He put the Ariel on robot and took over the Titania himself. One of the enemy ships began creeping toward him along the line of the spectators. It could not fire at him because the territory was rectangular and the Titania was too close to a corner. He could not fire at it unless he got the Titania down with her belly almost in the water. Then his stray shots would escape into space. He and the enemy started their dive at the same time. His command screen blanked out. The face of the president appeared on the screen. Only the president had that kind of overriding priority. How's it going, my boy? Doesn't look too good, does it? Reardon wanted to scream, Get off, you fool! But it was the president. One does not scream at presidents. He forced himself to speak politely, though he knew his face had gone white with rage. Please, sir, get off the screen. It's all right, sir. Thank you. The president got off the screen, and Reardon found himself back on the Titania, just as the enemy cut her in two. In a wild rage, but a controlled rage, 
He took over the Ariel, letting the ruined Titania go to the waves below. He spat a smokescreen himself, and it rushed toward him. He rose to the top of it just in time to see two Chinese ships go looking for him. He dived back in. The smoke was thinning. He struck for the lever which fired a time-on target, all missiles reaching for the same instant. But he thought of that fool of a president, and he struck the wrong lever. Destruct. The Ariel blew up in a pretty show of fireworks. There were two other orange clouds near her. The video eye on the foredeck of the Ariel showed him that he had technically won the war. The other two ships went down with him. He switched to the Oberon, his last remaining ship. There were still two Chinese to his one. They were the Qing and the Yuan. The Empire came on. You hit destruct. That is not allowed as a weapon in a licensed war. It was an error, snapped Reardon. You can look at your tape of me. You can see that I was reaching for a time on target. There was a moment of silence while the blank screens buzzed. Then the umpire came back on, speaking to Bartek and Sung, but letting Reardon listen in. The rules don't really cover this, said the umpire. It was a mistake, but your ships were taking a chance in getting that close to him. He was coming after you from the top. I rule it a net gain. Now, all he had to do was to stay alive for the next sixty-seven minutes, alive meaning with a ship in the field. He began creeping along the line of the spectators, so close that some of them backed up. Many voices called for the umpire, but Reardon made sure that he had his hundred meters tolerance. The Qing and the Yuan both lined up on him. He had to use emergency jets to dip in order to escape their missiles. He thought that the Qing had four left and the Yuan three, but the battle had gone so fast, with so much in smoke, that he could not be absolutely sure. It was like some of the old card games. Sometimes even the best players lost command of a complete recollection of the cards. He dived again. The Chinese ships followed. A missile clipped the elevator vane of his right wing. Reardon took advantage of it. He turned the Oberon sideways, like a crippled ship, and let it drop toward the water. The Yuan followed for a look, and he gave it to her. He cut a hole in her that he could see daylight through. She drifted toward the spectators, out of control. There was a bright flash from the protective weapons of the UWB, and she was gone. The Oberon touched water, and as she touched, Reardon rammed the engines into full reverse. He fired two of his precious missiles directly into the water itself. An enormous cloud of steam arose, and the Oberon rose faster than an airship had ever risen before. He could not see where he was going because his video was still looking at the waves, and he was rising in reverse, but he watched his damage control screen, and he set his audio on high. The impact came. The Oberon crunched into something that could only be the Ching. Reardon increased the thrust, cutting his ship in a sharp turn, still in reverse. He fired backwards into the ship he had rammed and pushed it inexorably back toward the water. The two ships in collision had not yet burst into flame. Damage control suddenly lit up like a Christmas tree. The whole back of his ship was gone. Using his fingertips and stroking the controls as lightly as he possibly could, he called for ascend. All he could see was the open sky above and the spectator craft, looking odd since they seemed to sit sideways in the air on the left of his pattern. The Oberon came loose from something. He had sunk the Ching without ever seeing it. The Empire came on the board. Your ship's clear of the water. The other one is out. War is over, sixty-one minutes ahead of time. Victory is declared for America. Tibet has lost. In a different tone, the Empire said, Congratulations, my boy. The enemy pilots wish to congratulate you, too. May they? Five. Before Reardon could say yes or no, his screen blanked out. 
the president had used his priority again. Reardon saw with amusement that the old gentleman was weeping. You've done it, lad. You've done it. I always knew you would. Reardon forced his face into a smile of approval and sat waiting for the screen to show him the faces of his friendly enemies. Bartek was sure to insist on a dinner. He always did. Himself in Anacron And time there is, and time there was, and time goes on, before. But what is the knot that binds the time, that holds it here, and more? Oh, the knot in time is a secret place. They sought in times of yore. Somewhere in space they seek it still. But Tasco hunts no more. He found it. From Mad Dita's Song First, they threw out every bit of machinery which was not vital to their lives or the function of the ship. Then went Dita's treasured honeymoon items. Foolishly and typically she had valued these over the instruments. Next, they ejected every bit of nutrient except the minimum for survival for two persons. Tasco knew then it was not enough. The ship still had to be lightened. He remembered that the sub-chief had said, bitterly enough, So you got leave to time travel together, you fool. I don't know whether it was your idea or hers to have a honeymoon in time, but with everyone watching your marriage, you've got the sentimental mob behind you. Honeymoon in time, indeed. Why? Is it that your woman is jealous of your time trips? Don't be an idiot, Tasco. You know that ship's not built for two. You don't even have to go at all. We can send Vomacht. He's single. Tasco remembered, too, the quick warmth of his jealousy at the mention of Vomacht. If anything had been needed to steal his determination, that name had done it. How could he possibly have backed out after the publicity over his proposed flight to find the nut? The sub-chief must have realized from the expression on his face something of his feelings. He had said with a knowledgeable grin, Well, if anybody can find the knot, it'll be you. But listen, leave her here. Take her later if you like, but go first alone. But Tasco could remember, too, Dita's kitten-soft body as she nestled up to him, holding his eyes with her own and murmuring, But darling, you promised. Yes, he had been warned, but that didn't make the tragedy any easier. Yes, he could have left her behind, but what kind of marriage would they have had with the blot of her bitterness on the first days of their married life? And how could he have lived with himself if he had let Vomacht go in his place? How even would Dita have regarded him? He could not deceive himself. He knew that Dita loved him, loved him dearly. But he had been a hero ever since she had known him, and how much would she have loved him without the hero image? He loved her enough not to want to find out. And now, one of them must go, be lost in space and time forever. Tasco looked at her, his beloved. He thought, I have loved you forever. But in our case, forever was only three Earth days. Shall I love you there in space and timelessness? To postpone, if only for minutes, the eternal parting, he pretended to find some other instrument which could be disposed of, and sent through the hatch one person's share of the remaining nutrient. Now the decision was made. Dita came over to stand beside him. Does that do it, Tasco? Is the ship light enough now for us to get out of the knot? Instead of answering, he held her tightly against him. I've done what I had to, he thought. Dita, Dita, not to hold you ever again. Softly, not to disturb the moon-pale curve of her hair, he passed his hand over her head. Then he released her. Get ready to take over, Dita. I could not murder you, oh, my darling. And unless the ship is lightened by the weight of one of us, we will both die here in the knot. You must take it back. You have to take back the ship and all the instrument-gathered data. It's not you or me or us now. We are the servants of the instrumentality. You must understand. Still within his arms, she backed away enough to look at his face. She was dewy-eyed, loving, frightened, her lips trembling with affection. She was adorable and cranch, 
How incompetent. But she'd make it. She had to. She said nothing at first, trying to hold her lips steady, and then she said the thing that would annoy him most. Don't, darling, don't. I couldn't stand it. Please don't leave me. His reaction was completely spontaneous. His open hand caught her across the cheek, hard. A reciprocal anger flashed across her eyes and mouth, but she gained control of herself. She returned to pleading. Tasco, Tasco, don't be bad to me. If we have to die together, I can face it. Don't leave me. Please don't leave me. I don't blame you. I don't blame you, he thought. By the forgotten one, that's really rather good. He said as quietly as he could, I've told you, somebody has got to take this ship back to our own time and place. We've found the knot. This is the knot in time. Look. He pointed. The Maricron swung slightly back and forth, from positive one million to one to negative five hundred thousand to one. Look hard. Twenty years a minute plus to ten years a minute minus. The ship has a chance of getting out if the load is lightened. We've thrown everything else we could out. Now I'm going. I love you. You love me. It will be as hard for me to leave you as for you to see me go. A lifetime with you would not have been enough. But, Dita, you owe me this, to take the ship back safely. Don't make it harder for me. If you can hold it on left sub-formal probability, do it. If not, keep on trying to slow down in back time. But, darling... He wanted to be tender. Words caught in his throat. But their time had run out. Their honeymoon had been a gamble. Their own gamble. And now it and their life together were over. Three Earth Days. The instrumentality remained. The chiefs and lords waited... A million lives would be a cheap price for a fix on the knot in time. Dita could do it. Even she could do it if the ship were lighter by a man. His farewell kiss was not one she would remember. He was in a hurry now to finish it. The sooner he left, the better her chances were of getting back. And still she looked at him as if she expected him to stay and talk. Something in her eyes made him suspicious that she would try to hinder him. He cut in his helmet speaker and said, Goodbye. I love you. I have to go now, quickly. Please do as I ask and don't get in my way. She was weeping now. Tasco, you're going to die. Maybe, he said. She reached for him, tried to hold him. Darling, don't. Don't go. Don't hurry so. Roughly, he pushed her back into the control seat, he tried to hold his anger that she would not let him do even this right, to die for her. She would make it a scene. Sweetheart, he said, don't make me say it all over again. Anyhow, I may not die. I'll aim for a planet full of nymphs, and I'll live a thousand years. He had half expected to stir her to jealousy or anger, at least some other emotion, but she disregarded his poor joke and went on quietly weeping. A wisp of smoke rising in the hot, moving air of the cabin made them look to the control panel. The probability selector was glowing. Tasco kept his face immobile, glad that she did not realize the significance of the reading. Now no one will ever find me, even if I live, he thought. But go, go, go. He smiled at her through his shimmering suit. He touched her arm with his metal claw. Then... Before she could stop him, he backed into the escape hatch, slammed the door on himself, fumbled for the ejector gun, pressed the button. Pressed it hard. Thunder, and a wash like water. There went his world, his wife, his time, himself. He floated free in Anacron. Others had gone astray between the probabilities. None had come back. They had borne it, he supposed. If they could, he could too. And then it caught him. The others. Had they left wives and sweethearts? Was it for them, too, a personal tragedy? Himself and Dita. They had not had to come. Vanity, pride, jealousy, stubbornness. They had come. And now, himself in Anacron. 
He felt himself leaping from probability to probability, like a pebble bouncing down a corrugated plastic roof. He couldn't even tell whether he was going toward formal or resolved. Perhaps he was still somewhere in left subformal. The clatter ceased. He waited for more blows. One more came, only one, and sharp. He felt tension go out of him. He felt the probabilities firming around him, listened to the selector working in his helmet as it coded him into a time-space combination fit for human life. The thing had a murmur in it which he had never heard in a practice jump, but then this wasn't practice. He had never before gotten out between the probabilities, never floated free in Anacron. A feeling of weight and direction made him realize that he was coming back to common space. His feet were touching ground. He stood still, attempting to relax while a world took shape around him. There was something very strange about the whole business. The gray color of the space around him resembled the gray of fast back-timing, the blind blur which he had so often seen from the cabin window when, having chosen a probability, he had coursed it down until the selectors had given him an opening he could land in. But how could he be back-timing with no ship, no power? Unless... Unless the knot in time in flinging him out had imparted to him a time momentum in his own body, but even if that were so, he should decelerate. Was he coming down in ratio? This still felt like high-timing, ten thousand to one or higher. He tried briefly to think of Dita, but his personal situation outweighed everything else. A new worry hit him. What was his own personal consumption of time? With time so high outside his unit, was it also rising inside? How long would his nutrients last? He tried to be aware of his own body, to feel hunger, to catch a glimpse of himself. Was the automatic nutrition keeping up with the changing time? On inspiration, he rubbed his face against the mask to see if his whiskers had grown since he left the ship. He had a beard. Plenty. Before he could figure that one out, there was one last snap, and he fainted. When he recovered, he was still erect. Some kind of frame supported him. Who had put it there and how? By the continued grayness, he could tell that his physiological time and external time had not yet met. He felt a violent impatience. There should be some way to slow down. His helmet felt heavy. Disregarding the risks, he clawed at the mask until it came off. The air was sweet but thick. Thick! He had to fight to breathe it in. It was hardly worth the struggle. He was still high-timing, more so than he had thought anybody could with an exposed body. He looked down and saw his beard tremble as it grew. He felt the stab of fingernails growing against his palms. It should have been an automatic cutoff, but time was going too fast. Clutching his hand, he broke off the nails roughly. His boots had apparently broken off his toenails, and although his feet were uncomfortable, the pressure was bearable. Anyway, there was nothing he could do about it. His immense tiredness warned him that the automatic nutrient system was not keeping up with his bodily time. With effort, he fitted his claw to his belt and twisted until the supplementary food vial was released. He felt the needle pierce the skin of his belly. He twisted again until the hot surge of nourishment told him that the food injector had reached a vein. Almost immediately, his strength began to rise. He watched the blur of buildings flashing into instantaneous shape around him, standing a moment and then melting slowly away. Now he could see a little more of his surroundings. He seemed to be standing in the mouth of a cave or in a great doorway. It was curious, that, about the buildings. All the other buildings he had seen in time had worked the other way. First, the slow upthrust as they were built, then the graying evenness of age then the flash of removal. But, he reminded himself tiredly, he was back-timing, and he thought it probable that no other human being had ever back-timed so hard and fast, or for so long a time. He seemed now to be rapidly decelerating. A building appeared around him, then he was outside of it, then back in again. 
Suddenly, a great light shone in front of him. Now he was inside a large palace. He seemed to be placed on a pedestal, high up at the center of things. Shimmering masses began to take form around him at rhythmic intervals. People? There was something wrong about the way they moved. Why did they move with that strange awkwardness? As the light persisted and this building seemed solid, he made an effort to squint to try to see more. His eyeballs were the only part of his anatomy that seemed to move freely. His breaking, growing, breaking fingernails and toenails and the growing beard reminded him to break off another food needle in his vein. His skin itched intolerably. As he realized the increasing immobility of his arms, he felt panic, and while there was still time, pushed the continuous flow button on the supplementary nutrients. Despite the food, enough to keep him alive in the cold of space, he could no longer move his hands and fingers. And still, it seemed only minutes since he had left the ship. Dita, Dita, are you out of the knot? Did you manage it in time? If only I calculated the weight load right. The building continued stable around him. He rolled his eyes to try to see where he was, when he was. I'm still alive, he thought. Nobody else ever got out of Anacron. That's something. Nobody else ever stepped out of time to be seen again. Deceleration continued. The bright light before him remained even, and he found he could see better. In front of him was a sort of picture, high and large. What was it? Panels. A series of panels. Paintings from some remote past. He peered harder and recognized that the panel at the top left was himself, Tasco Magnon. There he was, shimmering spacesuit, marble armrests, pedestal below him but they had given him wings like the wings of angels of the old strong religion, great white wings, and they had put a halo around his head. The next panel showed him as he felt, suit shimmering, but his face old and tired. The panels on the lower level were equally curious. The first showed a bed of grass or moss with luminescence glowing above it. The second showed a skeleton standing in a frame. His tired mind sought to make sense of the panels. People became plainer in the blur around him. Sometimes he could almost see individuals. The colors of the paintings brightened, brightened, until they flashed gay and bold, then disappeared. Disappeared completely, flatly. His brain, so old and tired now, struggled with immense effort to reach the truth. Physiological time was utterly deranged. Each minute seemed years. His thoughts became old memories while he thought them, but the truth came through to him. He was still back-timing. He had passed the time of his arrival and resurrection in this world. The resurrection was wisely prophesied by the beings who built the palace, painted the wings and halo around him. He would die soon, in the remote past of this civilization. Long afterwards, centuries before his own death, his alien remains would fade into the system of this time-space locus, and in fading, they would seem to glow and to assemble. They must have been untouchable and beyond manipulation. The people who had built the place and their forefathers had watched dust turn to skeleton, skeleton heave upright, skeleton become mummy, mummy become corpse, corpse become old man, Old man become young, himself, as he had left the spaceship. He had landed in his own tomb, his own temple. He had yet to fulfill the things which these people had seen him do, and had recorded in the panels of his temple. Across his fatigue he felt a thrill of weary, remote pride. He knew that he was sure to fulfill the godhood which these people had so faithfully recorded. He knew he would become young and glorious— only to disappear. He'd done it a few minutes or millennia ago. The clash of time within his body tore at him with peculiar pain. The food needle seemed to have no further effect. His vitals felt dry. The building glowed as it seemed to come nearer. The ages thrust against him. He thought, I am Tasco Magnon and have been a god. 
I will become one again. But his last conscious thought was nothing grandiose, a glimpse of moon-pale hair, a half-turned cheek. In the aching lost silence of his own mind he called, Dita! Dita! The twisted time ship took form at the date port of the instrumentality. Officials and engineers rushed up, opened the door. The young woman who sat at the controls staring blindly was white-faced beyond all weeping. They tried to rouse her from her trance-like state, but she clung desperately to the controls, repeating like a chant, He jumped out! Tasco jumped out! He jumped out! Alone! Alone in Anacron! Gravely and gently, the officials lifted her from the controls so that they could remove the now priceless instruments. Other Stories War Number 81Q, Original Version It came to war. Tibet and America, each claiming the radiant heat monopoly, applied for a war permit for 2127 A.D. The Universal War Board granted it, stating, of course, the conditions. It was, after a few compromises and amendments had been effected, accepted by the belligerent nations. The conditions were a. Five 22,000-ton Aero ships, combinations of Aero and Dirigible, were to be the only combatants. B. They were to be armed with machine guns firing non-explosive bullets only. C. The war territory of Kurgolin was to be rented by the two nations, the United American Nations and the Mongolian Alliance, for the two hours of the war, which was to begin on January 5, 2127, at noon. D. The nation vanquished was to pay all the expenses of the war, excepting the war territory rent. E. No human beings should be on the battlefield. The Mongolian controllers must be in Lhasa, the American ones in the city of Franklin. The belligerent nations had no difficulty in renting the war territory of Kurgolin. The rent charged by the Austral League was, as usual, $40 million an hour. Spectators from all over the world rushed to the borders of the territory, eager to obtain good places. Q-ray telescopes came into tremendous demand. Mechanics carefully worked over the giant war machines. The radio controls, delicate as watches, were brought to perfection, both at the control stations in Lhasa and in the city of Franklin, and on the war flyers. The planes arrived on the minute decided. Controlled by their pilots thousands of miles away, the great planes swooped and curved, neither fleet daring to make the first move. There were five American ships, the Prospero, Ariel, Oberon, Caliban, and Titania, and five Chinese ships rented by the Mongolians, the Han, Yuan, Xing, Xin, and Sung. The Mongolian fleet incurred the displeasure of the spectators by casting a smokescreen, which greatly interfered with the seeing. The Prospero, every gun throbbing, hurled itself into the smokescreen and came out on the other side, out of control, quivering with incoordinating machinery. As it neared the boundary, it was blown up by its pilot, safe and sound, thousands of miles away. But the sacrifice was not in vain. The Han and Sung, both severely crippled, swung slowly out of the mist. The Han, with a list that clearly showed it was doomed, was struck by a lucky shot from the Caliban and fell several hundred feet, its left wing ablaze. But for a second or two, the pilot regained control and with a single shot disabled the Caliban, and then the Han fell to its doom on the rocky islands below. The Caliban and Sung continued to drift, firing at each other. As soon as it was seen that neither would be of any further use in the battle, they were, by common consent, taken from the field. There now remained three ships on each side, darting in and out of the smokescreen, occasionally ascending to cool the engines. Among the spectators, excitement prevailed, for it was announced from the city of Franklin that a new and virtually unknown pilot, Jack Bearden was going to take command of three ships at once, and never before had one pilot commanded by radio more than two ships. Besides, two of the most famous Mongolian aces, Bartek and Soong, were on the field, 
while an even more famous person, the Chinese mercenary Tang, commanded the UN. The Americans among the spectators protested that a pilot so young and inexperienced should not be allowed to endanger the ships. The government replied that it had a thorough confidence in Bearden's abilities. But when the young pilot stepped before the television screen, on which was pictured the battle and the maze of controls, he realized that his ability had been overestimated by himself and by everyone else. He climbed up on the high stool and reached for the speed control levers, which were directly behind him. He leaned back and fell. His head struck against two buttons, and he saw the Oberon and Titania blow themselves up. The three enemy ships cooperated in an attack on the Ariel. Bearden swung his ship around and rushed it into the smokescreen. He saw the huge bulk of the Zing bear down upon him. He fired instinctively and hit the control center. Dodging aside as the Zing fell past him, he missed the Zin by inches. The pilot of the Zin shot at the reinforcements of the Ariel's right wing, loosening it. For a few moments he was alone, or rather, the Ariel was alone, for he was at the control board in the war building in the city of Franklin. The Yuan, controlled by the master pilot Tang, rose up from beneath him, shot off the end of his left wing, and vanished into the mists of the smokescreen before the astonished Bearden was able to register a single hit. He had better luck with the Zin. When this swooped down on the Ariel, he disabled its firing control. Then, when this plane rose from beneath, intending to ram itself into the Ariel, Bearden dropped half his machine guns overboard. They struck the Zin, which exploded immediately. Now only the Ariel and the Yuan remained. Master pilot faced master pilot. Bearden placed a lucky shot in the Yuan's rudder, but only partially disabled it. Yuan threw more smokescreen bombs overboard. Bearden rose upward. No, he was still safe and sound in America, but the Ariel rose upward. The spectators in their helicopters blew whistles, shot off pistols, went mad in applause. Tang lowered the Yuan to within several hundred feet of the water. He was applauded, too. Bearden inspected his ship with the auto-televisation. It would collapse at the slightest strain. He wheeled his ship to the right, preparatory to descending. His left wing broke under the strain, and the Ariel began hurtling downward. He turned his auto-televisation on the Yuan, not daring to see the ship, which carried his reputation, his future, crash. The Yuan was struck by his left wing, which was falling like a stone. The UN exploded 46 seconds later. And, by international law, Bearden had won the war for America, with it the honors of war and the possession of the enormous radiant heat revenue. All the world hailed this Lindbergh of the 22nd century. Western science is so wonderful. The Martian was sitting at the top of a granite cliff. In order to enjoy the breeze better, he had taken on the shape of a small fir tree. The wind always felt very pleasant through non-deciduous needles. At the bottom of the cliff stood an American, the first the Martian had ever seen. The American extracted from his pocket a fantastically ingenious device. It was a small metal box with a nozzle which lifted up and produced an immediate flame. From this miraculous device, the American readily lit a tube of bliss-giving herbs. The Martian understood that these were called cigarettes by the Americans. As the American finished lighting his cigarette, the Martian changed his shape to that of a 15-foot, red-faced, black-whiskered Chinese demagogue and shouted to the American in English, Hello, friend! The American looked up and almost dropped his teeth. The Martian stepped off the cliff and floated gently down toward the American, approaching slowly so as not to affright him too much. Nevertheless, the American did seem to be concerned because he said, You're not real, are you? You can't be. Or can you? Modestly, the Martian looked into the mind of the American and realized that 15-foot Chinese demagogues were not reassuring visual images in an everyday American psychology. He peeked modestly into the mind of the American, seeking a reassuring image. The first image he saw was that of the American's mother, 
so the Martian promptly changed into the form of the American's mother and answered, What is real, darling? With this, the American turned slightly green and put his hand over his eyes. The Martian looked once again into the mind of the American and saw a slightly confused image. When the American opened his eyes, the Martian had taken on the form of a Red Cross girl halfway through a striptease act. Although the maneuver was designed to be pleasant, the American was not reassured. His fear began to change into anger, and he said, What the hell are you? The Martian gave up trying to be obliging. He changed himself into a Chinese nationalist major general with an Oxford education and said in a distinct British accent, I'm by way of being one of the local characters, a bit on the supernatural side, you know. I do hope you do not mind. Western science is so wonderful that I had to examine that fantastic machine you have in your hand. Would you like to chat a bit before you go on? The Martian caught a confused glimpse of images in the American's mind. They seemed to be concerned with something called prohibition, something else called on the wagon, and the reiterated question, how the hell did I get here? Meanwhile, the Martian examined the lighter. He handed it back to the American, who looked stunned. Very fine magic, said the Martian. We do not do anything of that sort in these hills. I am a fairly low-class demon. I see that you are a captain in the illustrious army of the United States. Allow me to introduce myself. I am the 1,387,229th Eastern Subordinate Incarnation of Alohan. Do you have time for a chat? The American looked at the Chinese nationalist uniform. Then he looked behind him. His Chinese porters and interpreter lay like bundles of rags on the meadowy floor of the valley. They had all fainted dead away. The American held himself together long enough to say, What is a Lohan? A Lohan is an R hat, said the Martian. The American did not take in this information either, and the Martian concluded that something must have been missing from the usual amenities of getting acquainted with American officers. Regretfully, the Martian erased all memory of himself from the mind of the American and from the minds of the swooned Chinese. He planted himself back on the clifftop, resumed the shape of a fir tree, and woke the entire gathering. He saw the Chinese interpreter gesticulating at the American, and he knew that the Chinese was saying, There are demons in these hills. The Martian rather liked the hearty laugh with which the American greeted this piece of superstitious Chinese nonsense. He watched the party disappear as they went around the miraculously beautiful little lake of the Eight-Mouthed River. That was in 1945. The Martian spent many thoughtful hours trying to materialize a lighter, but he never managed to create one which did not dissolve back into some unpleasant primordial effluvium within hours. Then it was 1955. The Martian heard that a Soviet officer was coming, and he looked forward with genuine pleasure to making the acquaintance of another person from the miraculously up-to-date Western world. Peter Farrer was a Volga German. The Volga Germans are about as much Russian as the Pennsylvania Dutch are Americans. They have lived in Russia for more than 200 years, but the terrible bitterness of the Second World War led to the breakup of most of their communities. Farrer himself had fared well in this. After holding the non-commissioned rank of Yefriater in the Red Army for some years, he had become a sub-lieutenant. In a technicum, he had studied geology and survey. The chief of the Soviet military mission to the province of Yunnan in the People's Republic of China had said to him, Farah, you are getting a real holiday. There is no danger in this trip, but we do want to get an estimate on the feasibility of building a secondary mountain highway along the rock cliffs west of Lake Paku. I think well of you, Farah. You have lived down your German name, and you're a good Soviet citizen and officer. I know that you will not cause any trouble with our Chinese allies, or with the mountain people among whom you must travel. Go easy with them, Farrer. They are very superstitious. We need their full support. But we can take our time to get it. The liberation of India is still a long way off. But when we must move to help the Indians throw off American imperialism, we do not want to have any soft areas in our rear. Do not push things too hard, Farrer. Be sure that you get a good technical job done, 
but that you make friends with everyone other than imperialist reactionary elements. Farah nodded very seriously. You mean, comrade colonel, that I must make friends with everything? Everything, said the colonel firmly. Farrer was young, and he liked doing a bit of crusading on his own. I'm a militant atheist, colonel. Do I have to be pleasant to priests? Priests, too, said the colonel. Especially priests. The colonel looked sharply at Farrer. You make friends with everything. Everything except women. You hear me, comrade. Stay out of trouble. Farrer saluted and went back to his desk to make preparations for the trip. Three weeks later, Farrer was climbing up past the small cascades which led to the River of the Golden Sands, the Chinsha Chiang, as the Long River, or Yangtze, was known locally. Beside him there trotted party secretary Kung Sun. Kung Sun was a Peking aristocrat who had joined the Communist Party in his youth. Sharp-faced, sharp-voiced, he made up for his aristocracy by being the most violent communist in all of northwestern Yunnan. Though they had only a squad of troops and a lot of local bearers for their supplies, they did have an officer of the old People's Liberation Army to assure their military well-being and to keep an eye on Farrer's technical competence. Comrade Captain Lee, roly-poly and jolly, sweated wearily behind them as they climbed the steep cliffs. Lee called after them. If you want to be heroes of labor, let's keep climbing. But if you are following sound military logistics, let's all sit down and drink some tea. We can't possibly get to Pakuhu before nightfall anyhow. Kung Sun looked back contemptuously. The ribbon of soldiers and bearers reached back two hundred yards, making a snake of dust clutched to the rocky slope of the mountain. From this perspective, he saw the caps of the soldiers and the barrels of their rifles pointing upward toward him as they climbed. He saw the towel-wrapped heads of the liberated porters, and he knew without speaking to them that they were cursing him in language just as violent as the language with which they had cursed their capitalist oppressors in days gone past. Far below them all, the thread of the Qin Xia Chiang was woven like a single strand of gold into the gray-green of the Twilight Valley floor. He spat at the army captain. If you had your way about it, we'd still be sitting there in an inn drinking the hot tea while the men slept. The captain did not take offense. He had seen many party secretaries in his day. In the new China, it was much safer to be a captain. A few of the party secretaries he had known had got to be very important men. One of them had even got to Peking, and had been assigned a whole Buick to himself, together with three Parker 51 pens. In the minds of the communist bureaucracy, this represented a state close to absolute bliss. Captain Lee wanted none of that. Two square meals a day, and an endless succession of patriotic farm girls, preferably chubby ones, represented his view of a wholly liberated China. Farrer's Chinese was poor, but he got the intent of the argument. In thick but understandable Mandarin, he called, half laughing at them, Come along, comrades! We may not make it to the lake by nightfall, but we certainly can't bivouac on this cliff either. He whistled, Ich hat ein Kameraden, through his teeth, as he pulled ahead of Kung Sun and led the climb on up the mountain. Thus it was Farrer who first came over the lip of the cliff and met the Martian face to face. This time the Martian was ready. He remembered his disappointing experience with the American, and he did not want to affright his guest so as to spoil the social nature of the occasion. While Farrer had been climbing the cliff, the Martian had been climbing Farrer's mind, chasing in and out of Farrer's memories as happily as a squirrel chases around inside an immense oak tree. From Farrer's own mind he had extracted a great many pleasant memories. He had then hastened back to the top of the cliff, and had incorporated these in very substantial-looking phantoms. Farrer got halfway across the lip of the cliff before he realized what he was looking at. Two Soviet military trucks were parked in a tiny glade. Each of them had tables in front of it. One of the tables was set with a very elaborate Russian zakuska, the Soviet equivalent of a smorgasbord. The Martian hoped he would be able to keep these objects materialized while Farrer ate them, 
but he was afraid they might disappear each time Farrer swallowed them, because the Martian was not very well acquainted with digestive processes of human beings, and did not want to give his guest a violent stomach ache by allowing him to deposit through his esophagus and into his stomach objects of extremely improvised and uncertain chemical makeup. The first truck had a big red flag on it with white Russian letters reading, Welcome to the Heroes of Bryansk. The second truck was even better. The Martian could see that Farrer was very fond of women, so he had materialized four very pretty Soviet girls, a blonde, a brunette, a redhead, and an albino, just to make it interesting. The Martian did not trust himself to make them all speak the correctly feminine and appealing forms of the Russian language, so, having materialized them, he set them all in lounge chairs and put them to sleep. He had wondered what form he himself should take, and decided that it would be very hospitable to assume the appearance of Mao Zedong. Farrer did not come on over the cliff. He stayed where he was. He looked at the Martian, and the Martian said very oilily, Come on up. We are waiting for you. Who the hell are you? barked Farrer. I am a pro-Soviet demon, said the apparent Mr. Mao Zedong, and these are materialized communist hospitality arrangements. I hope you like them. At this point, both Kung Sun and Li appeared. Li climbed up the left side of Farah, Kung Sun on the right. All three stopped, gaping. Kung Sun recovered his wits first. He recognized Mao Zedong. He never passed up a chance to get acquainted with the higher command of the Communist Party. He said in a very weak, strained, incredulous voice, Mr. Party Chairman Mao, I never thought that we would see you here in these hills. Or, are you you? And if you aren't you, who are you? I am not your party chairman, said the Martian. I am merely a local demon who has strong pro-communist sentiments and would like to meet companionable people like yourselves. At this point, Lee fainted and would have rolled back down the cliff, knocking over soldiers and porters, if the Martian had not reached out his left arm, concurrently changing the left arm into the shape of a python, picking up the unconscious Lee and resting his body gently against the side of the picnic trucks. The Soviet sleeping beauties slept on. The python turned back into an arm. Kung Sun's face had turned completely white. Since he was a pale and pleasant ivory color to start with, his whiteness had a very marked tinge. I think this Wang Pa is a counter-revolutionary imposter, he said weakly. But I don't know what to do about him. I am glad that the Chinese People's Republic has a representative from the Soviet Union to instruct us in difficult party procedure. Farrer snapped. If he is a goose, he is a Chinese goose. He is not a Russian goose. You'd better not call him that dirty name. He seems to have some powers that do work. Look at what he did to Lee. The Martian decided to show off his education and said very conciliatorily, If I am a Wang Pa, you are a Wang Pen, he added brightly in the Russian language. That's an ingrate, you know, much worse than an illegitimate one. Do you like my shape, Comrade Farrer? Do you have a cigarette lighter with you? Western science is so wonderful. I can never make very solid things, and you people make airplanes, atom bombs, and all sorts of refreshing entertainments of that kind. Farrer reached into his pocket, groping for his lighter. A scream sounded behind him. One of the Chinese enlisted men had left the stopped column behind and had stuck his head over the edge of the cliff to see what was happening. When he saw the trucks and the figure of Mao Zedong, he began shrieking, there are devils here! There are devils here! From centuries of experience, the Martian knew there was no use trying to get along with the local people unless they were very, very young or very, very old. He walked to the edge of the cliff so that all the men could see him. He expanded the shape of Mao Zedong until it was thirty-five feet high. Then he changed himself into the embodiment of an ancient Chinese god of war, with whiskers, ribbons, and sword tassels blowing in the breeze. They all fainted dead away, as he had intended. He packed them snugly against the rocks, so that none of them would fall back down the slope. Then he took on the shape of a Soviet whack, a rather pretty little blonde with sergeant's insignia, 
and rematerialized himself beside Farrer. By this point, Farrer had his lighter out. The pretty little blonde said to Farrer, Do you like this shape better? Farrer said, I don't believe this at all. I am a militant atheist. I have fought against superstition all my life. Farrer was twenty-four. The Martian said, I don't think you like me being a girl. It bothers you, doesn't it? Since you do not exist, you cannot bother me. But if you don't mind, could you please change your shape again? The Martian took on the appearance of a chubby little Buddha. He knew this was a little impious, but he felt Farrer give a sigh of relief. Even Lee seemed cheered up, now that the Martian had taken on a proper religious form. Listen, you obscene demonic monstrosity, snarled Kung Sun. This is the Chinese People's Republic. You have absolutely no business taking on supernatural images or conducting unatheistic activities. Please abolish yourself and those illusions yonder. What do you want, anyhow? I would like, said the Martian mildly, to become a member of the Chinese Communist Party. Farrer and Kung Sun stared at each other. Then they both spoke at once, Farrer in Russian and Kung Sun in Chinese. But we can't let you in the party. Kung Sun said, If you're a demon, you don't exist. And if you do exist, you're illegal. The Martian smiled. Take some refreshments. You may change your minds. Would you like a girl? He said, pointing at the assorted Russian beauties who still slept in their lounge chairs. But Kung Sun and Farrer shook their heads. With a sigh, the Martian dematerialized the girls and replaced them with three striped Siberian tigers. The tigers approached. One tiger stopped cozily behind the Martian and sat down. The Martian sat on him. Said the Martian brightly, I like tigers to sit on. They're so comfortable. Have a tiger. Farrer and Kung Sun were staring open-mouthed at their respective tigers. The tigers yawned at them and stretched out. With a tremendous effort of will, the two young men sat down on the ground in front of their tigers. Farrer sighed. What do you want? I suppose you won this trick, said the Martian. Have a jug of wine. He materialized a jug of wine and a porcelain cup in front of each, including himself. He poured himself a drink and looked at them through shrewd, narrowed eyes. I would like to learn all about Western science. You see, I am a Martian student who was exiled here to become the 1,387,229th Eastern subordinate incarnation of a Lohan, and I have been here more than 2,000 years and I can only perceive in a radius of ten leagues. Western science is very interesting. If I could, I would like to be an engineering student. But since I cannot leave this place, I would like to join the Communist Party and have many visitors come to see me. By this time, Kung Sun made up his mind. He was a communist, but he was also a Chinese, an aristocratic Chinese and a man well-versed in the folklore of his own country. Kung Sun used a politely archaic form of the Peking court dialect when he spoke again in much milder terms. Honored, esteemed demon, sir, it's just no use at all you're trying to get into the Communist Party. I admit it is very patriotic of you as a Chinese demon to want to join the progressive group which leads the Chinese people in their endless struggle against the vicious American imperialists. Even if you convinced me... I don't think you can convince the party authorities, esteemed sir. The only thing for you to do in our new communist world of the new China is to become a counter-revolutionary refugee and migrate to capitalist territory. The Martian looked hurt and sullen. He frowned at them as he sipped his wine. Behind him, Lee began snoring where he slept against the wheel of a truck. Very persuasively, the Martian began to speak. I see, young man, that you're beginning to believe in me. You don't have to recognize me, just believe in me a little bit. I am happy to see that you, Party Secretary Kung Sun, are prepared to be polite. I am not a Chinese demon, since I was originally a Martian who was elected to the Lesser Assembly of Concord, but who made an inopportune remark and who must live on as the 1,387,229th Eastern subordinate incarnation of a Lohan, 
for three hundred thousand springs and autumns before I can return. I expect to be around a very long time indeed. On the other hand, I would like to study engineering, and I think it would be much better for me to become a member of the Communist Party than to go to a strange place. Farrer had an inspiration, said he to the Martian. I have an idea. Before I explain it, though, would you please take those damned trucks away and remove that zakuska? It makes my mouth water, and I'm very sorry, but I just can't accept your hospitality. The Martian complied with a wave of his hand. The trucks and the tables disappeared. Lee had been leaning against a truck. His head went thump against the grass. He muttered something in his sleep and then resumed his snoring. The Martian turned back to his guests. Farrer picked up the thread of his own thoughts. Leaving aside the question of whether you exist or not, I can assure you that I know the Russian Communist Party, and my colleague, Comrade Kung Sun here, knows the Chinese Communist Party. Communist parties are very wonderful things. They lead the masses in the fight against wicked Americans. Do you realize that if we didn't fight on with the revolutionary struggle, all of us would have to drink Coca-Cola every day? What is Coca-Cola? asked the demon. I don't know, replied Farrer. Then why be afraid to drink any? Don't be irrelevant. I hear that the capitalists make everybody drink it. The Communist Party cannot take time to open up supernatural secretariats. It would spoil irreligious campaigns for us to have a demonic secretary. I can tell you the Russian Communist Party won't put up with it, and our friend here will tell you there is no place in the Chinese Communist Party. We want you to be happy. You seem to be a very friendly demon. Why don't you just go away? The capitalists will welcome you. They are very reactionary and very religious. You might even find people there who would believe in you. The Martian changed his shape from that of a roly-poly Buddha and assumed the appearance and dress of a young Chinese man, a student of engineering at the University of the Revolution in Peking. In the shape of the student, he continued, I don't want to be believed in. I want to study engineering, and I want to learn all about Western science. Kung Sun came to Farrer's support. He said, it's just no use trying to be a communist engineer. You look like a very absent-minded demon to me, and I think that even if you tried to pass yourself off as a human being, you would keep forgetting and changing shapes. That would ruin the morale of any class. The Martian thought to himself that the young man had a point there. He hated keeping any one particular shape for more than half an hour. Staying in one bodily form made him itch. He also liked to change sexes every few times. It seemed sort of refreshing. He did not admit to the young man that Kung Sun had scored a point with that remark about shape-changing, but he nodded amiably at them and asked, But how could I get abroad? Just go, said Kung Sun wearily. Just go. You're a demon. You can do anything. I can't do that, snapped the student Martian. I have to have something to go by. He turned to Farrer. It won't do any good. You're giving me something. If you gave me something Russian, and I would end up in Russia, from what you say, they won't want to have a communist Martian any more than these Chinese people do. I won't like to leave my beautiful lake anyhow, but I suppose I will have to if I am to get acquainted with Western science. Farrer said, I have an idea. He took off his wristwatch and handed it to the Martian. The Martian inspected it. Many years before, the watch had been manufactured in the United States of America. It had been traded by a G.I. to a Fräulein, by the Fräulein's grandmother to a Red Army man for three sacks of potatoes, and by the Red Army man for five hundred rubles to Farrer when the two of them met in Kuibyshev. The numbers were painted with radium, as were the hands. The second hand was missing, so the Martian materialized a new one. He changed the shape of it several times before it fitted. On the watch, there was written in English, Marvin Watch Company. At the bottom of the face of the watch, there was the name of a town, Waterbury Khan. The Martian read it. Said he to Farrer, Where is this place, Waterbury Khan? The Khan is the short form of the name of one of the American states. If you are going to be a reactionary capitalist, that is a very good place to be a capitalist in. 
Still white-faced, but in a sickly, ingratiating way, Kung Sun added his bit. I think you would like Coca-Cola. It's very reactionary. The student Martian frowned. He still held the watch in his hand. Said he, I don't care whether it's reactionary or not. I want to be in a very scientific place. Fowler said, You couldn't go any place more scientific than Waterbury Con. Especially Con. That's the most scientific place they have in America. And I'm sure they are very pro-Martian, and you can join one of the capitalist parties. They won't mind, but the communist parties would make a lot of trouble for you. Farr smiled and his eyes lit up. Furthermore, he added, as a winning point, you can keep my watch for yourself, for always. The Martian frowned. Speaking to himself, the student Martian said, I can see that Chinese communism is going to collapse in eight years, eight hundred years, or eighty thousand years. Perhaps I'd better go to this Waterbury Con. The two young communists nodded their heads vigorously and grinned. They both smiled at the Martian. Honored, esteemed Martian, sir, please hurry along because I want to get my men over the edge of the cliff before darkness falls. Go with our blessing. The Martian changed shape. He took on the image of an arhat, a subordinate disciple of Buddha. Eight feet tall, he loomed above them. His face radiated unearthly calm. The watch, miraculously provided with a new strap, was firmly strapped to his left wrist. Bless you, my boys said he. I go to Waterbury. And he did. Farrer stared at Kung Sun. What's happened to Lee? Kung Sun shook his head dazedly. I don't know. I feel funny. In departing for that marvelous strange place, Waterbury Khan, the Martian had taken with him all their memories of himself. Kung Sun walked to the edge of the cliff. Looking over, he saw the men sleeping. Look at that, he muttered. He stepped to the edge of the cliff and began shouting, Wake up, you fools! You turtles! Haven't you any more sense than to sleep on a cliff as nightfall approaches? The Martian concentrated all his powers on the location of Waterbury Con. He was the 1,387,229th eastern subordinate incarnation of a Lohan, or an Arhat, and his powers were limited, impressive though they might seem to outsiders. With a shock, a thrill, a something of breaking, a sense of things done and undone, he found himself in flat country. Strange darkness surrounded him. Air, which he had never smelled before, flowed quietly around him. Farer and Li, hanging on a cliff high above the Qin Sha Chiang, lay far behind him in the world from which he had broken. He remembered that he had left his shape behind. Absent-mindedly, he glanced down at himself to see what form he had taken for the trip. He discovered that he had arrived in the form of a small, laughing Buddha, seven inches high, carved in yellowed ivory. This will never do, muttered the Martian to himself. I must take on one of the local forms. He sensed around in his environment, groping telepathically for interesting objects near him. Aha! A milk truck! Thought he, Western science is indeed very wonderful. Imagine a machine made purely for the purpose of transporting milk. Swiftly, he transferred himself into a milk truck. In the darkness, his telepathic senses had not distinguished the metal of which the milk truck was made, nor the color of the paint. In order to remain inconspicuous, he turned himself into a milk truck made of solid gold. Then, without a driver, he started up his own engine and began driving himself down one of the main highways leading into Waterbury, Connecticut. So if you happen to be passing through Waterbury Con and see a solid gold milk truck driving itself through the streets, you'll know it's the Martian. Otherwise, the 1,387,229th Eastern subordinate incarnation of a Lohan, and that he still thinks Western science is wonderful. Nancy. Two men faced Gordon Green as he came into the room. The young aide was a non-entity. The general was not. The commanding general sat where he should, at his own desk. It was placed squarely in the room, and yet the infinite courtesy of the general was shown by the fact that the blinds were so drawn that the light did not fall directly into the eyes of the person interviewed. 
At that time, the Colonel General was Wenzel Wallenstein, the first man ever to venture into the very deep remoteness of space. He had not reached a star. Nobody had at that time, but he had gone farther than any man had ever gone before. Wallenstein was an old man, and yet the count of his years was not high. He was less than ninety in a period in which many men lived to one hundred and fifty. The thing that made Wallenstein look old was the suffering which came from mental strain, not the kind which came from anxiety and competition, not the kind which came from ill health. It was a subtler kind, a sensitivity which created its own painfulness. Yet it was real. Wallenstein was as stable as men came, and the young lieutenant was astonished to find that at his first meeting with the commander-in-chief his instinctive emotional reaction should be one of quick sympathy for the man who commanded the entire organization. Your name? The lieutenant answered, Gordon Green. Born that way? No, sir. What was your name originally? Giordano Verdi. Why did you change? Verdi is a great name, too. People just found it hard to pronounce, sir. I followed along the best I could. I kept my name, said the old general, and I suppose it is a matter of taste. The young lieutenant lifted his hand, left hand, palm outward, in the new salute, which had been devised by the psychologists. He knew that this meant military courtesy could be passed by for the moment, and that the subordinate officer was requesting permission to speak as man to man. He knew the salute, and yet, in these surroundings, he did not altogether trust it. The general's response was quick. He countersigned, left hand, palm outward. The heavy, tired, wise, strained old face showed no change of expression. The general was alert, mechanically friendly. His eyes followed the lieutenant's. The lieutenant was sure that there was nothing behind those eyes, except world upon world of inward troubles. The lieutenant spoke again, this time on confident ground. Is this a special interview, General? Do you have something in mind for me? If it is, sir, let me warn you. I have been declared to be psychologically unstable. Personnel doesn't often make a mistake, but they may have sent me in here under error. The general smiled. The smile itself was mechanical. It was a control of muscles, not a quick spring of human emotion. You will know well enough what I have in mind when we talk together, Lieutenant. I am going to have another man sit with me, and it will give you some idea of what your life is leading you toward. You know perfectly well that you have asked for deep space, and that so far as I am concerned, you've gotten it. The question is now, do you really want it? Do you want to take it? Is that all that you wanted to abridge courtesy for? Yes, sir, said the lieutenant. You didn't have to call for the courtesy sign for that kind of a question. You could have asked me even within the limits of service. Let's not get too psychological. We don't need to, do we? Again, the general gave the lieutenant a heavy smile. Wallenstein gestured to the aide, who sprang to attention. Wallenstein said, Send him in. The aide said, Yes, sir. The two men waited expectantly. With a springy, lively, quick, happy step, a strange lieutenant entered the room. Gordon Green had never seen anybody quite like this lieutenant. The lieutenant was old, almost as old as the general. His face was cheerful and unlined. The muscles of his cheeks and forehead bespoke happiness, relaxation, an assured view of life. The lieutenant wore the three highest decorations of his service. There weren't any others higher, and yet there he was— an old man and still a lieutenant. Lieutenant Green couldn't understand it. He didn't know who this man was. It was easy enough for a young man to be a lieutenant, but not for a man in his seventies or eighties. People that age were colonels, or retired, or out. Or they had gone back to civilian life. Space was a young man's game. The general himself arose in courtesy to his contemporary. Lieutenant Green's eyes widened. This, too, was odd. The general was not known to violate courtesy at all irregularly. Sit down, sir, said the strange old lieutenant. The general sat. What do you want with me now? Do you want to talk about the Nancy routine one more time? The Nancy routine? asked the general blindly. Yes, sir. It's the same story I've told these youngsters before. You've heard it and I've heard it. There's no use of pretending. The strange lieutenant said, my name's Carl von der Leyen. 
Have you ever heard of me? No, sir, said the young lieutenant. The old lieutenant said, You will. Don't get bitter about it, Carl, said the general. A lot of other people have had troubles besides you. I went and did the same things you did, and I'm a general. You might at least pay me the courtesy of envying me. I don't envy you, general. You've had your life, and I've had mine. You know what you've missed, or you think you do, and I know what I've had, and I'm sure I do. The old lieutenant paid no more attention to the commander-in-chief. He turned to the young man and said, You're going to go out into space, and we are putting on a little act, a vaudeville act. The general didn't get any Nancy. He didn't ask for Nancy. He didn't turn for help. He got out into the up and out. He pulled through it. Three years of it. Three years that are closer to three million years, I suppose. He went through hell, and he came back. Look at his face. He's a success. He's an utter blasted success, sitting there worn out, tired, and it would seem hurt. Look at me. Look at me carefully, Lieutenant. I'm a failure. I'm a lieutenant, and the Space Service keeps me that way. The Commander-in-Chief said nothing, so von der Leyen talked on. Oh, they will retire me as a general, I suppose, when the time comes. I'm not ready to retire. I'd just as soon stay in the Space Service as anything else. There is not much to do in this world. I've had it. Had what, sir? Lieutenant Green dared to ask. I found Nancy. He didn't, he said. That's as simple as it is. The general cut back into the conversation. It's not that bad, and it's not that simple, Lieutenant Green. There seems to be something a little wrong with Lieutenant von der Leyen today. The story is one we have to tell you, and it is something you have to make up your mind on. There is no regulation way of handling it. The general looked very sharply at Lieutenant Green. Do you know what we have done to your brain? No, sir. Green felt uneasiness rising in him. Have you heard of the Sokta virus? The what, sir? The Sokta virus. Sokta is an ancient word. Gets its name from Chosan Mal, the language of old Korea. That was a country west of where Japan used to be. It means maybe. And it is a maybe that we put inside your head. It is a tiny crystal, more than microscopic. It's there. There is actually a machine on the ship... Not a big one, because we can't waste space. It has resonance to detonate the virus. If you detonate Sokta, you will be like him. If you don't, you will be like me, assuming in either case that you live. You may not live, and you may not get back, in which case what we are talking about is academic. The young man nerved himself to ask, What does this do to me? Why do you make this big fuss over it? We can't tell you too much. One reason is it is not worth talking about. You mean you really can't, sir? The general shook his head sadly and wisely. No, I missed it. He got it, and yet it somehow gets out beyond the limits of talking. At this point, while he was telling the story many years later, I asked my cousin, Well, Gordon, if they said you can't talk about it, how can you? Drunk, man, drunk, said the cousin. How long do you think it took me to wind myself up to this point? I'll never tell it again. Never again. Anyhow, you're my cousin. You don't count. And I promised Nancy I wouldn't tell anybody. Who's Nancy? I asked him. Nancy's what it's all about. That is what the story is. That's what those poor old goops were trying to tell me in the office. They didn't know. One of them, he had Nancy. The other one, he hadn't. Is Nancy a real person? With that, he told me the rest of the story. The interview was harsh. It was clean, stark, simple, direct. The alternatives were flat. It was perfectly plain that Wallenstein wanted Green to come back alive. It was actual Space Command policy to bring the man back as a live failure instead of letting him become a dead hero. Pilots were not that common. Furthermore, morale would be worsened if men were told to go out on suicide operations. The whole thing was psychological, and before Green got out of the room, he was more confused than when he went in. They kept telling them, both of them in their different ways, 
the general happily, the old lieutenant unhappily, that this was serious. The grim old general was very cheerful about telling him. The happy lieutenant kept being very sympathetic. Green himself wondered why he could be so sympathetic toward the commanding general and be so perfectly carefree about a failed old lieutenant. His sympathies should have been the other way around. Fifteen hundred million miles later, four months later in ordinary time, four lifetimes later by the time which he'd gone through, Green found out what they were talking about. It was an old psychological teaching. The men died if they were left utterly alone. The ships were designed to be protected against that. There were two men on each ship. Each ship had a lot of tapes, even a few quite unnecessary animals. In this case, a pair of hamsters had been included on the ship. They had been sterilized, of course, to avoid the problem of feeding the young, but nevertheless they made a little family of their own in a miniature of life's happiness on Earth. Earth was very far away. At that point, his co-pilot died. Everything that had threatened Green then came true. Green suddenly realized what they were talking about. The hamsters were his one hope. He thrust his face close to their cage and talked to them. He attributed moods to them. He tried to live their lives with them, all as if they were people. As if he himself were a part of people still alive and not out there with the screaming silence beyond the thin wall of metal. There was nothing to do except to roam like a caged animal in machinery, which he would never understand. Time lost its perspectives. He knew he was crazy, and he knew that by training he could survive the partial craziness. He even realized that the instability in his own personality, which had made him think that he wouldn't fit the space service, probably contributed to the hope that went in with service to this point. His mind kept coming back to Nancy, and to the Sokta virus. What was it they had said? They had told him that he could waken Nancy, whoever Nancy was. Nancy was no pet name of his, and yet somehow or other the virus always worked. He only needed to move his head toward a certain point, press the resonating stud on the wall, one pressure, his mission would fall. He would be happy. He would come home alive. He couldn't understand it. Why such a choice? It seemed three thousand years later that he dictated his last message back to space service. He didn't know what would happen. Obviously, that old lieutenant, von der Leyen, or whatever his name was, was still alive. Equally obviously, the general was alive. The general had pulled through. The lieutenant hadn't. And now, Lieutenant Green, fifteen hundred million miles out in space, had to make his choice. He made it. He decided to fail. But he wanted, as a matter of discipline, to speak up for the man who was failing, and he dictated for the records of the ship when it got back to Earth a very simple message, concluding with an appeal for justice. And so, gentlemen, I have decided to activate the stud. I do not know what the reference to Nancy signifies. I have no concept of what the Sokta virus will do, except that it will make me fail. For this I am heartily ashamed. I regret the human weakness that has driven me to this. The weakness is human, and you, gentlemen, have allowed for it. In this respect, it is not I who is failing, but the space service itself, in giving me an authorization to fail. Gentlemen, forgive the bitterness with which I say goodbye to you in these seconds, but now I do say goodbye. He stopped dictating, blinked his eyes, took one last look at the hamsters. What might they be by the time the Sokta virus went to work? Pressed the stud and leaned forward. Nothing happened. He pressed the stud again. The ship suddenly filled with a strange odor. He couldn't identify the odor. He didn't know what it was. It suddenly came to him that this was new-mown hay, with a slight tinge of geraniums, possibly of roses, too, on the far side. It was a smell that was common on the farm a few years ago, where he had gone for a summer. It was the smell of his mother being on the porch and calling him back to a meal, and of himself, enough of a man to be indulgent even toward the woman in his own mother, enough of a child to turn happily back to a familiar voice. 
he said to himself, If this is all there is to that virus, I can take it and work on with continued efficiency. He added, At fifteen hundred million miles out and nothing but two hamsters for years of loneliness, a few hallucinations won't hurt me any. The door opened. It couldn't open. The door opened nevertheless. At this point, Green knew a fear more terrible than anything else he had ever encountered. He said to himself, I'm crazy, I'm crazy, and stared at the opening door. A girl stepped in. She said, Hello, you there. You know me, don't you? Green said, No, no, miss. Who are you? The girl didn't answer. She just stood there and she gave him a smile. She wore a blue serge skirt, cut so that it had broad vertical stripes, a neat little waist, a belt of the same material, a very simple blouse. She was not a strange girl, and she was by no means a creature of outer space. She was somebody he had known and known well, perhaps loved. He just couldn't place her. Not at that moment, not in that place. She still stood staring at him. That was all. It all came to him. Of course. She was Nancy. She was not just that Nancy they were talking about. She was his Nancy. His own Nancy he had always known and never met before. He managed to pull himself together and say it to her. How do I know you if I don't know you? You're Nancy, and I've known you all my life, and I have always wanted to marry you. You are the girl I have always been in love with, and I never saw you before. That's funny, Nancy. It's terribly funny. I don't understand it. Do you? Nancy came over and put her hand on his forehead. It was a real little hand, and her presence was dear and precious and very welcome to him. She said, It's going to take a bit of thinking. You see, I am not real. Not to anybody except you. And yet I am more real to you than anything else will ever be. That is what the Sokta virus is, darling. It's me. I'm you. He stared at her. He could have been unhappy, but he didn't feel unhappy. He was so glad to have her there. He said, What do you mean the Sokta virus has made you? Am I crazy? Is this just a hallucination? Nancy shook her head, and her pretty curls spun. It's not that. I'm simply every girl that you ever wanted. I am the illusion that you always wanted, but I am you because I am in the depths of you. I am everything that your mind might not have encountered in life, everything that you might have been afraid to dig up. Here I am, and I'm going to stay. And as long as we are here in this ship with the resonance, we will get along well. My cousin at this point began weeping. He picked up a wine flask and poured down a big glass of heavy dago red. For a while he cried. Putting his head on the table, he looked up at me and said, It's been a long, long time. It's been a very long time, and I still remember how she talked with me. And I see now why they say you can't talk about it. A man has got to be fearfully drunk to tell about a real life that he had, and a good one, and a beautiful one, and let it go, doesn't he? That's right, I said, to be encouraging. Nancy changed the ship right away. She moved the hamsters. She changed the decorations. She checked the records. The work went on more efficiently than ever before. But the home they made for themselves, that was something different. It had baking smells, then it had wind smells, and sometimes he would hear the rain, although the nearest rain by now was 1,600 million miles away. And there was nothing but the grating of cold silence on the cold, cold metal at the outside of the ship. They lived together. It didn't take long for them to get thoroughly used to each other. He had been born Giordano Verdi. He had limitations and the time came for them to get even more close than lover and lover, he said, I just can't take you, darling. That is not the way we can do it, even in space, and not the way, even if you are not real. You are real enough to me. Will you marry me out of the prayer book? Her eyes lit up, 
and her incomparable lips gleamed in a smile that was all peculiarly her own. She said, Of course. She flung her arms around him. He ran his fingers over the bones of her shoulder. He felt her ribs. He felt the individual strands of her hair brushing his cheeks. This was real. This was more real than life itself. Yet some fool had told him that it was a virus, that Nancy didn't exist. If this wasn't Nancy, what was it, he thought. He put her down, and, alive with love and happiness, he read the prayer book. He asked her to make the responses. He said, I suppose I'm captain, and I suppose I have married you and me, haven't I, Nancy? The marriage went well. The ship followed an immense perimeter like that of a comet. It went far out, so far that the sun became a remote dot. The interference of the solar system had virtually no effect on the instruments. Nancy came to him one day and said, I suppose you know why you are a failure now. No, he said. She looked at him gravely. She said, I think with your mind. I live in your body. If you die while on this ship, I die too. Yet as long as you live, I am alive and separate. That's funny, isn't it? Funny, he said, an old, new pain growing in his heart. And yet I can tell you something which I know with that part of your mind I use. I know without you that I am. I suppose I recognize your technical training and feel it somehow, even though I don't feel the lack of it. I had the education you thought I had, and you wanted me to have. But do you see what's happening? We are working with our brain at almost half power instead of one-tenth power. All your imagination is going into making me. All your extra thoughts are of me. I want them just as I want you to love me, but there are none left over for emergencies, and there is nothing left over for the space service. You are doing the minimum, that's all. Am I worth it? Of course you are worth it, darling. You're worth anything that any man could ask of the sweetheart, and of love, and of a wife, and a true companion. But don't you see? I am taking all the best of you. You are putting it into me, and when the ship comes home, there won't be any me. In a strange way, he realized that the drug was working. He could see what was happening to himself as he looked at his well-beloved Nancy with her shimmering hair, and he realized the hair needed no prettying or hairdos. He looked at her clothes, and he realized that she wore clothes for which there was no space on the ship. And yet she changed them, delightfully, winsomely, attractively, day in and day out. He ate the food that he knew couldn't be on the ship. None of this worried him. And now he couldn't even be worried at the thought of losing Nancy herself. Any other thought he could have rejected from his subconscious mind and could have surrendered to the idea that it was not a hallucination after all. Editor's Note In the version published in Satellite Science Fiction, the story ended at this point. End of Editor's Note This was too much. He ran his fingers through her hair. He said, I know I'm crazy, darling, and I know that you don't exist. But I do exist. I am you. I am a part of Gordon Green as surely as if I'd married you. I'll never die until you do, because when you get home, darling, I'll drop back, back into your deeper mind, but I'll live in your mind as long as you live. You can't lose me, and I can't leave you, and you can't forget me, and I can't escape to anyone except through your lips. That's why they talk about it. That's why it is such a strange thing. And that's where I know I'm wrong, stubbornly insisted Gordon. I love you, and I know you are a phantom, and I know you are going away. And I know we are coming to an end, and it doesn't worry me. I'll be happy just being with you. I don't need a drink. I wouldn't touch a drug. Yet the happiness is here. They went about their little domestic chores. They checked his graph paper. They stored the records. They put a few silly things into the permanent ship's record. They then toasted marshmallows before a large fire. The fire was in a handsome fireplace which did not exist. The flames couldn't have burned, but they did. There weren't any marshmallows on the ship, 
but they toasted them and enjoyed them anyhow. That's the way their life went, full of magic, and yet the magic had no sting or provocation to it, no anger, no hopelessness, no despair. They were a very happy couple. Even the hamsters felt it. They stayed clean and plump. They ate their food willingly. They got over space nausea. They peered at him. He let one of them, the one with the brown nose, out and let it run around the room. He said, You're a real army character, you poor thing, born for space and serving out here in it. Only one other time did Nancy take up the question of their future. She said, We can't have children, you know. The Sokta drug doesn't allow for that. And you may have children yourself, but it is going to be funny having them if you marry somebody else with me always there, just in the background. And I will be there. They made it back to Earth. They returned. As he stepped out of the gate, a harsh, weary medical colonel gave him one sharp glance. He said, Oh, we thought that had happened. What, sir? said a plump and radiant Lieutenant Green. You got Nancy, said the colonel. Yes, sir. I'll bring her right out. Go get her, said the colonel. Green went back into the rocket and he looked. There was no sign of Nancy. He came to the door astonished. He was still not upset. He said, Colonel, I don't seem to see her there, but I'm sure that she's somewhere around. The colonel gave him a strange, sympathetic, fatigued smile. She always will be somewhere around, Lieutenant. You've done the minimum job. I don't know whether we ought to discourage people like you. I suppose you realize that you are frozen in your present grade. You'll get a decoration, mission accomplished. Mission successful, farther than anybody has gone before. Incidentally, von der Leyen says he knows you and will be waiting over yonder. We have to take you into the hospital to make sure that you don't go into shock. At the hospital, said my cousin, there was no shock. He didn't even miss Nancy. How could he miss her when she hadn't left? She was always just around the corner, just behind the door, just a few minutes away. At breakfast time, he knew he'd see her for lunch. At lunch, he knew she'd drop by in the afternoon. At the end of the afternoon, he knew he'd have dinner with her. He knew he was crazy, crazy as he could be. He knew perfectly well that there was no Nancy, and never had been. He supposed that he ought to hate the soaked drug for doing that to him, but it brought its own relief. The effect of Nancy was an immolation in perpetual hope, the promise of something that could never be lost, and a promise of something that cannot be lost is often better than a reality which can be lost. That's all there was to it. They asked him to testify against the use of the Sokta drug, and he said, Me? Give up Nancy? Don't be silly. You haven't got her, said somebody. That's what you think, said my cousin, Lieutenant Green. The Fife of Bodhidharma Music, said Confucius, awakens the mind, propriety finishes it, melody completes it. The Lun Yu, Book 8, Chapter 8 1. It was perhaps in the second period of the Proto-Indian Harappa culture, perhaps earlier in the very dawn of metal, that a goldsmith accidentally found a formula to make a magical fife. To him, the fife became death or bliss, an avenue to choosable salvations or dooms. Among later men, the fife might be recognized as a chancy prediscovery of psionic powers with sonic triggering. Whatever it was, it worked. Long before the Buddha, long-haired Dravidian priests learned that it worked. Cast mostly in gold, despite the goldsmith's care with the speculum alloy, the fife emitted shrill whistlings, but it also transmitted supersonic vibrations in a narrow range, narrow and intense enough a range to rearrange synapses in the brain and to modify the basic emotions of the hearer. The goldsmith did not long survive his instrument. They found him dead. The fife became the property of priests. After a short, terrible period of use and abuse, it was buried in the tomb of a great king.
two. Robbers found the fife, tried it, and died. Some died amid bliss, some amid hate, others in a frenzy of fear and delusion. A strong survivor, trembling after the ordeal of inexpressibly awakened sensations and emotions, wrapped the fife in a page of holy writing and presented it to Bodhidharma, the Blessed One, just before Bodhidharma began his unbelievably arduous voyage from India across the ranges of the spines of the world over to far Cathay. Bodhidharma, the Blessed One, the man who had seen Persia, the Aged One bringing wisdom, came across the highest of all mountains in the year that the Northern Wei Dynasty of China moved their capital out of divine Luoyang. Elsewhere in the world, where men reckoned the years from the birth of their Lord Jesus Christ, the year was counted as Anno Domini 554. But in the high land between India and China, the message of Christianity had not yet arrived, and the word of the Lord Gautama Buddha was still the sweetest gospel to reach the ears of men. Bodhidharma, clad by only a thin robe, climbed across the glaciers. For food, he drank the air, spicing it with prayer. Cold winds cut his old skin, his tired bones. For a cloak, he drew his sanctity about him, and bore within his indomitable heart the knowledge that the pure, unspoiled message of the Lord Gautama Buddha had, by the will of time and chance themselves, to be carried from the Indian world to the Chinese. Once beyond the peaks and passes, he descended into the cold frigidity of high desert. Sand cut his feet, but the skin did not bleed because he was shod in sacred spells and magical charms. At last, animals approached. They came in the ugliness of their sin, ignorance, and shame. Beasts they were, but more than beasts. They were the souls of the wicked, condemned to endless rebirth now incorporated in vile forms because of the wickedness with which they had once rejected the teachings of eternity and the wisdom which lay before them as plainly as the trees or the nighttime heavens. The more vicious the man, the more ugly the beast. This was the rule. Here in the desert, the beasts were very ugly. Bodhidharma, the Blessed One, shrank back. He did not desire to use the weapon. Oh, forever, Blessed One, seated in the lotus flower, Buddha, help me! Within his heart he felt no response. The sinfulness and wickedness of these beasts was such that even the Buddha had turned his face gently aside and would offer no protection to his messenger, the missionary Bodhidharma. Reluctantly, Bodhidharma took out his fife. The fife was a dainty weapon, twice the length of a man's finger. Golden in strange, almost ugly forms, it hinted at a civilization which no one living in India now remembered. The fife had come out of the early beginnings of mankind, had ridden across a mass of ages, a legion of years, and survived as a testimony to the power of early men. At the end of the fife was a little whistle. Four touch holes gave the fife pitches and a wide variety of combinations of notes. Blown once, the fife called to holiness. This occurred if all stops were closed. Blown twice with all stops opened, the fife carried its own power. This power was strange indeed. It magnified every chance emotion of each living thing within range of its sound. Bodhidharma, the Blessed One, had carried the fife because it comforted him. Closed, its notes reminded him of the sacred message of the three treasures of the Buddha, which he carried from India to China. Opened, its notes brought bliss to the innocent and their own punishment to the wicked. Innocence and wickedness were not determined by the fife, but by the hearers themselves, whoever they might be. The trees, which heard these notes in their own tree-like way, struck even more mightily into the earth, and up to the sky reaching for nourishment with new but dim and tree-like hope. Tigers became more tigerish, frogs more froggy, men more good or bad as their characters might dispose them. Stop! called Bodhidharma, the Blessed One, to the beasts. Tiger and wolf, fox and jackal, snake and spider, they advanced. Stop! he called again. Hoof and claw, sting and tooth, eyes alive, they advanced. Stop! he called for the third time. Still they advanced. He blew the fife wide open, twice, clear and loud. Twice clear and loud. The animals stopped. At the second note, 
They began to thresh about, imprisoned even more deeply by the bestiality of their own natures. The tiger snarled at his own front paws. The wolf snapped at his own tail. The jackal ran fearfully from his own shadow. The spider hid beneath the darkness of rocks. And the other vile beasts who had threatened the Blessed One let him pass. Bodhidharma the Blessed One went on. In the streets of the new capital at Anyang, the gentle gospel of Buddhism was received with curiosity, with calm, and with delight. Those voluptuous barbarians, the Toba Tartars, who had made themselves masters of North China, now filled their hearts and souls with the hope of death instead of the fear of destruction. Mothers wept with pleasure to know that their children, dying, had been received into blessedness. The emperor himself laid aside his sword in order to listen to the gentle message that had come so bravely over illimitable mountains. When Bodhidharma the Blessed One died, he was buried in the outskirts of Anyang, his fife in a sacred onyx case beside his right hand. There he and it both slept for thirteen hundred and forty years. 3. In the year 1894, a German explorer, so he fancied himself to be, looted the tomb of the Blessed One in the name of science. Villagers caught him in the act and drove him from the hillside. He escaped with only one piece of loot, an onyx case with a strange copper-like fife. Copper it seemed to be, although the metal was not as corroded as actual copper should have been after so long a burial in intermittently moist country. The fife was filthy. He cleaned it enough to see that it was fragile and to reveal the un-Chinese character of the declarations along its side. He did not clean it enough to try blowing it. He lived because of that. The fife was presented to a small municipal museum named in honor of a German Grand Duchess. It occupied case number 34 of the Doroteum and lay there for another 51 years. 4. The B-29s had gone. They had roared off in the direction of Rastatt. Wolfgang Hörner climbed out of the ditch. He hated himself, he hated the Allies, and he almost hated Hitler. A Hitler youth, he was handsome, blonde, tall, craggy. He was also brave, sharp, cruel, and clever. He was a Nazi. Only in a Nazi world could he hope to exist. His parents, he knew, were soft rubbish. When his father had been killed in a bombing, Wolfgang did not mind. When his mother, half-starved, died of influenza, he did not worry about her. She was old and did not matter. Germany mattered. Now the Germany which mattered to him was coming apart, ripped by explosions, punctured by shockwaves, and fractured by the endless assault of Allied air power. Wolfgang, as a young Nazi, did not know fear, but he did know bewilderment. In an animal, instinctive way, he knew, without thinking about it, that if Hitlerism did not survive, he himself would not survive either. He even knew that he was doing his best, what little best there was still left to do. He was looking for spies while reporting the weak-hearted ones who complained against the Führer or the war. He was helping to organize the Volkssturm, and he had hopes of becoming a Nazi guerrilla, even if the Allies did cross the Rhine. Like an animal but like a very intelligent animal, he knew he had to fight, while at the same time he realized that the fight might go against him. He stood in the street watching the dust settle after the bombing. The moonlight was clear on the broken pavement. This was a quiet part of the city. He could hear the fires downtown making a crunching sound, like the familiar noise of his father eating lettuce. Near himself he could hear nothing. He seemed to be all alone, under the moon, in a tiny forgotten corner of the world. He looked around. His eyes widened in astonishment. The Doroteum Museum had been blasted open. Idly, he walked over to the ruin. He stood in the dark doorway. Looking back at the street and then up at the sky to make sure that it was safe to show a light, he then flashed on his pocket electric light and cast the beam around the display room. Cases were broken. In most of them, glass had fallen in on the exhibits. Window glass looked like puddles of ice in the cold moonlight as it lay broken on the old stone floors. 
Immediately in front of him, a display case sagged crazily. He cast his flashlight beam on it. The light picked up a short tube which looked something like the barrel of an antique pistol. Wolfgang reached for the tube. He had played in a band and he knew what it was. It was a fife. He held it in his hand a moment and then stuck it in his jacket. He cast the beam of his light once more around the museum and then went out in the street. It was no use letting the police argue. He could now hear the laboring engines of trucks as they coughed, sputtering with their poor fuel, climbing up the hill toward him. He put his light in his pocket. Feeling the fife, he took it out. Instinctively, the way that any human being would, he put his fingers over all four of the touch holes before he began to blow. The fife was stopped up. He applied force. He blew hard. The fife sounded. A sweet note, golden beyond imagination, softer and wilder than the most thrilling notes of the finest symphony in the world, sounded in his ears. He felt different, relieved, happy. His soul, which he did not know he had, achieved a condition of peace which he had never before experienced. In that moment, a small religion was born. It was a small religion because it was confined to the mind of a single brutal adolescent. But it was a true religion, nevertheless, because it had the complete message of hope, comfort, and fulfillment of an order beyond the limits of this life. Love, and the tremendous meaning of love, poured through his mind. Love relaxed the muscles of his back and even let his aching eyelids drop over his eyes in the first honest fatigue he had admitted for many weeks. The Nazi in him had been drained off. The call to holiness, trapped in the forgotten magic of Bodhidharma's fife, had sounded even to him. Then he made his mistake, a mortal one. The fife had no more malice than a gun before it is fired, no more hate than a river before it swallows a human body, no more anger than a height from which a man may slip. The fife had its own power, partly in sound itself, but mostly in the mechanocyonic linkage which the unusual alloy and shape had given the Harappa goldsmith forgotten centuries before. Wolfgang Hörne blew again, holding the fife between two fingers, with none of the stops closed. This time the note was wild. In a terrible and wholly convincing moment of vision, he reincarnated in himself all the false resolutions, the venomous patriotism, the poisonous bravery of Hitler's Reich. He was once again the Hitler youth, consummately a Nordic man. His eyes gleamed with a message he felt pouring out of himself. He blew again. This third note was the perfecting note the note which had protected Bodhidharma the Blessed One fifteen hundred and fifty years before in the frozen desert north of Tibet. Hörner became even more Nazi. No longer the boy, no longer the human being. He was the magnification of himself. He became all fighter. But he had forgotten who he was or what it was that he was fighting for. The blacked-out trucks came up the hill. His blind eyes looked at them. Fife in hand, he snarled at them. A crazy thought went through his mind. Allied tanks! He ran wildly toward the leading truck. The driver did not see more than a shadow and jammed on the brakes too late. The front bumper burst a soft obstruction. The front wheel covered the body of the boy. When the truck stopped, the boy was dead, and the fife, half crushed, was pressed against the rock of a German road. 5. Hagen von Gruen was one of the German rocket scientists who worked at Huntsville, Alabama. He had gone on down to Cape Canaveral to take part in the fifth series of American launchings. This included, in the third shot of the series, a radio transmitter designed to hit standard wave radios immediately beneath the satellite. The purpose was to allow ordinary listeners throughout the world to take part in the tracking of the satellite. This particular satellite was designed to have a relatively short life. With good luck, it would last as long as five weeks, not longer. The miniaturized transmitter was designed to pick up the sounds, minute though they might be, produced by the heating and cooling of the shell, and to transmit a sound pattern reflecting the heat of cosmic rays, 
and also, to a certain degree, to relay the visual images in terms of a sound pattern. Hagen von Gruen was present at the final assembly. A small part of the assembly consisted of inserting a tube, which would serve the double function of a resonating chamber between the outer skin of the satellite and a tiny microphone, half the size of a sweet pea, which would then translate the sound made by the outer shell into radio signals, which amateurs on the Earth's surface 1,500 miles below could follow. Von Gruen no longer smoked. He had stopped smoking that fearful night in which Allied planes bombed the truck convoy, carrying his colleagues and himself to safety. Though he had managed to scrounge cigarettes throughout the war, he had even given up carrying his cigarette holder. He carried instead an odd old copper fife he had found in the highway and had put back into shape. Superstitious at his luck in living and grateful that the fife reminded him not to smoke, he never bothered to clear it out and blow it. He had weighed it, found its specific gravity, measured it, like the good German that he was, down to the last millimeter and milligram, but he kept it in his pocket, though it was a little clumsy to carry. Just as they put the last part of the nose cone together, the strut broke. It could not break, but it did. It would have taken five minutes and a ride down the elevator to find a new tube to serve as a strut. Acting on an odd impulse, Hagen von Gruen remembered that his lucky fife was within a millimeter of the length required and was of precisely the right diameter. The holes did not matter. He picked up a file, filed the old fife, and inserted it. They closed the skin of the satellite. They sealed the cone. Seven hours later, the message rocket took off, the first one capable of reaching every standard wave radio on Earth. As Hagen von Gruen watched the great rocket climb, he wondered to himself, does it make any difference whether those stops were opened or closed? Angerhelm Funny, funny, funny. It's sort of funny, funny, funny to think without a brain. It is really something like a trick, but not a trick to think without a brain. Talking is even harder, but it can be done. I still remember the way that phrase came ringing through when we finally got hold of old Nelson Angerhelm and sat him down with the buzzing tape. The story began a long time before that. I never knew the beginnings. My job is an assistant to Mr. Spatz, and Spatz has been shooting holes in budgets now for 18 years. He is the man who approves, on behalf of the director of the budget, all requests for special liaison between the Department of the Army and the intelligence community. He is very good at his job. More people have shown up asking for money and have ended up with about one-tenth of what they asked than you could line up in any one corridor of the Pentagon. That is saying a lot. The case began to break some months ago after the Russians started to get back those odd little recording capsules. The capsules came out of their Sputniks. We didn't know what was in the capsules as they returned from upper space. All we knew was that there was something in them. The capsules descended in such a way that we could track them by radar. Unfortunately, they all fell into Russian territory except for a single capsule, which landed in the Atlantic. At the seven million dollar point, we gave up trying to find it. The commander of the Atlantic fleet had been told by his intelligence officer that they might have a chance of finding it if they kept on looking. The commander referred the matter to Washington, and the budget people saw the request. That stopped it for a while. The case began to break from about four separate directions at once. Khrushchev himself said something very funny to the Secretary of State. They had met in London, after all. Khrushchev said at the end of a meeting, You play jokes sometimes, Mr. Secretary? The Secretary looked very surprised when he heard the translation. Jokes, Mr. Prime Minister? Yes. What kind of jokes? Jokes about apparatus. Jokes about machinery don't sit very well, said the American. They went on talking back and forth as to whether it was a good idea to play practical jokes when each one had a serious job of espionage to do. The Russian leader insisted that he had no espionage, never heard of espionage, and that his espionage worked well enough so that he knew damn well that he didn't have any espionage. 
To this display of heat, the secretary replied that he didn't have any espionage either, and that we knew nothing whatever that occurred in Russia. Furthermore, not only did we not know anything about Russia, but we knew we didn't know it, and we made sure of that. After this exchange, both leaders parted, each one wondering what the other had been talking about. The whole matter was referred back to Washington. I was somewhere down on the list to see it. At that time, I had galactic clearance. Galactic clearance came a little bit after universal clearance. It wasn't very strong, but it amounted to something. I was supposed to see those special papers in connection with my job of assisting Mr. Spatz in liaison. Actually, it didn't do any good except to fill in the time when I wasn't working out budgets for him. The second lead came from some of the boys over in the valley. We never called the place by any other name, and we don't even like to see it in the federal budget. We know as much as we need to about it, and then we stop thinking. It is much safer to stop thinking. It is not our business to think about what other people are doing, particularly if they are spending several million dollars of Uncle Sam's money every day, trying to find out what they think, and most of the time ending up with nothing conclusive. Later, we were to find out that the boys in the valley had practically every security agent in the country rushing off to Minneapolis to look for a man named Angerhelm. Nelson Angerhelm. The name didn't mean anything then, but before we got through, it ended up as the largest story of the 20th century. If they ever turn it loose, it is going to be the biggest story in 2,000 years. The third part of the story came along a little later. Colonel Plug was over in G2. He called up Mr. Spatz, and he couldn't get Mr. Spatz, so he called me. He said, What's the matter with your boss? Isn't he ever in his room? Not if I can help it. I don't run him, he runs me. What do you want, Colonel? I said. The Colonel snarled. Look, I am supposed to get money out of you for liaison purposes. I don't know how far I am going to have to go to liaise, or if it is any of my business. I asked my old man what I ought to do about it, and he doesn't know. Perhaps we ought to get out and just let the intelligence boys handle it. Or we ought to send it to state. You spend half your life telling me whether I can have liaison or not, and then giving me the money for it. Why don't you come on over and take a little responsibility for a change? I rushed over to Plug's office. It was an army problem. These are the facts. The Soviet assistant military attaché... A certain Lieutenant Colonel Potoriskov asked for an interview. When he came over, he brought nothing with him. This time, he didn't even bring a translator. He spoke very funny English, but it worked. The essence of Potoriskov's story was that he didn't think it was very sporting of the American military to interfere in solemn weather reporting by introducing practical jokes in Soviet radar. If the American army didn't have anything else better to do, would they please play jokes on each other, but not on the Soviet forces? This didn't make much sense. Colonel Plug tried to find out what the man was talking about. The Russian sounded crazy and kept talking about jokes. It finally turned out that Potoriskov had a piece of paper in his pocket. He took it out, and Plug looked at it. On it there was an address, Nelson Angerhelm. 2322 Ridge Drive, Hopkins, Minnesota. It turned out that Hopkins, Minnesota was a suburb of Minneapolis. That didn't take long to find out. This meant nothing to Colonel Plug, and he asked if there was anything that Potoriskov really wanted. Potoriskov asked if the colonel would confess to the Angerhelm joke. Potoriskov said that in intelligence, they never tell you about the jokes they play with the Signal Corps. Plug still insisted that he didn't know. He said he would try to find out and let Potoriskov know later on. Potoriskov went away. Plug called up the Signal Corps, and by the time he got through calling, he had a lead back into the valley. The valley people heard about it, and they immediately sent a man over. It was about this time that I came in. He couldn't get hold of Mr. Spatz, and there was real trouble. The point is that all three of them led together. The valley people had picked up the name and it is not up to me to tell you how they got hold of it. The name Angerhelm had been running all over the Soviet communications system. Practically every Russian official in the world had been asked if he knew anything about Nelson Angerhelm, and almost every official, at least as far as the boys in the valley could tell, had replied that he didn't know what it was all about. 
Some reference back to Mr. Khrushchev's conversation with the Secretary of State suggested that the Angerhelm inquiry might have tied in with this. We pursued it a little further. Angerhelm was apparently the right reference. The Valley people already had something about him. They had checked with the FBI. The FBI had said that Nelson Angerhelm was a 62-year-old retired poultry farmer. He had served in World War I. His service had been rather brief. He had gotten as far as Plattsburgh, New York, broken an ankle, stayed four months in a hospital, and the injury had developed complications. He had been drawing a Veterans Administration allowance ever since. He had never visited outside the United States, never joined a subversive organization, never married, and never spent a nickel. So far as the FBI could discover, his life was not worth living. This left the matter up in the air. There was nothing whatever to connect him with the Soviet Union. It turned out that I wasn't needed after all. Spatz came into the office and said that a conference had been called for the whole intelligence community. People from state were sitting in, and there was a special representative from OCBM from the White House to watch what they were doing. The question arose... Who was Nelson Angerhelm, and what were we to do about him? An additional report had been made out by an agent who specialized in pretending to be an internal revenue man. The internal revenue agent was one of the best people in the FBI for checking on subversive activities. He was a real expert on espionage, and he knew all about bad connections. He could smell a conspirator two miles off on a clear day and by sitting in a room for a little while he could tell whether anybody had an illegal meeting there for the previous three years. Maybe I am exaggerating a little bit, but I am not exaggerating much. This fellow, who was a real artist at smelling out commies and anything that even faintly resembles a commie, came back with a completely blank ticket on Angerhelm. There was only one connection that Angerhelm had with the larger world. He had a younger brother whose name was Tice. Funny name and I don't know why he got it. Somebody told us later on that the full name tied in with Tice Ankerhelm, which was the name of a Swedish admiral a couple hundred years ago. Perhaps the family was proud of it. The younger brother was a West Pointer. He had had a regular career. That came easily enough out of the adjutant general's office. What did develop, though, was that the younger brother had died only two months previously. He, too, was a bachelor. One of the psychiatrists who got into the case said, What a mother. Tice Angerhelm had traveled a great deal. He had something to do, as a matter of fact, with two or three of the projects that I was liaising on. There were all sorts of issues arising from this. However, he was dead. He had never worked directly on Soviet matters. He had no Soviet friends, had never been in the Soviet Union, and had never met Soviet forces. He had never even gone to the Soviet embassy to an official reception. The man was no specialist, outside of ordnance, a little tiny bit of French and the missile program. He was something of a Saturday evening Don Juan. It was then time for the fourth stage. Colonel Plug was told to get hold of Lieutenant Colonel Potoriskov and find out what Potoriskov had to give him. This time, Potoriskov called back and said that he would rather have his boss, the Soviet ambassador himself, call on the secretary or the undersecretary of state. There was some shilly-shallying back and forth. The secretary was out of town. The undersecretary said he would be very glad to see the Soviet ambassador if there were anything to ask about. He said that we had found Angerhelm, and if the Soviet authorities wanted to interview Mr. Angerhelm themselves, they jolly well could go to Hopkins, Minnesota and interview him. This led to a real flash of embarrassment when it was discovered that the area of Hopkins, Minnesota, was in the no-travel zone proscribed to Soviet diplomats in retaliation against their no-travel zones imposed on American diplomats in the Soviet Union. This was ironed out. The Soviet ambassador was asked, would he like to go see a chicken farmer in Minnesota? When the Soviet ambassador stated that he was not particularly interested in chicken farmers, but that he would be willing to see Mr. Angerhelm at a later date, if the American government didn't mind, the whole thing was let go. Nothing happened at all. Presumably, the Russians were relaying things back to Moscow by courier, letter, or whatever mysterious ways the Russians use when they are acting very deliberately and very solemnly. 
I heard nothing, and certainly the people around the Soviet embassy saw no unusual contacts at that time. Nelson Angerhelm hadn't come into the story yet. All he knew was that several odd characters had asked him about veterans that he scarcely knew, saying that they were looking for security clearances. And an internal revenue man had a long and very exhausting talk with him about his brother's estate. That didn't seem to leave much. Angerhelm went on feeding his chickens. He had television, and Minneapolis has a pretty good range of stations. Now and then he showed up at the church. More frequently, he showed up at the general store. He almost always went away from town to avoid the new shopping centers. He didn't like the way Hopkins had developed, and preferred to go to the little country centers where they still have general stores. In its own funny way, this seemed to be the only pleasure the old man had. After nineteen days, and I can now count almost every hour of them, the answer must have gotten back from Moscow. It was probably carried in by the stocky, brown-haired courier who made the trip about every fortnight. One of the fellows from the valley told me about that. I wasn't supposed to know, and it didn't matter then. Apparently, the Soviet ambassador had been told to play the matter lightly. He called on the Under Secretary of State and ended up discussing world butter prices and the effect of American exports of ghee to Pakistan on the attempts of the Soviet Union to trade ghee for hemp. Apparently, this was an extraordinary and confidential thing for the Soviet ambassador to discuss. The Under Secretary would have been more impressed if he had been able to find out why the Soviet ambassador, just out of the top of his head, announced that the Soviet Union had given about a hundred and twenty million dollars credit to Pakistan for some unnecessary highways, and was able to reply, therefore, somewhat tartly to the general effect that if the Soviet Union ever decided to stabilize world markets with the cooperation of the United States, we would be very happy to cooperate. But this was no time to discuss money or fair business deals when they were dumping every piece of export rubbish they could in our general direction. It was characteristic of this Soviet ambassador that he took the rebuff calmly. Apparently, his mission was to have no mission. He left, and that was all there was from him. Potariskov came back to the Pentagon, this time accompanied by a Russian civilian. The new man's English was a little more than perfect. The English was so good that it was desperately irritating. Potriskov himself looked like a rather horsey, brown-faced schoolboy with chestnut hair and brown eyes. I got to see him because they had me sitting in the back of Plug's office, pretending just to wait for somebody else. The conversation was very simple. Potriskov brought out a recording tape. It was standard American tape. Plug looked at it and said, "Do you want to play it right now?" Potoriskov agreed. The stenographer got a tape recorder in. By that time, three or four other officers wandered in, and none of them happened to leave. As a matter of fact, one of them wasn't even an officer, but he happened to have a uniform on that very day. They played the tape, and I listened to it. It was buzz, 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 and there was some hissing. Then it went. Clickety, clickety, clickety. Then it was buzz, buzz, buzz again. It was the kind of sound in which you turn on a radio and you don't even get static. You just get funny buzzing sounds, which indicate that somebody has some sort of radio transmission somewhere, but it is not consistent enough to be the loud wee wee kind of static which one often hears. All of us stood there rather solemnly. Plug. Thoroughly a soldier, listened at rigid attention, moving his eyes back and forth from the tape recorder to Potoriskov's face. Potoriskov looked at Plug and then ran his eyes around the group. The little Russian civilian, who was as poisonous as a snake, glanced at every single one of us. He was obviously taking our measure, and he was anxious to find out if any of us could hear anything he couldn't hear. None of us heard anything. At the end of the tape, Plug reached out to turn off the machine. "Don't stop it," Potariskov said. The other Russian interjected, "Didn't you hear it?" All of us shook our heads. We had heard nothing. With that, Potariskov said with singular politeness, "Please play it again."
We played it again. Nothing happened except for the buzzing and clicking. After the 15-minute point, it was beginning to get pretty stale for some of us. One or two of the men actually wandered out. They happened to be the bona fide visitors. The non-bona fide visitors slouched down in the room. Colonel Plug offered Potoriskov a cigarette, which Potoriskov took. They both smoked, and we played it a third time. Then the third time, Potoriskov said, Turn it off. Didn't you hear it? said Potoriskov. Hear what? said Plug. Hear the name and the address. At that, the funniest feeling came over me. I knew that I had heard something, and I turned to the colonel and said, Funny, I don't know where I heard it or how I heard it, but I do know something that I didn't know. What is that? said the little Russian civilian, his face lighting up. Nelson, said I, intending to say, Nelson Angerhelm, 2322 Ridge Drive, Hopkins, Minnesota. Just as I had seen it in the Galactic Secret Documents. Of course, I didn't go any further. That was in the document and was very secret indeed. How should I know it? The Russian civilian looked at me. There was a funny, wicked, friendly, crooked sort of smile on his face. He said, Didn't you hear Nelson Angerhelm, 2322 Ridge Drive, Hopkins, Minnesota, just now? And yet, did you not know where you heard it? The question then arose, What had happened? Potoriskov spoke with singular candor. Even the Russian with him concurred. We believe that this is a case of marginal perception. We have played this. This is obviously a copy. We have many such copies. We have played it to all our people. Nobody can even specify at what point he has heard it. We have had our best experts on it. Some put it at minute three. Others put it at minute twelve. Some put it at minute thirteen and a half and at different places. But different people under different controls all come out with the idea that they have heard Nelson Angerhelm, 2322 Ridge Drive, Hopkins, Minnesota. We have tried it on Chinese people. At that, the Russian civilian interrupted. Yes, indeed, they tried it on Chinese persons, and even they heard the same thing. Nelson Angerhelm. Even when they do not know the language, they hear Nelson Angerhelm. Even when they know nothing else, they hear that, and they hear the street numbers. The numbers are always in English. They cannot make a recording. The recording is only of this noise, and yet it comes out. What do you make of that? What they said turned out to be true. We tried it also, after they went away. We tried it on college students, foreigners, psychiatrists, White House staff members, and passers-by. We even thought of running it on a municipal radio somewhere as a quiz show, and offering prizes for anyone that got it. That was a little too heavy, so we accepted a much safer suggestion, that we try it out on the public address system of the SAC base. The SAC was guarded night and day. No one happened to be getting much leave anyhow, and it was easy enough to cut off the leave for an extra week. We played that damn thing six times over and almost everybody on that base wanted to write a letter to Nelson Angerhelm, 2322 Ridge Drive, Hopkins, Minnesota. They were even calling each other Angerhelm and wondering what the hell it meant. Naturally, there were a great many puns on the name, and even some jokes of a rather smutty order. That didn't help. The troublesome thing was that on all these different tests, we too were unable to find out at what point the subliminal transmission of the name and address came. It was subliminal, all right. There's not much trick to that. Any good psychologist can pass along either a noise message or a sight message without the recipient knowing exactly when he got it. It is simply a matter of getting down near the threshold, running a little tiny bit under the threshold, and then making the message sharp and clear enough, just under the level of conscious notice, so that it slips on through. We therefore knew what we were dealing with. What we didn't know was what the Russians were doing with it, how they had gotten it, and why they were so upset about it. Finally, it all went to the White House for a conference. The conference, to which my boss, Mr. Spatz, went along as a sort of rapporteur and monitor to safeguard the interests of the director of the budget and of the American taxpayer, was a rather brief affair. All roads led to Nelson Angerhelm. 
Nelson Angerhelm was already guarded by about half of the FBI and a large part of the local military district forces. Every room in his house had been wired. The microphones were sensitive enough to hear his heartbeat. The safety precautions we were taking on that man would have justified the program we have for taking care of Fort Knox. Angerhelm knew that some awful funny things had been happening, but he didn't know what, and he didn't know who was concerned with it. Months later, he was able to tell somebody that he thought his brother had probably done some forgery or counterfeiting, and that the neighborhood was being thoroughly combed. He didn't realize his safeguarding was the biggest American national treasure since the discovery of the atomic bomb. The president himself gave the word. He reviewed the evidence. The Secretary of State said that he didn't think that Khrushchev would have brought up the question of a joke if Khrushchev himself had not missed out on the facts. We had even tried Russians on it, of course. Russians on our side. And they didn't get any more off the record than the rest of the people. Everybody heard the same blessed thing. Nelson Angerhelm, 2322 Ridge Drive, Hopkins, Minnesota. But that didn't get anybody anywhere. The only thing left was to try it on the man himself. When it came to picking inconspicuous people to go along, the Intelligence Committee were pretty thin-skinned about letting outsiders into their show. On the other hand, they did not have domestic jurisdiction, particularly not when the President had turned it over to J. Edgar Hoover and said, Ed, you handle this. I don't like the looks of it. Somebody over in the Pentagon presumably deviled on by air intelligence, got the bright idea that if the Army and the rest of the Intelligence Committee couldn't fit into the show, the best they could do would be to get their revenge on Liaison by letting Liaison itself go. This meant Mr. Spatz. Mr. Spatz has been on the job for many, many years, by always avoiding anything interesting or dramatic, always watching for everything that mattered, which was the budget and the authorization for next year, and by ditching controversial personalities long before anyone else had any idea that they were controversial. Therefore, he didn't go. If this Angerhelm fiasco was going to turn out to be a mess, he wanted to be out of it. It was me who got the assignment. I was made a sort of honorary member of the FBI, and they even let me carry the tape in the end. They must have had about six other copies of the tape, so the honor wasn't as marked as it looked. We were simply supposed to go along as people who knew something about the brother. It was a dry, reddish Sunday afternoon, looking a little bit as though the sunset were coming. We drove up to this very nice frame house. It had double windows all the way around, and looked as tight as the proverbial rug for a bug to be snug in in cold winter. This wasn't winter and the old gentleman obviously couldn't pay for air conditioning. But the house still looked snug. It was no waste, no show. It just looked like a thoroughly livable house. The FBI man was big-hearted and let me ring the doorbell. There was no answer, so I rang the doorbell some more. Again, nobody answered the bell. We decided to wait outside and wandered around the yard. We looked at the car in the yard. It seemed in running order. We rang the doorbell again, then walked around the house and looked into the kitchen window. We checked his car to see if the radiator felt warm. We looked at our watches. We wondered if he were hiding and peeking out at us. Once more, we rang the doorbell. Just then, the old boy came down the front walk. We introduced ourselves, and the preliminaries were the usual sort of thing. I found my heart beating violently. If something had stumped both the Soviet Union and the rest of the world, something salvaged possibly out of space itself, something which thousands of men had heard and none could identify, something so mysterious that the name of Nelson Angerhelm rang over and over again, like a pitiable cry beyond all limits of understanding, what could this be? We didn't know. The old man stood there. He was erect, sunburned, red-cheeked, red-nosed, red-eared, healthy as he could be. Swedish to the bone. All we had to do was to tell him that we were concerned with his brother, Tice Angerhelm, and he listened to us. We had no trouble, no trouble at all. As he listened, his eyes got wide, and he said, I know there has been a lot of snooping around here, and you people had a lot of trouble, 
and I thought somebody was going to come and talk to me about it, but I didn't think it would be this soon. The FBI man muttered something polite and vague, so Angerhelm went on. I suppose you gentlemen are from the FBI. I don't think my brother was cheating. He wasn't that dishonest. Another pause, and he continued. But there is always a kind of a funny, sleek mind. He looked like the kind of man who would play a joke. Angerhelm's eyes lit up. If he played a joke, gentlemen, he might even have committed a crime. I don't know. All I do is raise chickens and try to have my life. Perhaps it was the wrong kind of intelligence procedure, but I broke in ahead of the FBI and said, Are you a happy man, Mr. Angerhelm? Do you live a life that you think is really satisfying? The old boy gave me a keen look. It was obvious that he thought there was something wrong, and he didn't have very much confidence in my judgment. And yet, underneath the sharpness of his look, he shot me a glance of sympathy, and I am sure that he suspected I had been under a strain. His eyes widened a little, his shoulders went back, and he looked a little prouder. He looked like the kind of man who might remember that he had Swedish admirals for ancestors, and that long before the Angerhelm name ran out and ran dry there in this flat country west of Minneapolis, there had been something great in it and that perhaps sparks of the great name still flew somewhere in the universe. I don't know. He got the importance of it, I suppose, because he looked me very sharply and very clearly in the eye. No, young man, my life hasn't been much of a life, and I haven't liked it, and I hope nobody has to live a life like mine. But that is enough of that. I don't suppose you're guessing, and I suppose you've got something pretty bad to show me. The other fellow then took over. Yes, but it doesn't involve any embarrassment for you, Mr. Angerhelm. And even Colonel Angerhelm, your brother, wouldn't mind if he were living. Don't be so sure of that, said the old man. My brother minded almost everything. As a matter of fact, my brother once said to me, Listen, Nels, I'd come back from hell itself rather than let somebody put something over on me. That's what he said. I think he meant it. There was a funny pride to him, and if you've got anything here on my brother... You'd better just show it to me. With that, we got over the small talk, and we did what we were told to do. We got out the tape and put it on the portable machine, the hi-fi one which we brought along with us. We played it for the old man. I had heard it so often that I think I could almost have reproduced it with my vocal cords. The clickety-click and the buzz-buzz. There wasn't any wee-wee but there was some more clickety-click and there was some buzz-buzz and long periods of dull silence, the kind of contrived silence which a recording machine makes when it is playing but nothing is coming through on it. The old gentleman listened to it, and it seemed to have no effect on him, no effect at all. No effect at all? That wasn't true. There was an effect. When we got through the first time, he said very simply, very directly, almost coldly, play it again, play it again for me, there may be something there. We played it again. After that second playing, he started to talk. It is the funniest thing. I hear my own name and address there, and I don't know where I hear it, but I swear to God, gentlemen, that's my brother's voice. It is my brother's voice I hear there somewhere in those clicks and noises, and yet all I can hear is Nelson Angerhelm, 2322 Ridge Drive, Hopkins, Minnesota. But I hear that, gentlemen. And it is not only plain, it is my brother's voice, and I don't know where I heard it. I don't know how it came through. We played it for him a third time. When the tape was halfway through, he threw up his hands and said, Turn it off! Turn it off! I can't stand it! Turn it off! We turned it off. He sat there in the chair, breathing hard. After a while, in a very funny, cracked tone of voice, he said, I've got some whiskey. It's back there on the shelf by the sink. Get me a shot of it, will you, gentlemen? The FBI man and I looked at each other. He didn't want to get mixed up in accidental poisoning, so he sent me. I went back. It was good enough whiskey, one of the regular brands. I poured the old boy a two-ounce slug and took the glass back. I sipped a tiny bit of it myself. It seemed like a silly thing to do on duty, but I couldn't risk any poison getting to him. 
After all my years in Army counterintelligence, I wanted to stay in the civil service, and I didn't want to take any chances on losing my good job with Mr. Spatz. He drank the whiskey, and he said, Can you record on this thing at the same time that you play? We said we couldn't. We hadn't thought of that. I think I may be able to tell you what it is saying, but I don't know how many times I can tell you, gentlemen. I am a sick man. I'm not feeling good. I never have felt very good. My brother had the life. I didn't have the life. I never had much of a life and never did anything and never went anywhere. My brother had everything. My brother got the women. He got the girl. He got the only girl I ever wanted. And then he didn't marry her. He got the life and he went away and then he died. He played jokes and he never let anybody get ahead of him. And gentlemen, my brother's dead. Can you understand that? My brother's dead. We said we knew his brother was dead. We didn't tell him that he had been exhumed and that the coffin had been opened and the bones had been x-rayed. We didn't tell him that the bones had been weighed, fresh identification had been remade from what was left of the fingers, and they were in pretty good shape. We didn't tell him that the serial number had been checked and that all the circumstances leading to the death had been checked and that everybody connected with it had been interviewed. We didn't tell him that. We just told him we knew that his brother was dead. He knew that, too. You know, my brother is dead, and then this funny thing has his voice in it. All it's got is his voice. We agreed. We said that we didn't know how his voice got in there, and we didn't even know that there was a voice. We didn't tell him that we had heard that voice ourselves a thousand times, and yet never knew where we heard it. We didn't tell him that we'd played it at the sack base and that every man there had heard the name Nelson Angerhelm, had heard something saying that and yet couldn't tell where. We didn't tell him that the entire apparatus of Soviet intelligence had been swearing over this for an unstated period of time, and that our people had the unpleasant feeling that this came out of a Sputnik somewhere out in the sky. We didn't tell him all that, but we knew it. We knew that if he heard his brother's voice, and if he wanted to record... It was something very serious. Can you get me something to dictate on? The old man said. I can take notes, the FBI man replied. The old man shook his head. That isn't enough, he said. I think you probably want to get the whole thing if you ever get it, and I begin to get pieces of it. Pieces of what? said the FBI man. Pieces of the stuff behind all that noise. It's my brother's voice talking. He's saying things. I don't like what he is saying. It frightens me, and it just makes everything bad and dirty. I'm not sure I can take it, and I am not going to take it twice. I think I'll go to church instead. We looked at each other. Can you wait ten minutes? I think I can get a recording machine by then. The old man nodded his head. The FBI man went out to the car and cranked up the radio. A great big aerial shot up out of the car, which otherwise was a very inconspicuous Chevrolet sedan. He got his office. A recording machine with a police escort was sent out from downtown Minneapolis toward Hopkins. I don't know what time it took ambulances to make it, but the fellow at the other end said, You better allow me twenty to twenty-two minutes. We waited. The old man wouldn't talk to us, and he didn't want us to play the tape. He sat there sipping the whiskey. This might kill me, and I want to have my friends around. My pastor's name is Jensen, and if anything happens to me, you get a hold of him there, but I don't think anything will happen to me. Just get a hold of him. I may die, gentlemen. I can't take too much of this. It is the most shocking thing that ever happened to any man, and I'm not going to see you or anybody else get in on it. You understand that it could kill me, gentlemen. We pretended that we knew what he was talking about, although neither one of us had the faintest idea, beyond the suspicion that the old man might have a heart condition and might actually collapse. The office had estimated 22 minutes. It took 18 minutes for the FBI assistant to come in. He brought in one of these new, tight, clean little jobs, the kind of thing that I'd love to take home. You can pack it almost anywhere, and it comes out with concert quality. 
The old man brightened when he saw that we meant business. Give me a set of headphones and just let me talk and pick it up. I'll try to reproduce it. It won't be my brother's voice. It will be my voice you're hearing. Do you follow me? We turned on the tape. He dictated with the headset on his head. That's when the message started, and that's the thing I started with in the very beginning. Funny, funny, funny. It's sort of funny, funny, funny to think without a brain. It is really something like a trick, but not a trick to think without a brain. Talking is even harder, but it can be done. Nels, this is Tice. I'm dead. Nels, I don't know whether I'm in heaven or hell, but I think it's hell, Nels. And I'm going to play the biggest joke that anybody's ever played. And it's funny. I am an American army officer, and I am a dead one, and it doesn't matter. Nels, don't you see what it is? It doesn't matter if you're dead, whether you're American or Russian or an officer or not. And even laughter doesn't matter. But there's enough left of me, Nels, enough of the old me, so that perhaps for one last time I'll have a laugh with you and the others. I haven't got a body to laugh with, Nels, and I haven't got a mouth to laugh with, and I haven't got cheeks to smile with, and there really isn't any me. Tice Angerhelm is something different now, Nels. I'm dead. I knew I was dead when I felt so different. It was more comfortable being dead, more relaxed. There wasn't anything tight. That's the trouble, Nels. There isn't anything tight. There isn't anything around you. You can't feel the world. You can't see the world. And yet you know all about it. You know all about everything. It's awfully lonely, Nels. There are some corners that aren't lonely. Some funny little corners in which you feel friendship and feel things creeping up. Nels, it's like kittens or the faces of children or the smell of the wind on a nice day. It's any time that you turn away from yourself and you don't think about yourself. It's the times when you don't want something and you do want something. It's what you're not resenting, what you're not hating, what you're not fearing, and what you're not jeering. That's it, Nels. That's the good part inside of death. And I suppose some people could call it heaven. And I guess you get heaven if you just get into the habit of having heaven every day in your ordinary life. That's what it is. Heaven is right there, Nels, in your ordinary life, every day, day by day, right around you. But that's not what I got. Oh, Nels, I am Tice Angerhelm, all right. I am your brother, and I'm dead. You can call where I am hell, since it's everything I hated. Nels, it smells of everything that I ever wanted. It smells the way the hay smelled when I had my old Willis Roadster, and I made the first girl I ever made that August evening. You can go ask her. She's a Mrs. Pry Jesselton now. She lives over on the east side of St. Paul. You never knew I made her, and if you don't think this is so, you can listen for yourself. And you see... I am somewhere, and I don't know what kind of a where it is. Nels, this is me, Tice Angerhelm, and I'm going to scream this out loud with what I've got instead of a mouth. I am going to scream it loud so that any human ear that hears it can put it on this silly, silly Soviet gadget and take it back. Take this message to Nelson Angerhelm, 2322 Ridge Drive, Hopkins, Minnesota. And I'm going to repeat that a couple more times so that you'll know that it's your brother talking, and I'm somewhere, and it isn't heaven, and it isn't hell, and it isn't even really out in space. I am in something different from space, Nels. It is just a somewhere with me in it, and there isn't anything but me. In with me, there's everything. In with me, there is everything I ever thought, and everything I ever did, and everything I ever wanted. All the opposites are the same. Everything I hated and everything I loved, it's all the same. Everything I feared and everything I yearned for, that's the same. I tell you it's all the same now, and the punishment is just as bad if you want something and get it as if you want something and don't get it. The only thing that matters is those calm, nice moments in life when you don't want anything, Nels. You aren't anything when you aren't trying for anything and the world is just around you and you get simple things like water on the skin, when you yourself feel innocent and you are not thinking about anything else. 
That's all there is to life, Nils. And I'm Tyson, I'm telling you. And you know I'm dead, so I wouldn't be telling you a lie. And I especially wouldn't be telling you on this Soviet cylinder, this Soviet gizmo which will go back to them and bother them. Nels, I hope it won't bother you too much. If everybody knows about that girl, I hope the girl forgives me, but the message has got to go back. And yet that's the message. Everything I ever feared, I feared something in the war, and you know what the war smells like. It smells sort of like a cheap slaughterhouse in July. It smells bad all around. There's bits of things burning, the smell of rubber burning and the funny smell of gunpowder. I was never in a big war with atomic stuff, just the old sort of explosions. I've told you about it before, and I was scared of that. And right in with that I can smell the perfume that girl had in the hotel there in Melbourne. The girl that I thought I might have wanted until she said something. And then I said something, and that was all there was between us. And I'm dead now. And listen, Nels. Listen, Nels, I am talking as though it were a trick. I don't know how I know about the rest of us, the other ones that are dead like me. I never met one, and I may never talk to one. I just have the feeling that they are here, too. They can't talk. It's not that they can't talk, really. They don't even want to talk. They don't feel like talking. Talking is just a trick. It is a trick that somebody can pick up, and I guess it takes a cheap, meaningless man, a man who lived his life in spite of hell, and is now in that hell. That's the kind of silly man it takes to remember the trick of talking— like a trick with coins or a trick with cigarettes when nothing else matters. So I am talking to you, Nels. And, Nels, I suppose you'll die the way I do. It doesn't matter, Nels. It's too late to change. That's all. Goodbye, Nels. You're in pretty good shape. You've lived your life. You've had the wind in your hair. You've seen the good sunlight, and you haven't hated and feared and loved too much. When the old man got through dictating it, the FBI man and I asked him to do it again. He refused. We all stood up. We brought in the assistant. The old man still refused to make a second dictation from the sounds out of which only he could hear a voice. We could have taken him into custody and forced him, but there didn't seem to be much sense to it until we took the recording back to Washington and had this text appraised. He said goodbye to us as we left his house. Perhaps I can do it once again, maybe a year from now, but the trouble with me, gentlemen, is that I believe it. That was the voice of my brother, Tice Angerhelm, and he is dead. And you brought me something strange. I don't know where you got a medium or spirit reader to record this on a tape, and especially in such a way that you can't hear it and I could, but I did hear it, gentlemen and I think I told you pretty good what it was. And those words I used, they are not mine. They are my brother's. So you go along, gentlemen, and do what you can with it. And if you don't want me to tell anybody that the U.S. government is working on mediums, I won't. That was the farewell he gave us. We closed the local office and hurried to the airport. We took the tape back with us, but a duplicate was already being teletyped to Washington. That's the end of the story, and that is the end of the joke. Potoriskov got a copy, and the Soviet ambassador got a copy. And Khrushchev probably wondered what sort of insane joke the Americans were playing on him. To use a medium or something weird along with subliminal perception in order to attack the USSR for not believing in God and not believing in death. Did he figure it that way? Here's a case where I hope that Soviet espionage is very good. I hope that their spies are so fine that they know we're baffled. I hope that they realize that we have come to a dead end. And whatever Tice Angerhelm did, or somebody did in his name way out there in space, recording into a Soviet Sputnik, we Americans had no hand in it. If the Russians didn't do it, and we didn't do it, who did do it? I hope their spies find out. The Good Friends Fever had given him a boyish look. The nurse, standing behind the doctor, watched him attentively. 
Her half-smile blended tenderness with an appreciation of his manly attraction. When can I go, Doc? In a few weeks, perhaps. You have to get well first. I don't mean home, Doc. When can I go back into space? I'm Captain, Doc. I'm a good one. You know that, don't you? The doctor nodded gravely. I want to go back, Doc. I want to go back right away. I want to be well, Doc. I want to be well now. I want to get back in my ship and take off again. I don't even know why I'm here. What are you doing with me, Doc? We're trying to make you well, said the doctor. Friendly, serious, authoritative. I'm not sick, Doc. You've got the wrong man. We brought the ship in, didn't we? Everything was all right, wasn't it? Then we started to get out and everything went black. Now I'm here in a hospital. Something's pretty fishy, Doc. Did I get hurt in the port? No, said the doctor. You weren't hurt at the port. Then why'd I faint? Why am I sick in a bed? Something must have happened to me, Doc. It stands to reason. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Some stupid, awful thing must have happened, Doc, after such a nice trip. Where did it happen? A wild light came into the patient's eyes. Did somebody do something to me, Doc? I'm not hurt, am I? I'm not ruined, am I? I'll be able to go back into space, won't I? Perhaps, said the doctor. The nurse drew in her breath as though she were going to say something. The doctor looked around at her and gave her an authoritative frown, meaning keep quiet. The patient saw it. Desperation came into his voice, almost a whine. What's the matter, Doc? Why won't you talk to me? What's wrong? Something has happened to me. Where's Ralph? Where's Pete? Where's Jock? The last time I saw him, he was having a beer. Where's Larry? Where's Went? Where's Betty? Where's my gang, Doc? They're not killed, are they? I'm not the only one, am I? Talk to me, Doc. Tell me the truth. I'm a space captain, Doc. I faced queer hells in my time, Doc. You can tell me anything, Doc. I'm not that sick. I can take it. Where's my gang, Doc? My pals from the ship. What a cruise that was. Won't you talk, Doc? I'll talk, said the doctor gravely. Okay, said the patient. Tell me. What in particular? Don't be a fool, Doc. Tell me the straight stuff. Tell me about my friends first, and then tell me what has happened to me. Concerning your friends, said the doctor, measuring his words carefully, I am in a position to tell you there has been no adverse change in the status of any of the persons you mentioned. All right, then, Doc. If it wasn't them, it's me. Tell me, what's happened to me, Doc? Something stinking awful must have happened, or you wouldn't be standing there with a face like a constipated horse. The doctor smiled wryly, bleakly, briefly, at the weird compliment. I won't try to explain my own face, young fellow. I was born with it. But you are in a serious condition, and we are trying to get you well. I will tell you the whole truth. Then do it, Doc, right away. Did somebody jump me at the port? Was I hurt badly? Was it an accident? Start talking, man. The nurse stirred behind the doctor. He looked around at her. She looked in the direction of the hypodermic on the tray. The doctor gave her a brief negative shake of his head. The patient saw the whole interplay and understood it correctly. That's right, Doc. Don't let her dope me. I don't need sleep. I need the truth. If my gang's all right, why aren't they here? Is Millie out in the corridor? Millie, that was her name, the little curly head. Where's Jock? Why isn't Ralph here? I'm going to tell you everything, young man. It may be tough, but I'm counting on you to take it like a man. But it would help if you told me first. Told you what? Don't you know who I am? Didn't you read about my gang and me? Didn't you hear about Larry? What a navigator. We wouldn't be here except for Larry. The late morning light poured in through the open window. A soft spring breeze touched the young, ravaged face of the patient. There was mercy and more in the doctor's voice. I'm just a medical doctor. I don't keep up with the news. I know your name, age, and medical history. But I don't know the details of your cruise. Tell me about it. Doc, you're kidding. It'd take a book. We're famous. I bet Wentz out there right now making a fortune out of the pictures he took. Don't tell me the whole thing, young man. Suppose you just tell me about the last couple of days before you landed and how you got into port. 
The young man smiled guiltily. There was pleasure and fond memory in his face. I guess I can tell you because you're a doctor and keep things confidential. The doctor nodded, very earnest and still kind. Do you want, said he softly, the nurse to leave? Oh, no, cried the patient. She's a good scout. It's not as though you were going to turn it loose on the tapes. The doctor nodded. The nurse nodded and smiled, too. She was afraid that there were tears forming at the corners of her eyes, but she dared not wipe them away. This was an extraordinarily observant patient. He might notice it. It would ruin his story. The patient almost babbled in his eagerness to tell the story. You know the ship, Doc. It's a big one. Twelve cabins, a common room, simulated gravity, lockers, plenty of room. The doctor's eyes flickered at this, but he did nothing, except to watch the patient in an attentive, sympathetic way. When we knew we just had two days to Earth, Doc, and we knew everything was all right, we had a ball. Jock found the beer in one of the lockers. Ralph helped him get it out. Betty was an old pal of mine, but I started trying to make time with Millie. Boy, did I make it. Yum! He looked at the nurse and blushed all the way down to his neck. I'll skip the details. We had a party, Doc. We were high, drunk, happy. Boy, did we have fun. I don't think anybody ever had more fun than we did. Me and that old gang of mine. We docked all right. That Larry, he's a navigator. He was drunk as an owl, and he had Betty on his lap, but he put that ship in like the old lady putting a coin in the collection plate. Everything came out exactly right. I guess I should have been ashamed of landing a ship with the whole crew drunk and happy, but it was the best trip and the best gang and the best fun that anybody ever had. And we had succeeded in our mission, Doc. We wouldn't have cut loose at the end of the mission if we hadn't known everything was hunky-dory. So we came in and landed, Doc. And then everything went black, and here I am. Now you tell me your side of it, but be sure to tell me when Larry and Jock and Wint are going to come in and see me. They're characters, Doc. That little nurse of yours? She's going to have to watch them. They might bring me a bottle that I shouldn't have. Okay, Doc, shoot. Do you trust me? said the doctor. Sure, I guess so. Why not? Do you think I would tell you the truth? It's something mean, Doc, real mean. Okay, shoot anyhow. I want you to have the shot first, said the doctor, straining to keep kindness and authority in his voice. The patient looked bewildered. He glanced at the nurse, the tray, the hypodermic. Then he smiled at the doctor, but it was a smile in which fright lurked. All right, doctor. You're the boss. The nurse helped him roll back his sleeves. She started to reach for the needle. The doctor stopped her. He looked her straight in the face, his eyes focused right on hers. No, intravenous. I'll do it. Do you understand? She was a quick girl. From the tray, she took a short length of rubber tubing, twisted it quickly around the upper arm, just below the elbow. The doctor watched, very quiet. He took the arm, ran his thumb up and down the skin as he felt the vein. Now, said he. She handed him the needle. Patient, nurse, and doctor all watched as the hypodermic emptied itself directly into the little ridge of the vein on the inside of the elbow. The doctor took out the needle. He himself seemed relieved. Said he, Feel anything? Not yet, Doc. Can you tell me now, Doc? I can't make trouble with this stuff in me. Where's Larry? Where's Jock? You weren't on a ship, young man. You were alone on a one-man craft. You didn't have a party for two days. You had it for twenty years. Larry didn't bring your ship in. The Earth authorities brought it in with telemetry. You were starved, dehydrated, and nine-tenths dead. The boat had a freeze unit, and you were fed by the emergency kit. You had the narrowest escape in the whole history of space travel. The boat had one of the new hypo kits. You must have had a second or two to slap it to your face before the boat took over. You didn't have any friends with you. They came out of your own mind. That's all right, Doc. I'll be all right. Don't worry about me. There wasn't any Jock or Larry or Ralph or Millie. That was just the hypo kit. I get you, Doc. It's all right. This dope you gave me, it's good stuff. 
I feel happy and dreamy. You can go away now and let me sleep. You can explain it all to me in the morning. But be sure to let Ralph and Jock in when visiting hours open up. He turned on his side away from them. The nurse pulled the cover up over his shoulders. Then she and the doctor started to leave the room. At the last moment, she ran past the doctor and out of the room ahead of him. She did not want him to see her cry. End of The Rediscovery of Man The Complete Short Science Fiction of Cordwainer Smith by Cordwainer Smith Edited by James A. Mann C-O-R-D-W-A-I-N-E-R S-M-I-T-H Read by L.J. Ganser in the studios of American Foundation for the Blind Incorporated for the Library of Congress, August 2006. Published by the NESFA Press, Post Office Box 809, Framingham, Massachusetts, 01701-0203. Further reproduction or distribution in other than a specialized format is prohibited. End of book.